33-year-old Dennis Nielsen met the young man in the pub late in 1978 and invited him home to 195 Melrose Avenue in London. They continued to drink and eventually crawled into bed together to sleep. Nielsen woke up at dawn and realized that his new friend was now going to leave. He ran his hand over his bedmate's body, becoming aroused. His heart pounded and he began to sweat. He watched the young man sleep and looked over at the pile of clothing they had both discarded. He spotted his tie, so he got out of bed to retrieve it. I raised myself up and slipped it on under his neck, Nielsen wrote four years later. I quickly straddled him and pulled tight for all I was worth. His body came alive immediately. We struggled off the bed onto the floor. Nielsen tightened his grip, not about to let go and lose this battle to the death. His victim pushed himself with his feet, with Nielsen on top of him, along the carpet. When he came up against the wall, he lay there and grew limp, giving up. Nielsen relaxed but realized the man was not yet dead, only unconscious. He ran into the kitchen and filled a plastic bucket full of water in order to drown the man. Nielsen lifted him onto some chairs, draping his head back, and pushed it into the bucket. The man did not struggle although water splashed all over the carpet. After a few minutes, Nilsson recalled, the bubble stopped coming. I lifted him up and sat him on the armchair. The water was dripping from his short, brown, curly hair. He had just killed a man, and he did not even recall his name. Nilsson sat there shaking, barely cognizant of what he had done and what he now faced as a result. He made himself a cup of coffee and smoked several cigarettes, trying to think about what to do. His black and white dog, Bleep, came in from the garden and sniffed at the corpse on the chair. He ran the dog off and then sat down in shock. He removed the tie from the dead man's neck and just stared at him. Then he got up, put a towel over the window, and hoisted the corpse onto his shoulders to carry it into the bathroom. Gently, Nielsen put him into the tub, ran the water, and washed the man's hair. He was very limp and floppy, Nilsson recalled. He struggled to get him out of the tub and to dry him off. Then he took him back into the other room and put him in the bed. His new friend was not going to leave him now. He ran his hand over the still warm flesh, noticing the slight discoloration of his lips and face. He pulled the bedclothes over him and sat on the bed, trying to think. It was the beginning of the end of my life as I had known it, Nilsson wrote. I had started down the avenue of death and possession of a new kind of flatmate. Rather than being appalled at the sight of a corpse, he thought it quite beautiful. He did not really know why he had killed the young man. He just had not wanted him to leave. He had spent Christmas alone and did not want to do the same for New Year's. Now he had someone to spend it with. Later that day, he went to a hardware store to buy an electric knife and a large pot but he could not bring himself to cut the body up this way. Instead, he opened some new underwear and dressed the body. Then Nilsson took a bath. That's when he decided to try to have sex with the corpse. He got into bed, but could not sustain the arousal he had felt a few moments earlier, so he pulled the body off the bed and laid it on the floor. He used a curtain to cover it. He got into the bed and fell asleep. Later, he got up, made dinner, and watched television with the body still lying there on the floor not far away. Finally, he knew he needed to do something. He pried loose some floorboards and tried to shove the body into the space, but rigor mortis had set in, preventing him from maneuvering the corpse. He stood the body against the wall, deciding to wait until the stiffness passed. However, the next day, he was still standing there against the wall, so Nielsen laid him down and worked on his limbs to loosen them. Finally, he was able to get him into the grave under the floor. He covered the corpse with boards. After a week, Nilsson grew curious, so he lifted the carpet and opened up the floor once again. The corpse was dirty, so Nilsson carried it back into the bathroom to wash it. Then Nilsson washed in the same water. Rather than stuff him beneath the floor again, he trussed him up by the ankles. Eventually, it went back under the floorboards. It remained there for seven and a half months until Nilsson took it out and burned the remains in a bonfire. He added rubber to the fire to mask the smell of burning flesh. 
he raked the ashes into the ground. The young man was never identified. Nielsen was astonished that he was able to get away with this and believed it would never happen again. He was wrong. It would happen 14 more times. In October 1979, nearly a year after the first murder, a young Chinese student, Andrew Ho, went home with Nielsen. The young man wanted to try some bondage play. Nielsen was disinclined, but put a tie around his neck and told him he was playing a dangerous game. Ho left and informed the police, but no charges were brought. By 1981, Nielsen had killed 12 men in that apartment. Only four were identified, Kenneth Ockenden, Martin Duffy, Billy Sutherland, and Malcolm Barlow. Many of them may have been unemployed or homeless young men looking for a way to make money. Some were homosexual, and a few were male prostitutes. Nilsson claimed he went into a killing trance and on seven occasions actually freed the men rather than complete the act because he was able to snap out of it. The second victim was Kenneth Ockenden, a Canadian tourist. He met Nilsson at lunch at a pub on December 3, 1979. They drank together for several hours, took a tour of London, and ended up in Nilsson's flat. They got along very well, and the more Nilsson enjoyed Ockenden's company, the more desperate he felt at the thought that the Canadian was flying home the following day. He strangled Ockenden with an electrical cord from some headphones, dragged him across the floor, and then sat down to listen to several pieces of music while the body lay there on the floor. Then he removed the clothing and took him into the bathroom to clean him up. Once finished, he placed the corpse in bed and slept with it the rest of the night, caressing it frequently. In the morning, Nilsson stuffed the body in a cupboard, tossed out the clothing, and went to work. During the day, the body rigidified in a doubled-up position. Nilsson took him out a day later and cleaned him up again. Then he dressed the corpse and sat him in a chair, taking photos of it in various positions. When he was finished with that, he took the young man into his bed and positioned it, spread-eagled, on top of him. He spoke to Ockenden as if he could hear. Then he crossed his legs together and had sex between his thighs. Finally, Nilsson relegated Ockenden to the space beneath the floorboards. He took him back out several times so that they could sit together and watch television. I thought that his body and skin were very beautiful, Nilsson said later. Then he would dress him in something fresh and put him to bed and tell him good night. Five months went by before it happened again. On May 13, 1980, Martin Duffy, 16, turned up missing. He was homeless and he accepted Nilsson's invitation to spend the night. After two beers, he went to bed. Nilsson climbed on top, trapping his arms under the covers, and strangled him. He went limp but was still alive, so Nilsson carried him into the kitchen and drowned him by pushing his head into a sink full of water. Then he took him to the bathroom and got into the tub with him. I talked to him and mentioned that his body was the youngest looking I'd ever seen, Nilsson mentioned. Nilsson brought him back to bed and kissed him all over, then sat on his stomach and masturbated. Duffy went into the cupboard for two full weeks and then was placed under the floorboards. The next one, 27-year-old Billy Sutherland, slept with men for money. Nilsson did not even want to take him home, but he followed Nilsson after they went bar hopping one night. Nilsson barely recalls strangling him and finding a body in his home the next morning. Malcolm Barlow, age 24, was an orphan with mental problems. He was also a pathological liar. Nilsson found Barlow loitering outside his home, complaining of weakness from epilepsy, and he took him home and called an ambulance. When Barlow was released, he came back and sat on Nielsen's doorstep to await his return from work. Nielsen invited him in, and they drank together before Barlow fell into a deep sleep. Nielsen found his presence a nuisance, so he strangled him. The next day, he stuffed Barlow in the cabinet under the kitchen sink. He sat in the flat with a half dozen other bodies awaiting disposal. Some of them Nielsen had kept in bed with him for sexual purposes for as long as a week. Having control over these men thrilled him, and the mystery of a dead body that would not respond fascinated him. It was his feeling that he appreciated them more deeply than they had ever been appreciated before. Nielsen sprayed his rooms twice a day to be rid of flies that were hatched. Another tenant mentioned the pervasive odor, but Nielsen assured her it was the decay of the building. 
Once he contemplated suicide, but his dog came in, wagging her tail, and he decided against it. Instead, he spat on his image in the mirror. To get rid of the corpses, he would put his dog and cat in the garden, strip down to his underwear, and cut them up on the stone kitchen floor with a kitchen knife. Sometimes he would boil the flesh off the head in the pot he had bought for the first victim. He had learned how to butcher, so he knew how best to cut up a body, and he placed the organs in a plastic bag. Then he would replace the whole package under the floor until the next step. At one point, there were two entire bodies beneath the boards and one dismembered. He also put pieces into the garden shed or down a hole near a bush outside. Internal organs he put into a gap between the double fencing in his yard. A few severed torsos he stuffed into suitcases. When he could, he dragged the bags and suitcases out to the yard and burned the bodies a few feet from the garden fence. It always amazed him that no one queried him about his activities or tried to stop him. In fact, when his apartment was vandalized, he had detectives investigate and they remained completely unaware that they stood over the remains of two men. Children came from the neighborhood to watch the blazing fire that burned all day, and Nielsen warned them to keep some distance from it. As the fire burned down, he spotted a skull in the center and crushed it into ash. Then he raked the remains of six men into the earth. Five more were still to die in that apartment, their remains consumed in a third bonfire. When he prepared to move to a new place, he checked around and nearly forgot that he had placed the hands and arms of Martin Barlow near a bush. He took care of that final detail and then drove away, hoping to put this part of his life behind him. Sixteen months later, after he was arrested, police officers found over 1,000 bone fragments in his former garden. Nielsen had lost the use of a garden and even of the space underneath floorboards. The house where he moved had been divided into six apartments and his flat at 23 Cranley Gardens was an attic. He was sure this would be a deterrent for his compulsive homicides. However, three more murders took place and his quarters presented a complicated problem regarding disposal. The first victim was John Howlett, whom Nielsen called John the Guardsman. They had met once in a pub and had engaged in a long conversation. Then Nilsson was drinking alone one day when John walked in and recognized him. They chatted and then decided to go to Nilsson's place, where after drinking a while, John got into Nilsson's bed. Nilsson tried to get him to leave, but he refused to go. Nilsson then found a length of loose upholstery strap on an armchair and used it to strangle the man. At one point, he feared he would be overpowered, so he tightened his grip as John fought for control. Then he struck his head and soon went limp. Nilsson kept the strap on him until he was sure he was dead, and then went shakily into the other room. He soon became aware that John was still alive. He lopped the strap around his neck again and held it for two or three minutes. However, John's heart was still beating, so Nilsson dragged him into the bathroom to drown him, leaving him there for the rest of the night. Then he put the body in a closet as he contemplated how to get rid of it. He decided to dissect it into small pieces and flush it down a toilet. He had to hurry as he had a friend coming to visit. When the flushing process took longer than expected, he boiled some of the flesh in his kitchen along with the head, hands, and feet. Then the bones were separated and put into the trash. Some larger bones he hurled over the back garden fence into a waste area and placed others into a bag sprinkled inside with salt and stored those in a tea chest. He covered that with a red curtain. The second man was Archibald Graham Allen. Nilsson made him an omelette, and what he recalled of this death was rather odd. I noticed he was sitting there, and suddenly he appeared to be asleep or unconscious with a large piece of omelette hanging out of his mouth, Nilsson said. At that point, he thought he strangled him, but does not recall. He thought the man might have choked on the egg dish. If the omelette killed him, I don't know, recalled Nilsson. Since an omelette does not leave red marks on someone's neck, Nilsson supposed that he was the one responsible. He placed Allen into a bath and left him there for three days, then dissected him as he had with John the Guardsman. The third and last victim was Stephen Sinclair, age 20, who took drugs and loitered around Leicester Square. On January the 23rd, 1983, some of his acquaintances saw him go off with a strange man. They went to Nilsson's home where Nilsson sat and listened to music, while Sinclair shot up and then fell asleep in a chair. 
Nilsson went into the kitchen and found some thick string, thinking to himself, here we go again. The string was too short, so he attached it to a tie. He draped the ligature over the sleeping man's knees and poured himself a drink. Then he sat and contemplated all the pain in Stephen's life and decided to stop it for him. He went over, made sure he was deeply asleep, and then used the string and tie ligature to strangle him. He struggled slightly and then went unconscious. Nilsson told him, nothing can hurt you now. Then he removed bandages on Stephen's arms and discovered that he recently had tried to commit suicide with a razor. Nilsson then bathed him and put him into the bed. He placed two mirrors by the bed and removed his clothes so that he could look at the two of them naked together. He experienced a feeling of oneness and thought that this surely was the meaning of life and death. He talked with Stephen as if he were still alive. The dog jumped into bed with them and sniffed at Stephen. Nilsson turned the young man's head toward him and kissed it. He had no idea that this corpse would betray him and finally be the cause of his undoing. Nilsson believes his troubles can be pinpointed to the traumatizing sight of his grandfather's corpse. He was born in Fraserburgh, Scotland on November 23, 1945, the only child of Betty and Olav Nilsson. It was an unhappy marriage, full of conflict from Olav's drunkenness and long absences. The marriage lasted seven years until Betty divorced Olaf. She and Dennis, along with his two siblings, were already living in the home of her parents, since her husband had never provided otherwise, so they just stayed where they were. Young Dennis especially loved his grandfather, Andrew White, but when Dennis was only six, Andrew died. Without telling Dennis what had happened, his mother took him to see the corpse, which triggered a terrible awareness of devastating loss. He says in retrospect that it caused a sort of emotional death inside him. When he was eight, he nearly drowned in the sea and was rescued by an older boy who was playing on the beach. The boy must have been aroused by Nilsson's prostate body, for he removed his clothes and apparently masturbated onto him. Nilsson awoke to find a sticky white substance on his stomach. Then his mother remarried two years later, and he withdrew and became a loner. She had four more children and little time for Dennis. He never exhibited rage, cruelty to animals or other children, or any type of aggressiveness typically associated with conduct-disordered boys who become killers later in life. In fact, he was horrified by the cruelties that he witnessed by others. Once, he helped to search for a man who had turned up missing, and he and a friend found the man's corpse on the banks of a river. The man had wandered out into the night and had drowned. The body reminded Nilsson of his grandfather, whose death and permanent departure he had been unable to comprehend. He felt oddly distant. Having had no sexual encounter as an adolescent, but having experienced attraction to other boys, Nilsson remained fairly innocent. Once he had looked at his brother's sleeping form, exploring his naked anatomy, but that had been quickly aborted. In 1961, he enlisted in the army and became a cook, which is how he learned butchery. He began to rely on alcohol to stave off loneliness, although he kept his distance from others. It was during these years, when he finally got a private room, that he would lay down in front of a mirror in such a way as not to see his head and pretend to be unconscious. The other body aroused him and he would masturbate as he contemplated it. During the last few months of service, he met a man whom Brian Masters, in the definitive book on Nielsen, called Terry Finch, and they developed a close relationship. Nielsen was clearly in love and he got the young man, who was not gay, to pretend to be dead while he took home movies. Their parting was a source of great pain for Nielsen. He destroyed the films he had made and gave the projector to Terry. In 1972, he trained to become a policeman. One of the experiences he recalled was seeing autopsied bodies in a morgue. He found himself fascinated. Nevertheless, this job was not for him, and after a year, he resigned. He got employment as a job interviewer and remained with that until his arrest. He met a young man there, David Painter, who was looking for a job. Nilsson later encountered him in the street, and they went together to Nilsson's flat. Painter crawled into bed and fell asleep. He awoke to find Nilsson taking pictures of him, and he created such a row that he hurt himself and he had to be taken to a hospital. Nilsson was questioned by the police and released. He fell into a life of casual pickups, but was troubled by how transient and superficial they were. 
He sought something more enduring. He was ready to commit if only someone would commit to him. His fantasies in the mirror developed more bizarre qualities. Now he thought of the other body as being dead, a state he perceived as emotional and physical perfection. He even used makeup to achieve a better effect, including mixing up some fake blood to make it appear that he had been murdered. He imagined someone coming in to take him and bury him. Sometimes it worried him to be so in love with his own dead body. In 1975, he moved into 195 Melrose Place in North London, a ground floor flat with a garden with a man named David Galligan who denied that their friendship was homosexual. They bought a puppy, which they named Bleep, and then added a cat. Two years later, with their diverse personalities causing considerable distress to both, Nilsson ordered Galligan to leave. Afterward, however, he felt very afraid that he would end up alone. Loneliness is a long, unbearable pain, he wrote. He threw himself into his work, becoming increasingly more political, drank more, and watched a lot of television. The killings began a year and a half after Galligan left. The last body Nilsson dissected, that of Stephen Sinclair, got the same treatment as the two preceding it. He boiled the head, hands, and feet, and placed the rest in plastic bags. He put one part in a cubby hole in the bathroom, and others went into the tea chest. Some of the flesh and organs were flushed down the toilet. Nilsson may also have dumped some large pieces, because a man found a bag ripped apart near his garden, some distance away from Nilsson's, which contained what looked like a rib cage and a spinal column. He did not report it, and it disappeared within a few days. It was never tied to Nilsson. There were five other tenants at 23 Cranley Gardens, but none of them knew Nilsson very well. During the first week of February, one of them noticed that the downstairs toilet was not flushing properly. He tried to clear the blockage with acid, but to no avail. Other toilets seemed to be functioning as poorly, but Nilsson denied that he was having any problems. A plumber arrived to investigate, but his tools did not work. He called in a specialist. Nilsson feared that his own activities might be at the heart of the problems downstairs, so he stuffed the rest of Sinclair's body into plastic bags, along with a partially boiled head. He locked the remains into the closet. He stopped flushing the toilet. Two days later, in the evening, a company called Dino Rod arrived to examine the blockage. Deciding it was underground, the technician, Michael Catran, went into a manhole by the side of the house. He noticed a peculiar smell. Catrin was convinced it was from something dead. He spotted sludge about eight inches thick on the floor of the sewer and found that it was composed of 30 to 40 pieces of flesh. It had come from the pipe leading from the house. He reported his findings to his superiors. The tenants gathered around him as he phoned, including Nielsen, and he mentioned that they might have to call the police. First, however, his company would do a better analysis by daylight. He then took Nielsen and one of the other tenants back outside with them to see the pile of rotting flesh. Nielsen returned at midnight to remove the particles of flesh and dump them over the fence. He thought about replacing them with pieces of chicken from the store and then pondered suicide. Instead, he sat alone in his flat and drank, surrounded by body parts of three men. However, the downstairs tenants had noticed his movements. When Catrin returned and found the sewer cleaned out, the tenants told him their suspicions. From deep inside the sewer, he pulled out one piece of foul-smelling meat and called the police. At work on the day of February the 9th, 1983, Nilsson told a co-worker, If I'm not in tomorrow, I'll either be ill, dead, or in jail. They both laughed. But Nilsson sensed something coming. When he stepped into the dark hallway to go to his flat, he saw three men waiting for him. Detective Chief Inspector Jay told him they had come about his drains. He told Nilsson that human remains blocked them. Nilsson exclaimed in dismay and then asked, where did it come from? They pointed out that it could only have come from his own flat and asked about the rest of the body. Nilsson gave up and said he would come to the station. He knew his rights and admitted that he wanted to talk and talk he did as he unburdened himself in sickening detail. The more he talked, the more the police realized that they had been given clues over the past four years, and had they acted differently, they might have stopped the killing spree much sooner. A search of Nilsson's closet uncovered several bags of male remains in various stages of decomposition. These were taken to a mortuary for examination. 
Nielsen told them to look in the tea chest and under a drawer in the bathroom. He also pointed them towards his former apartment where he had killed 12 to 13 men. He admitted that there were seven others whom he had tried to kill and had failed. In the police station, Nielsen said, the victim is the dirty platter after the feast and the washing up is an ordinary clinical task. Nielsen began to spill out the details of his murders at once, despite being cautioned. His formal questioning began on February the 11th. It lasted over 30 hours, spread throughout the week. Nielsen talked about his techniques and helped the police to identify parts of the victims. He did not really require much prompting. The information flooded out as if to purge his conscience and to get rid of every possible memory. He made no digressions and did not plead for compassion. He also exhibited no remorse. He claimed later that his professional training allowed him to feign calmness so the officials could take down the information. He told them what they would need for conviction, but nothing personal. Privately, he was afraid and deeply disturbed by what he had done. Thanks to Nilsson, it was possible to find the various pieces of bodies and assemble them into a person, as they did with Stephen Sinclair. His lower half was in a bag in the bathroom. From there, they could figure out which torso was his, along with the rest. With a definite identity, they were able to charge Nilsson and hold him pending further investigation. Nilsson also accompanied police to 195 Melrose Avenue and pointed out where he had buried things and made bonfires. A lawyer was now appointed to Nilsson, named Ronald T. Moss, who listened with the police to Nilsson's detailed confession. He was satisfied that Nilsson understood what was happening. When one police officer insisted that Nilsson was a predator with malicious intent, Nilsson responded, I seek company first and hope everything will be all right. Later, he wrote his gruesome memoir for a young writer, Brian Masters, who turned Nilsson's ramblings into a book. As Masters says, Nielsen is the first murderer to present an exhaustive archive measuring his own introspection. His prison journals are therefore a unique document in the history of criminal homicide. After the confession, Nielsen was removed to Brixton Prison to await his trial. He was troubled by the reaction of the press that immediately followed his arrest. No one wants to believe ever that I am just an ordinary man, he mused, come to an extraordinary and overwhelming conclusion. Many young men, and even a woman, came home with Nilsson and left unharmed, but a few just barely managed to escape, and some of those had made police reports. A more thorough investigation may have saved some lives. Nilsson claims that he made seven attempts in which he was either fought off or later changed his mind. He recalls the names of only four, but three of them testified against him at trial. In October 1979, Andrew Ho made a complaint. He said Nielsen had attacked him, but he would not make a written statement or agree to attend court as a witness, so there was no follow-up. Perhaps Ho did not want to admit his own solicitation of Nielsen. Almost a year later, Douglas Stewart said that Nielsen had attacked him. He had fallen asleep in the armchair, waking to find his feet tied and Nielsen putting a tie around his neck. He fought back, knocking Nielsen over, and Nielsen told him to leave. He called the police in 195 Melrose Place on August 11, 1980, around 4 a.m., but they noticed that he had been drinking. They knocked at the door, and Nilsson seemed surprised by what they had said. They figured it to be a homosexual encounter, with both sides hiding some of the truth. They made a report, but Stewart failed to follow up as required. Nilsson lived in his Cranley Gardens flat less than a year and a half, but killed three men. He nearly killed several more. On November 23, 1981, Nielsen's 36th birthday, he took a 19-year-old gay student named Paul Nobbs back home with him, and they sat drinking together. Then they went to bed, and Nobbs woke up at 2.30 in the morning with a terrible headache. He woke again at 6 and went into the kitchen. In the mirror there, he saw a deep red mark across his throat. The whites of his eyes were bloodshot, and his face looked bruised. Nilsson commented that he looked awful and advised him to see a doctor. That day, Nobbs visited the university infirmary and learned that bruises on his throat indicated that someone had tried to strangle him. He declined to report the incident. The victim right after him was John Howlett, who did not escape. For New Year's Eve that year, 
Neighbors of Nielsen were invited to his flat, but they had plans. Besides, he appeared drunk, which disturbed them. They heard him leave the house and return home with someone. Then they heard a commotion upstairs. Someone came running down the steps, sobbing, and ran out the front door. That man was Toshimitsu Ozawa. He told police that he thought Nielsen had intended to kill him. He had approached Ozawa with a tie stretched between his hands. There was no follow-up investigation. In April 1982, Nielsen entertained a drag artist named Carl Stodder, age 21. They drank together and went to bed. He attempted to strangle Stodder, who woke up unable to breathe. He thought Nielsen was trying to help him, but that was not the case. Nielsen carried him into the bathroom and placed him in a tub of water, submerging him several times until Stodder begged for him to stop. Stodder then went under and stopped struggling. Nielsen thought he was dead and carried him to the couch. Bleep jumped up and began to lick Stodder's face, aware that he was still alive. Nielsen then took him to bed and wrapped himself around the young man until he regained consciousness. Nielsen told Stodder that he had gotten his throat caught in the zipper of the sleeping bag that had covered him. Stodder attributed the experience to a bad nightmare, despite getting a checkup and learning that his condition was consistent with severe strangulation. He actually agreed to meet Nielsen again, but did not keep the appointment. He also did not go to the police. While awaiting his trial, Nielsen decided to dispense with his legal aide, Ronald Moss, but then reinstated him. Nearing the trial date, he fired him and hired Ralph Heems, the lawyer of a prisoner with whom he was in love, David Martin. Heems decided to go for diminished responsibility defense, citing a mental abnormality in Nilsson. His defense counsel was Ivan Lawrence, asking for a charge of manslaughter. Nilsson examined the crime scene photos and felt ill over his atrocious acts against others. He wondered if the victim's families could ever forgive him. He wrote over 50 notebooks of his memoirs to assist the prosecution and also drew a series of sad sketches showing what he had done to some of his victims. On the eve of his trial, he wrote, I've judged myself more harshly than any court ever could. Nilsson was charged with six counts of murder and two charges of attempted murder. Alan Green was the prosecutor. He maintained that Nilsson had killed in full awareness of what he was doing and should be found guilty of murder. His principal evidence was from Nilsson's lengthy statement to the police, while the defense relied on psychiatric analysis. The trial began on October 24, 1983. The charges were read and Nilsson pleaded not guilty to each one. Green described the events of the morning of Nilsson's arrest, but did not force the jury to look at photos of the grisly remains. He also mentioned that there was another count of murder and of attempted murder, but these had been determined too late to include in the original indictment. Those who testified against Nilsson were Paul Nobbs, Douglas Stewart, and Carl Stodder. Nilsson attempted to undermine their credibility by helping his lawyer to point out problems with some of their statements. He said that Stewart had stayed for another drink after the alleged attack, which Stewart could not explain, and the defense counsel managed to get him to admit that he had sold his story to the media with embellishments. Nobbs admitted to a sexual encounter with Nielsen and said that he had appeared to be quite friendly throughout the evening. Stodder, shy and quite terrified by the proceedings, also said that Nielsen had been solicitous and friendly. Nevertheless, his chilling account had a damaging effect on the defense. Nielsen's interviews with the police were read verbatim, taking four hours. The evidence presented in court included the cooking pot, the cutting board used to dissect one victim, and a set of knives that had belonged to Martin Duffy. The defense witness, Dr. James McKeith, discussed the various aspects of unspecified personality disorder from which he believed Nielsen suffered. He then described how Nielsen had always had trouble expressing his feelings, and he always fled from relationships that had gone wrong. His maladaptive behaviors had been in place since childhood. He had the ability to separate his mental and behavioral functions to an extraordinary degree, which implied diminished responsibility for what he was doing. The psychiatrist also described Nielsen's association between unconscious bodies and sexual arousal. He was also narcissistic and grandiose, with the added hindrance of blackouts from excessive drinking. 
He had an impaired sense of identity and was able to depersonalize others to the point where he did not feel much about what he was doing to them. On strenuous cross-examination, McKeith was forced to retract his judgment about diminished responsibility in all of the cases. He said that was for the court to decide. The second psychiatrist, Dr. Patrick Galway, diagnosed Nielsen with a borderline false self as if pseudonormal narcissistic personality disorder. He settled for false self syndrome, which meant that Nielsen had occasional outbreaks of schizoid disturbances that he managed most of the time to keep at bay. Such a person is most likely to disintegrate under circumstances of social isolation. In effect, Nielsen was not guilty of malice aforethought. Even the judge questioned Galloway's obtuse medical jargon, and his testimony had the effect of being over the jury's heads. A rebuttal psychiatrist was called, Dr. Paul Bowden, who had spent 14 years with Nielsen, much more than those doctors for the defense. He found no evidence for much of the testimony put forth by the other psychiatrists and thought that Nielsen was manipulative. He did see Nielsen as a unique case, with a mental abnormality, but not a mental disorder. His explanation of the difference was not very clear. During the summing up, in which the case was reduced to its basic elements, the judge instructed the jury that a mind can be evil without being abnormal, thereby dispensing with all of the psychiatric jargon. The jury retired on Thursday, November 3rd. The following day, at 11.25 a.m., the judge said that he would accept a majority count since there were two dissenters on every issue except the attempted murder of Nobbs. At 4.25, they delivered a verdict, guilty on all counts. The judge sentenced Dennis Andrew Nielsen to life in prison, not eligible for parole for 25 years. Nielsen was almost 38. Nielsen, no doubt, influenced many fiction writers to some degree, but one of the most sustained portrayals of a killer based on him is Poppy Z. Bright's Exquisite Corpse. In that novel, she draws together two serial killers, Jay Byrne, who lives in her hometown of New Orleans, and Andrew Compton from London. To Compton, murder is an art. Since he was 13, he would imagine himself dead, using makeup to enhance the effect. He uses this talent to feign his own death so he can escape from prison. Then he goes to the United States, where he meets Byrne, based in part on Jeffrey Dahmer. Together, they pick out the perfect victim. This story is filled with graphic descriptions of the dismemberments and decomposition of bodies. Bright was clearly, and admittedly, inspired by Nielsen's long and detailed account of his techniques. Her own killer, age 33, killed 23 boys and young men between 1977 and 1988. Nielsen himself said that had he not been arrested, he would have continued what he was doing and might have left thousands of corpses. Like Nielsen, his victims were transients, and he would take care of them in such a way as to make them pliable. Also, like Nielsen, he enjoyed the act of murder, though he chose the knife. But he did not much care for the necessary dismemberment afterwards. He kept them in his flat for as long as a week, and he did not mind the odor of death. He wanted them with him so he would not feel alone. A corpse would never walk away, he says. As he cut them up, he drank alcohol, just like Nielsen, and after he was incarcerated, he filled numerous notebooks with his introspection and recollections. Although Compton is much more of a predator than Nielsen, his psychology owes its inspiration to his real-life counterpart. British authorities have thwarted Dennis Nielsen's attempt to publish his five-volume, 4,000-page memoir, apparently called A History of a Drowning Boy, Papers from a Prisoner. Yet he's found a new means of getting some press, a letter to an editor. Incarcerated since 1983, Nielsen told police the details of his first murder, and on November 4, 2006, he sent a three-page letter from Full Sutton Prison to an editor of the Evening Standard. While in carefully printed prose, he discussed the recent development, out of consideration for the victim's family, he declined to provide the most graphic details. Numerous papers covered this event, especially London-based media such as The Times, and the letter was posted online. In it, Nielsen described his encounter with the 14-year-old boy whose death, he once had stated, had changed my life as I knew it. His name was Stephen Dean Holmes, and despite his youth, 
Nilsson apparently met him in the Cricklewood Arms pub. That was in 1978. While Nilsson wrote that Stephen was the first of 12 victims, the police estimate that he actually killed at least 15. He had said he'll assist in the identification of all his victims, but seven remain unidentified. Stephen was once in this group because, at the time of Nielsen's arrest, he had not known who the boy was. He'd been on a drunken binge during their encounter and later could not find identification papers on the body. Thus, Nielsen was not charged with this murder when tried for six others. Yet the police had not given up. In 1990, they had taken a blurred photograph of Stephen Holmes to show Nielsen, but he'd been unable to say whether the boy pictured was the one he'd killed. Then, in January 2006, Stephen's family provided a better photo. Detectives showed it to Nielsen, and he made the identification. Stephen was his first homicide victim. Using what would become his usual M.O., he'd invited Stephen back to his house for a beer. They drank together throughout the night, and Stephen stayed over. When Nielsen woke up, he panicked that Stephen would now leave him, so he used a tie to strangle him. Stephen fought but finally passed out, and Nielsen drowned him in a bucket. Faced with the difficulty of disposing of the corpse, he placed it beneath the floorboards of his flat. Over the course of eight months, he examined it out of curiosity and finally burned the remains in the back garden until nothing was left but teeth and bone fragments. Nielsen claims that at one point he urged the police to use these items to help identify Stephen, but had learned that they'd been disposed of. The Times Online offered a few details about Stephen, born in Hampstead to Irish parents. Heterosexual and popular, he enjoyed football and rock and roll. In fact, he had disappeared on his way home from a concert. Apparently, he'd gone into the pub, possibly to warm up, before catching a bus home. Instead, he met Nielsen. Although Stephen's mother died without learning what had happened to him, his father was still alive. The minimum term of 25 years to life imprisonment to which Nielsen was sentenced in 1983 was replaced by a whole life tariff by Home Secretary Michael Howard in December 1994. This ruling ensured he would never be released from prison, a punishment he accepted. In 2003, Nielsen was again transferred to HMP Full Sutton, where he remained incarcerated as a Category A prisoner. In the prison workshop, Nielsen translated books into Braille. He spent much of his free time reading and writing, and was allowed to paint and compose music upon a keyboard. He also exchanged letters with numerous people who sought his correspondence. Nielsen remained at HMP Full Sutton until his death on the 12th of May, 2018. Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe after Russia, and it is located in the eastern quadrant. The country has rarely stood alone and has been subjugated at one time or another by Poland, Lithuania, and Russia. The territory of Ukraine is mostly a level, treeless plain, except for the Crimean Mountains in the Crimean Peninsula and the Carpathians in the west. The climate is moderate and winters are relatively mild with no severe frosts. Because of these positive climactic conditions, Ukraine is by tradition an agricultural area. They grow wheat, maize, buckwheat, and a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Ukraine is also one of the world's main centers of sugar production. The country is also rich in natural resources, such as iron ore, coal, various metal ores, oil, gas, etc., and has a variety of industries concentrated mostly in and around big cities, such as Kiev, Zaporizhia, Dnepropetrovsk, and Dnaya Prodzelzygnys. They produce planes and ships, cars, buses, locomotives, computer and electronic equipment, precision instruments, agricultural machines, and various other consumer goods. Odessa, Sebastopol, Mykolaiv, Kherson, and Kersh are Ukraine's main ports. A massive Soviet military base once dominated the town of Yavoriv, located in western Ukraine, but after the end of the Cold War, the base has been cut in size, and religion now dominates the area. Nobody works Sunday, much less Easter Sunday. Nobody, that is, except the police, for whom any holiday means double shifts and unwanted overtime. Investigator Igor Kuni usually had Sundays off. However, 
by 10 in the morning on April 7, 1996, he was on his beat in the military housing area as part of an added holiday detail. At the precinct house a few kilometers across town, Kuni's boss, Deputy Police Chief Sergei Krykov, was sitting in his office, stirring his fifth cup of tea that day. He'd been at work since midnight the previous day and was trying his best to stay alert. Both men were prepared for a long evening. Holidays always meant more public drinking and, subsequently, more work for the police. Neither police officer had the faintest idea that, within a matter of hours, he would be involved in the arrest of a suspect in one of the worst series of murders in modern history. Nor did the two have any idea that they would get no credit for their work. Sometime around noon, Officer Cuny received a strange call from a man by the name of Pyotr Onoprienko. According to Pyotr, he had recently stumbled upon a stash of weapons hidden in his home. He had suspected that they belonged to his live-in cousin, Anatoly Onoprienko, and ordered him to pack up and move. Anatoly had become enraged at his cousin's accusations and told Pyotr that he'd better watch out because he would take care of his cousin's family on Easter. Obviously fearing for the safety of his family, Pyotr wanted Cuny to investigate the threat. Pyotr told the investigator that his cousin had recently moved in with a woman and her child in the nearby town of Zitomilskaya. The information about the suspicious character from the Zitomilskaya intrigued Kryukov, who had just read a police report about a 12-gauge Russian-made Toss 34 hunting rifle, the type used in a recent local killing, had been reported stolen in the Zitomilskaya area. It was a long shot, but I thought, here we've got an armed guy from Zitomilskaya and a weapon missing, and we don't have too many people from Zitom come here, said Kroikov. If I hadn't gotten the tip that morning, I might never have considered it, but as it was, I had to think about it. Concerned, Kroikov quickly called superiors in the Lviv police headquarters for advice on how to proceed. Lviv police chief, General Bogdan Ramonuk instructed Krykov to form a task force and conduct a search of Anatoly Onoprienko's apartment. Within an hour, over 20 patrolmen and detectives were assembled, and the group set off for Ivana Kristitelia Street in unmarked cars. The suspect shared an apartment there with a Yavorev hairdresser, Anna, and her two children. The exits to the suspect's building were blocked with unmarked cars and two men guarded the fourth and second floors. The remaining investigators surrounded the building. Kuni, Kryukov, and patrolman Vladimir Kensalo then approached the suspect's door. Kryukov had no idea whether Anna and her two children were home. Unbeknownst to investigators, they were at church, and Anatoly Onoprienko, whom the children now called Dad, was expecting them home any minute. When Kryukov rang the doorbell, Onoprienko assumed that it was Anna and opened the door without hesitation. To his surprise, he was quickly subdued and handcuffed. As Kryukov looked around the suspect's apartment, he noticed an Akai stereo in the living room. The stereo caught his eye because a Nosovad family, recently murdered in nearby Busk on March 22, 1996, had a similar stereo which was reported missing by family members shortly after their murder. I had a list, which I always carried around, of certain items that had been reported missing, their makes and serial numbers, said Kryukov. And the Akai matched the Bus crime scene. When police asked Onoprienko for his identification, he led them to a closet. As an investigator opened the closet door, Onoprienko dove for a pistol he had previously hidden inside. Regardless of his efforts, he was quickly subdued and unable to get to it in time. The pistol, as it would turn out, was the second piece of evidence. It had been stolen from a murder scene in Odessa. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, investigators escorted Onoprienko back to police headquarters and began a comprehensive search of the premises. By the end of the day, 122 items belonging to numerous unsolved murder victims were recovered from the scene, including a sawed-off Toss 34 rifle. As the search at Ivana Kristitelia Street was winding down, Anna came home. She understood that something serious had happened and asked me what was going on, Kryukov said. There was nothing to do. I took her aside and said, Do you remember those killings at Bratkaivici? And she broke down crying.
Although they had a mountain of material evidence, Krukov needed a confession. Nonetheless, Onyoprienko immediately made it clear that he was not interested in talking. When Kryukov confronted him with the facts, Onoprienko showed little reaction and just smiled. I'll talk to a general, but not to you, he said. Yavorov's lead investigator, Bogdan Tislia, had not been involved in the arrest or initial search. At the time of the operation, he had been at home relaxing with his family. Shortly after the search at Onoprienko's apartment was finished, at approximately 9 o'clock at night, he got a phone call from Kryukov asking him to come in and handle the interrogation. Tislia was considered by CUNY and other investigators to be the best interrogator in the area because of his personality and ability to speak calmly with suspects. At police headquarters, Onyo Prienko had waived his right to an attorney and continued to remain silent. Despite his announcement that he would speak to no one below the rank of general, Tislia considered it imperative to try to get as much information as he could. I was terrified that it would go wrong, he said. In this kind of case, you never know what will happen. He might hang himself in his cell by the next morning, and then you'd never be able to really close the case. We needed to get him to speak. Beginning at 10 p.m., Tislia sat alone in an interrogation room with Onoprienko while they waited for an interior ministry general to arrive from Lviv and tried to get him to talk about himself. Onoprienko was silent at first but in the second half hour of questioning, began to talk about his life, telling Tislia that he had been born in the town of Lasky in the Zitomilskaya Oblast. He told Tislia his mother had died when he was very young and that his father had put him into a Russian orphanage. Onoprienko talked at length about this, saying he was still angry that his father gave him away, but kept his older brother. Onoprienko said that he felt that his father and brother could easily have taken care of him, Tisla said. He was moved and upset to talk about it. Following this line of questioning, Tislia then asked Onoprienko whether he ever felt resentment towards families. Onoprienko hesitated briefly and then shook his head before restating that he would not talk to anyone below the rank of general. At that point, I tried something new, Tislia said. I said to him, We'll get you your general. We'll get ten generals if you want. But how am I going to look if I bring them in here and you've got nothing to tell them? Because maybe there's nothing to tell. How will I look then? And that's when he said it. He said, don't worry, there's definitely something to tell. Shortly after 11 p.m., Tislia left the room and went into the corridor where General Romanuk was waiting. After a brief recess, the two men and Romanuk's assistant Marian Pliuk entered the room and Onoprienko began his confession. He first admitted that he had stolen the shotgun and then admitted that he had used it in a recent murder. Onoprienko confessed to investigators that he killed for the first time in 1989. He had met a friend, Sergei Rohozin, at a local gym where the two worked out. The two hit it off and began spending much of their time together and their friendship eventually turned into a partnership of crime. They began robbing homes as a way to supplement their meager incomes. However, one night after robbing a secluded home outside of town, the owners discovered the two intruders. Armed with weapons they carried for self-defense, the two felt that killing the family was necessary for assuring their freedom. Hence, in covering up their tracks, they murdered the entire family, two adults and eight children. Onoprienko informed investigators that he broke all ties with Sergei a few months later and shot and killed five people, including an 11-year-old boy, who were sleeping in a car. He then burned their bodies. I was approaching the car only to rob it, he said. I was a completely different person then. Had I known there had been five people, I would have left. He said he had derived no pleasure from the act of killing. Corpses are ugly, he said. They stink and send out bad vibes. After I killed the family in the car, I sat in the car with their body for two hours, not knowing what to do with them. The smell was unbearable. Following the murders, Onoprienko kept to himself for several years and moved in with a distant cousin before he killed again on December 24, 1995. That night, he broke into the secluded home of the Saichenko family, located in Harmania, a village in central Ukraine. 
he murdered the forestry teacher, along with his wife and two young sons, with a sawed-off, double-barreled shotgun. He then escaped with the couple's wedding rings, a small golden cross on a chain, earrings, and a bundle of worn clothes. Before leaving the scene of the crime, he set the home ablaze. I just shot them. It's not that it gave me pleasure, but I felt this urge, he said. From then on, it was almost like some game from outer space. Ono Prienko informed investigators that he had a vision from God, was commanded to murder, and just nine days later killed a family of four before burning the house down. All the victims were shot with his gun. He claimed that while fleeing the scene, he was spotted by a man on the road and decided to kill him as well, so as not to leave any living witnesses that could later identify him or place him at the scene. Less than a month later, on January 6, 1996, Onoprienko told investigators that he killed four more people in three separate incidents. He was hanging out near the Berdyansk dnieprovskaya Highway and decided to stop cars and kill the drivers. Onoprienko stated that he murdered four travelers that day, a Navy ensign named Kasai, a taxi driver named Savitsky, and a Kolkos cook named Koshajina. To me, it was like hunting, hunting people down, he explained. I would be sitting, bored, with nothing to do. And then suddenly, this idea would get into my head. I would do everything to get it out of my mind, but I couldn't. It was stronger than me. So I would get in the car or catch a train and go out to kill. Anatoly Onoprienko waited just 11 days after the highway murders before killing again. On January 17, 1996, he drove to Bratkaivici and broke into a home owned by the Pilat family. I look at it very simply, he told investigators, as an animal. I watched all this as an animal would stare at a sheep. He shot five in all, including a six-year-old boy. Following the murder, just before daybreak, he set the house ablaze prior to leaving. While making his getaway, he was spotted by two witnesses a 27-year-old female railroad worker named Konzela and a 56-year-old man named Zakarko. He wasted little time and shot them both in cold blood. Less than two weeks later, on January 30, 1996, in the Fastova, Kievskaya Oblast region, Onoprienko shot and killed a 28-year-old nurse named Marusina, along with her two young sons and a 32-year-old male visitor named Zagranichny. He told investigators that he could not stop himself and was obsessed with killing. A month after the Fastova murders, on February 19, 1996, Onoprienko traveled to Olev's Zitomirskaya Oblast and broke into the home of the Dubchak family. He shot the father and son and mauled the mother and daughter to death with a hammer before leaving. He stated that the young girl had witnessed him murder her parents and was praying when he walked into her room. Seconds before I smashed her head, I ordered her to show me where they kept the money, he said. She looked at me with an angry, defiant stare and said, No, I won't. That strength was incredible, but I felt nothing. On February 27, 1996, Onoprienko said that he drove to Malina in the Livskaya Oblast region and broke into the Bodnalchuk family home. He shot the husband and wife to death and then murdered their two daughters, aged seven and eight. Rather than shooting the young children, he hacked them both to death with an axe. One hour later, a neighboring businessman named Salk was wandering around outside and Onoprienko decided to kill him as well. He shot the man and then hacked up his corpse with the same axe he had used to murder the children. Oh, you know, I killed them because I loved them so much. Those children, those men and women, I had to kill them. The inner voice spoke inside my mind and heart and pushed me so hard. Ono Prienko claimed that his last murder occurred on March 22, 1996, when he traveled to the small village of Busk just outside of Prachkaivici, and murdered the Novosad family, four in all. He shot them to death and set their home ablaze in order to destroy any evidence. I'm not a maniac, he said. If I were, I would have thrown myself onto you and killed you right here. 
No, it's not that simple. I have been taken over by a higher force, something telepathic or cosmic which drove me. I am like a rabbit in a laboratory, a part of an experiment to prove that man is capable of murdering and learning to live with his crimes. To show you that I can cope, that I can stand anything, forget everything. Investigators questioned Onoplienko until 6 a.m. as he confessed to committing over 50 murders during his three-month rampage. They spent most of their time taking down details about each killing. There was little talk of motive, although Onoplienko stated several times that he wanted to be studied as a phenomenon of nature and that a higher being had commanded him to kill. The day after the initial interview with Onoplienko, Tislia went to Lviv, where Onoplienko had been moved, and began a five-day series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with his suspect. Tislia called Onoplienko the most perplexing person I've ever interviewed. The suspect told Tislia he was commanded by God to kill and that he had been chosen as a superior specimen. He claimed he could wield strong hypnotic powers, control animals through telepathy, and stop his heart with his mind. I told him that I thought his hypnotic powers were interesting and asked him, for my benefit, if he could try them on me, Tislia said. But he said that it only worked with weak people and I wasn't a weak enough person. Onoplienko revealed that he had previously spent time in a Kviv hospital for schizophrenia, a lead that Tisla, as a Lviv investigator, was not allowed to pursue. The statement was interesting because immediately following the arrest, Kviv Interior Ministry investigator Alexander Chvevashnenko said that Onoplienko, then identified as Citizen O, was an outpatient whose therapist knew he was a killer. Tisla later stated that he knew nothing about that side of the case, and the Kviv investigators have yet to release any further information regarding it since the initial statement. On April 19, 1996, the investigation was taken out of Tisla's hands and turned over to Federal Interior Ministry investigators. When his week of questioning the suspect was over, Tisla said he had concluded Onoprienko was genuinely insane and had acted alone. There have been many rumors that he was part of a gang, but my feeling is that the discussions of his motives and of his special powers were not fabricated. I can be wrong, but that's what I think, he said. Plus, just thinking rationally, I don't think anyone but a single killer could have pulled off so many murders. In a gang, someone talks, another drinks, a third whispers something to a girlfriend, and it's all over. But, as I say, I could be wrong. Even though psychiatrists declared Anatoly Onoprienko mentally fit to stand trial, the proceedings did not begin until November of 1998. Incredibly, trials in Ukraine cannot begin until the defendant has read all the evidence against him, at his leisure. And in the case of Anatoly Onoprienko, there was plenty to get through. 99 volumes of gruesome photos showing dismembered bodies, cars, houses, and random objects Onoprienko stole from his victims. Another reason for the delay was money. It was not until the head judge in the trial made a televised appeal that the Ukrainian government agreed to allocate the necessary funds for a lengthy trial. On November 23, 1998, a Ukrainian court ruled that 39-year-old Anatoly Onoprienko was mentally competent and could be held responsible for his crimes. The regional court in Zaitomir said that Onoprienko does not suffer any psychiatric diseases, is conscious of and is in control of the actions he commits and does not require any extra psychiatric examination. Deemed competent to face the charges against him, Onoprienko's trial opened in the city of Zaitomir. 90 miles west of Kviv, on February 12, 1999. As the proceedings began, Onoprienko, like Andrei Chikatilo, Russia's infamous Rostov Ripper, sat in court in an iron cage and was spat upon and raged at by the public. Hundreds of people huddled together in the unheated courtroom were angered. Let us tear him apart, shouted a woman from the back of the courtroom just before the hearing started, adding, he doesn't deserve to be shot. He needs to die a slow and agonizing death. Afraid that the crowd might take the law into their own hands, 
Police searched bags and made everyone pass through an airport-style metal detector before continuing. Many of those attending the hearing said they were afraid that the killer would be sentenced to only 15 years in prison, the maximum sentence possible under Ukrainian law except for capital punishment. While in court, Onoprienko had very little to say. Asked if he would like to make a statement, he shrugged his shoulders and replied, No, nothing. Informed of his legal rights, he growled, This is your law. When asked to state his nationality, he said, None. When Judge Dmitry Lipsky said this was impossible, Onoprienko rolled his eyes and replied, Well, according to law enforcement officers, I'm Ukrainian. The defendant claimed he felt like a robot, driven for years by a dark force, and argued that he should not be tried unless authorities could determine the source. You are not able to take me as I am, he shouted at Judge Dmitry Lipsky. You do not see all the good I'm going to do. And you will never understand me, he said. This is a great force that controls this hall as well. You will never understand this. Maybe only your grandchildren will understand. Onoprienko's lawyer, Razlan Moshkovsky, who said he did not contest his client's guilt, blamed the ineptitude of investigators for the extent of his rampage and asked that his childhood in the orphanage be viewed as an extenuating circumstance. Nonetheless, prosecutor Yuri Ignatenko countered that examinations of Onoprienko's mental health during the investigation had overturned an independent diagnosis of schizophrenia made before his arrest and a further test ordered by the courts confirmed his current mental health. The prosecutor said Onoprienko's motives lay in his own violent nature. In every society, there have been and are people who, due to their innate natures, can kill. And there are those who will never do that, he added. People demand how come he killed so many people. But why not, if conditions make it possible? Onoprienko led a double life. And that is the main thing. Onoprienko told the court that he had been driven by a devil, higher powers, and mysterious voices. He assured the court he was guilty of all charges against him, however, insisted that he felt no remorse. I would kill today in spite of anything, Anatoly told the court. Today, I am a beast of Satan. Following 100 volumes of shocking evidence and the defendant's own admissions, Closing arguments began in April of 1999. Prosecutor Yuri Ignatenko wasted little time in demanding the death sentence. In view of the extreme danger posed by Anatoly Onoprienko as a person, I consider that the punishment for him must also be extreme, in the form of the death sentence, Yuri Ignatenko told the court in his concluding speech. Onoprienko's lawyer, Razlan Moshkovsky, once again tried to play on the sympathy of the court as he began his own closing arguments. My defendant was from the age of four deprived of motherly love and the absence of care which is necessary for the formation of a real man, Moshkovsky said. I appeal to the court to soften the punishment. With the trial now over, the court was adjourned to await the judge's ultimate verdict. After just three hours of deliberation, Judge Dmitry Lipsky called the court back into session. Onoprienko stood head-bent, staring at the floor of his metal cage as the sentence was read. In line with Ukraine's criminal code, Onoprienko is sentenced to the death penalty by shooting, Judge Lipsky announced to the court. In his final statement to the court, Onoprienko exclaimed, I've robbed and killed, but I'm a robot. I don't feel anything. I've been close to death so many times that it's even interesting for me now to venture into the afterworld to see what is there after this death. Thank goodness that's over, said a secretary, leaving the hearing. The death sentence ruling put Ukraine in an awkward position. Under its obligations as a Council of Europe member, they had committed to abolishing capital punishment. Nonetheless, both the public and the politicians argued that the Onoprienko case was an exception. Following his sentencing, Onoprienko, the media dubbed Terminator, gave a lengthy interview to a London Times reporter. During their meeting, Onoprienko reminisced about the murders he had committed. I started preparing for prison life a long time ago. I fasted, did yoga. I'm not afraid of death, he said. Death for me is nothing, 
Naturally, I would prefer the death penalty. I have absolutely no interest in relations with people. I have betrayed them. The first time I killed, I shot down a deer in the woods. I was in my early 20s, and I recall feeling very upset when I saw it dead. I couldn't explain why I had done it, and I felt sorry for it. I never had that feeling again. If I'm ever let out, I will start killing again. But this time, it will be worse. Ten times worse. The urge is there. Seize this chance, because I am being groomed to serve Satan. After what I've learned out there, I have no competitors in my field. And if I'm not killed, I will escape from this jail, and the first thing I'll do is find Kuchma, the Ukrainian president, and hang him from a tree by his testicles. Onoprienko's accomplice in the first set of murders, 36-year-old Sergei Rohozin, was sentenced to 13 years in prison. As a side note, in March 1996, the Security Service of Ukraine, the SBU, and Public Prosecutor's Office specialists detained 26-year-old Yuri Mozola as a suspect of several brutal murders. Over the course of three days, six SBU members and one representative of the Public Prosecutor's Office tortured Mozola by burning, electric shocking, and beating him. Mozola refused to confess to the crimes and died during the torture. Seventeen days later, the real murderer, Anatoly Onoprienko, was apprehended. Onoprienko escaped the death penalty and was sentenced to life imprisonment. In 1995, Ukraine had entered the Council of Europe and thus, at the time, it undertook to abolish the death penalty. Onoprienko died of heart failure in the prison of Zaitomir on August 27, 2013. He was 54 years old. On August 15, 1982, Robert Ainsworth, 41, stepped into his rubber raft and began his descent south down the Green River toward the outer edge of Seattle's city limits. It was a trip he had made on many occasions, yet this time it would be different. As he drifted slowly downstream, he noticed a middle-aged balding man standing by the riverbank and a second, younger man sitting in a nearby pickup truck. Ainsworth suspected that the men were out for a day's fishing. He asked the older man if he had caught anything. The man replied that he had not. According to Smith and Gullen's book, The Search for the Green River Killer, the man standing then asked Ainsworth if he found anything, to which Ainsworth replied, Just this old single tree. Soon after, the two men left in the old pickup truck, and Ainsworth continued to float down the river. Moments later, he found himself surrounded by death. As he peered into the clear waters, his gaze was met by staring eyes. A young black woman's face was floating just beneath the surface of the water, her body swaying beneath her with the current. Believing it might be a mannequin, Ainsworth attempted to snag the figure with a pole. Accidentally, the raft overturned as he tried to dislodge the figure from a rock, and Ainsworth fell into the river. To his horror, he realized that the figure was not a mannequin, but a dead woman. Seconds later, he saw another floating corpse of a half-nude black woman partially submerged in the water. Quickly, Ainsworth swam towards the riverbank where the truck stood earlier. In shock, he sat down and waited for help to arrive. Within a half hour, he noticed a man with two children on bicycles. He stopped them, told them of his gruesome discovery, and asked them to get the police. Before long, a policeman arrived at the scene and questioned Ainsworth about his find. The officer disbelievingly walked into the shallow river and reached out toward the ghostly form. The officer immediately called for backup. Soon after reinforcements arrived at the scene, detectives sealed off the area and began to search for evidence. During the search, a detective made another macabre discovery. He found a third body, that of a young girl who was partially clothed. Unlike the other two girls, this one was found in a grassy area less than 30 feet from where the other victims lay in the water. It was obvious that she had died from asphyxiation. The girl had a pair of blue pants knotted around her neck. She also showed signs of a struggle because she had bruises on her arms and legs. She was later identified as Opal Mills, 16. It was believed that she had been murdered within 24 hours of her discovery. Following an examination of the bodies at the scene, Chief Medical Examiner Donald Ray determined that all three girls died of strangulation. The two girls found in the water, later identified as Marcia Chapman, 31, and Cynthia Hines, 17, 
were both found to have pyramid-shaped rocks lodged in their vaginal cavities. They were both held down by rocks in the water. Ray further determined that Chapman, a mother of two who had gone missing two weeks earlier, had been dead for over a week. She had shown advanced signs of decomposition. However, Hines was believed to have been in the river for a period of only several days. The three bodies were not the only ones to be found in and around Washington State's Green River. Several days earlier, the body of a woman named Deborah Bonner was discovered. Her nude body had been found slumped over a log in the Green River. She, too, had been strangled to death. Just a month earlier, another young girl, identified as Wendy Lee Caulfield, was found strangled and floating in the Green River. Moreover, six months prior to Caulfield's discovery, the body of her friend, Leanne Wilcox, was found several miles from the river in an empty lot. It was not believed that the Green River killer murdered Wilcox. Within the space of six months, six bodies had been discovered in or near the river. The police detectives at the scene quickly realized that there was a serial killer on the loose. They knew that they had to find and catch him as soon as possible before any more women disappeared. A special task force was assembled of King County detectives to investigate the Green River murders. According to the Seattle Times, it was the largest police task force ever assembled since the Ted Bundy murders less than a decade earlier. Major Richard Kraske, the head of the Criminal Investigation Division, and Detective Dave Reichardt of the King County Major Crime Squad led the team. They enlisted the help of FBI serial killer profile John Douglas and criminal investigator Bob Keppel, who was known for his unique and successful approach of compiling evidence in the Ted Bundy case eight years earlier. The investigation got off to a shaky start because a massive influx of information swamped the police force within a relatively short period of time. They simply did not have the means to process the ever-increasing amount of data and evidence, and much of it was lost, misplaced, or overlooked entirely. In fact, the situation got so bad that at one point they enlisted the help of volunteers to assist the police in the ongoing investigation. During their investigation, detectives learned that many of the murdered girls knew each other and shared a similar history of prostitution. Investigators decided to begin their search for the killer in the area where the girls were known to frequent. They conducted hundreds of interviews with many prostitutes who worked the main strip in Seattle, stretching from South 139th Street to South 272nd Street. Investigators tried to obtain information on any suspicious characters they might have encountered. However, many of the girls were reluctant to talk because of their blatant mistrust for the police. One of the prostitutes who worked the strip filed a report with police, stating that a man who raped her made reference to the Green River murders. Soon after the report, the task force began to search for the assailant. On August 20, 1982, the police announced that they had him in custody as a potential suspect in the Green River murders. However, they were unable to find any plausible evidence connecting him with the crime. He was eventually released, and the search resumed for the killer. There were other prostitutes who filed reports with the police that were of special concern to the task force. It was believed that the reports could be related to the Green River murders. Interviews taken by two separate prostitutes claim that a man in a blue and white truck abducted them and attempted to kill them. According to one account by Susan Widmark, 21, a middle-aged man in a blue and white truck solicited her. Once Widmark was in his truck, he pointed a pistol to her head and sped off toward the highway. He took her to a desolate road, turned off the engine, and proceeded to violently rape her. Following the rape, he allowed her to dress while he began to drive away from the scene with her still in the car. While driving, he made reference to the recent river murders while continuing to hold a gun to her head. Fearing for her life, she managed to escape from the vehicle while at a stoplight. Widmark was able to make out part of the registration number of the truck before the man sped away. A similar incident happened to Deborah Estes, 15, who filed a report with police in late August 1982 concerning a Estes told police that she was walking down the highway when a man in a blue and white pickup truck approached her and offered her a ride. She accepted and climbed into the vehicle. To her amazement, the man pulled a pistol out and pointed it at her head. He violently forced her to give him oral sex before releasing her into the woods, handcuffed and driving off. She immediately fled the scene, looking for help. Seeing an emerging pattern that could have been related to the Green River murders, the task force decided to follow the lead and search for the truck and driver. They hoped that new information concerning the man would lead them to a break in the case. That September, a meat butcher named Charles Clinton Clark was pulled over in his blue and white truck while driving along Seattle's main strip. After a background check was conducted, it was learned that Clark owned two handguns. 
investigators believed that Clark might be the man they were looking for. They obtained his driver's license photo and showed it to both Woodmark and Estes. Both women positively identify Clark as their attacker. Clark was arrested and his house and vehicle were searched. The police found two handguns that were allegedly used in the assaults. After interrogation by police, Clark admitted to attacking the women. However, there was speculation as to whether he was the Green River Killer because he was known to release his victims following an attack. Moreover, Clark had a solid alibi during the time many of the Green River victims disappeared. When Clark was being booked with a rape of Widmark and Estes, 19-year-old Mary Bridget Meehan disappeared during a walk. Meehan was more than eight months pregnant and went missing near the Western Six Motel. The motel was located on the Strip and was a frequent hangout and workplace for many of the prostitutes that fell victim to the Green River Killer. Based on a hunch, Detective Reichert began to suspect that one of the volunteer civilians working on the case might be the Green River Killer. A 44-year-old out-of-war taxi driver became the focus of the investigation and was vigorously interviewed by the police. They were concerned because two weeks prior to Mian's disappearance, two 16-year-old girls, Kaysan Lee and Terry Renee Milligan, mysteriously disappeared. They too were thought to have a history of prostitution. It was suspected that they had fallen victim to the Green River Killer. The taxi driver seemed to fit the profile of the killer devised by FBI agent Sean Douglas. According to Douglas, the Green River Killer was a confident yet impulsive middle-aged man who would most likely frequent the murder scenes in order to reenact the crimes in his mind. The killer was probably familiar with the area and was likely to have deep religious convictions. Moreover, Douglas believed that he might have an active interest in police work, especially the investigation into the recent murders. The killer might even contact the police in an effort to assist in the ongoing investigation. During most of the winter of 1982, police heavily monitored the taxi driver's movements, although he continuously denied having anything to do with the Green River murders. The taxi driver eventually became the primary suspect in the killings. He was arrested for unpaid parking tickets because investigators had no solid evidence connecting him to the murders, except that he knew five of the victims. On September 26, 1982, the decomposing remains of a 17-year-old prostitute named Giselle A. Lavorne were discovered. She had gone missing for more than two months before a biker found her nude body near abandoned houses south of the SeaTac International Airport. She had been strangled to death by a pair of men's black socks. Intriguingly, at the time of her disappearance, she was blonde. Yet, when her body was discovered, her hair was dyed black. Although her body was not found in the direct vicinity of the now infamous river, police believe that she was a victim of the Green River Killer. Between September 1982 and April 1983, approximately 14 girls disappeared. Those missing included Mary Meehan, Deborah Estes, Denise Bush, Shwanda Summers, Shirley Sherrill, Rebecca Marrero, Colleen Brockman, Alma Smith, Dolores Williams, Gail Matthews, Andrea Childers, Sandra Gabbert, Kimi Kai Pitsor, and Marie Malvar. Most of the girls, ages ranging from between 15 and 23 years old, were known prostitutes who frequented the Strip. The Green River Task Force's attention was temporarily drawn to one possible suspect allegedly involved in the disappearance of the last girl to go missing, Marie Malvar. On April 30, 1983, Malvar's boyfriend saw her talking with a potential customer in a dark-colored truck as she was soliciting on the Strip. The boyfriend claimed that he saw Malvar get into the truck before it sped away. According to Smith and Gullen, Malvar's boyfriend stated that Malvar and the unknown man seemed to be engaged in an argument. Suspicious of the driver of the truck, the boyfriend followed them. Before long, the truck with his girlfriend in it gave chase and eventually disappeared when the boyfriend was held up by stoplight. It was the last time he ever saw his girlfriend. He later notified the police of Malvar's disappearance. Less than a week after the incident, he, along with Malvar's father and brother, spotted the suspicious truck near the place where he initially lost sight of it days earlier. They followed the truck to a house located on South 348th Street and called the police. The police eventually arrived at the house and spoke with the owner, Gary Ridgway, who denied having ever seen Malvar. Satisfied, the police left the residence and failed to pursue the matter any further. A similar truck to that owned by Ridgeway was also involved in the April disappearance of a young prostitute named Kimi Kai Pitzer. While in the process of turning a trick, Pitzer's pimp saw her getting into a dark green pickup truck with an attached camper. He described the driver of the vehicle as having a pockmarked face. He watched as the two drove off and he never saw Pitzer again. 
He later informed police, but the information concerning Pitsor's disappearance and Malvar's was never fully connected. By the spring of 1983, the investigation into the Green River Killer and related murders was collapsing. The task force detectives realized that the probability of the taxi driver being the killer was low, yet they continued to keep him as a prime suspect. They had no new leads, and prostitutes continued to rapidly disappear throughout the city. Inundated with an avalanche of tips, the task force was unable to keep up with a massive influx of information. They enlisted the help of Bob Keppel to help organize the mountain of information. In late April, Keppel spent three months going through all the information available pertaining to the murders believed to have been attributed to the Green River Killer. Upon completion of his analysis, he compiled a report for the sheriff of King County, Vern Thomas. To the task force's dismay, the report was highly critical of the ongoing investigation. According to Keppel in his book, The River Man, if the killer was to be found, many changes needed to be made. The report compiled by Keppel stated that most of the data, including evidence, files, and witness accounts connected to the crimes, were in total disarray. The first thing that was needed was a complete reorganization and accurate categorization of all the data. Then, once that was completed, similarities and dissimilarities among the cases needed to be identified in order to find common threads possibly connecting the murders to one or more killers. There was no doubt that a successful and thorough investigation would cost the county a lot more time and money than they previously expected. Already, the investigation was the largest operation in the history of the country. The amount of money needed to implement Keppel's suggestions would far exceed the estimated $2 million. However, something needed to be done in an effort to stop the murderous rampages of the killer. On May 8, 1983, another body was discovered that was later identified as Carol Ann Christensen, 21. Her remains were found by a family hunting for mushrooms in a wooded area near Maple Valley. When Christensen's body was found, the killer displayed her corpse in an unusually gruesome way. Christensen was found with her head covered by a brown paper bag. When it was removed, it was found that she had a fish carefully placed on top of her neck. Smith and Gullen state that the killer also placed another fish on her left breast and a bottle between her legs. Her hands were placed crossed over her stomach and freshly ground beef was placed on top of her left hand. Further examination revealed that she was strangled with a cord. Intriguingly, she also showed signs of having been in water at some point, even though the river was miles away. The task force speculated that she was yet another victim of the Green River Killer. During the spring and summer of 1983, nine more young women, many of whom were prostitutes, disappeared. Those missing included Martina Otherly and Cheryl Lee Wims, 18, Yvonne Antosh, 19, Carrie Royce, 15, Constance Neon, 21, Tammy Lillies, 16, Kelly McGuinness, 18, Tina Thompson, 22, and April Buttram, 17. A majority of the girls were placed on the ever-growing list of possible Green River Killer murders. However, there were some who did not make a list because they were found outside of the parameters where the Green River Killer was known to dump many of the bodies. That summer, several more bodies were discovered. In June, the unidentified remains, which were believed to be of a 17- to 19-year-old white woman, was found on Southwest Tualatin Road. On August 11th, the body of missing Shonda Summers was discovered near the SeaTac Airport. One day later, the remains of another body, which remained unidentified, was found at the SeaTac Airport North site. The fall and winter of 1983 would also yield as many disappearances and even more corpses. Between September and December of 1983, nine more women went missing and seven bodies were discovered, all of whom were believed to have been abducted and murdered by the Green River Killer. The missing women, who were mostly prostitutes, included Debbie Abernathy, 26, Tracy Ann Winston, 18, Patricia Osborne and Maureen Feeney, Mary Sue Bellow, 25, Pammy A. Vent, 16, Delise Plasier, 22, Kim Nelson, 26, and Lisa Lorraine Yates. Those whose bodies were discovered included Dolores Williams, 17, who had gone missing March 8, 1983. Her remains were discovered on September 18th at Star Lake. That same day, the remains of Gail Matthews, 23, were also discovered at Star Lake. Over the next few months, the bodies of five more women were discovered. On October 15th, the skeletal remains of Yvonne Antosh, who was last seen on May 31st, was found near Seuss Creek on Auburn Black Diamond Road. She was one of the few victims to have had a missing persons report filed on her. 
Twelve days later, the partially buried skeleton of Constance Neon was found in an area south of SeaTac Airport. The task force investigators believed that there were probably more bodies to be found in that area, so they decided to conduct a search with the assistance of a team of teenaged explorer Boy Scouts. On October 29th, during a sweep of the empty lots surrounding the airport, one of the scouts found a skeleton covered with trash beneath some bushes. The remains were later identified as Kelly Ware, 22. The killer's deadly rampage claimed two more victims whose bodies were discovered before the new year. On November 13th, following an extensive search of several lots surrounding an area south of SeaTac near South 192nd Street, the badly decomposed remains of Mary Meehan and her unborn baby were found. According to the Cold Serial website, Meehan and her child were the only victims attributed to the Green River Killer who were fully buried. Several unexplainable items were found on or close to the body, including two small pieces of plastic, a large clump of hair near the pubic region of the body, a patch of skin attached to the skull, which contained fibers on it, three small bones, two halved yellow pencils, and clear plastic tubing. One month later, on December 15th, the skull of Kimi Kai Pitsor was found in Auburn, Washington, near Mountain View Cemetery. It seemed as if the killer found a new burial site to place his victims. It would be the fifth known dumping ground used for the disposal of the bodies. Two weeks following Pitzer's discovery, the Green River Task Force increased by more than half due to the increasing numbers of murders in the area. It was feared many more murders would occur in the coming months. Their predictions would prove to be correct. Although the official count of Green River victims was estimated at the time to be 11 or 12, the number has been, and continues to be, challenged. The precise number to this day remains unclear, and it's believed to be much higher than initially estimated. Near the final months of 1983, there were approximately 18 bodies discovered in the Seattle region. Many victims were not included on the list, even though they were killed in very nearly the same fashion as the other victims. There was no explanation given as to why the women were excluded from the list. In January 1984, the Green River Task Force came under new leadership headed by Captain Frank Adamson, who previously headed the police department's internal affairs unit. During the first few months of Adamson's assignment, drastic changes took place. He first decided that it would be in the investigation's best interest to relocate the task force headquarters to the Burien County Precinct, which was near the airport and closer to where the crimes were occurring. Following Keppel's advice, Adamson divided up various tasks and assigned them to individuals within the team. It was believed that this method would facilitate a more thorough organization, integration, and assemblage of the vast amounts of information and lead to more successful results in the case. Smith and Gullen stated that one team composed of seven investigators and one sergeant team leader was assigned to handle the victims of the Green River Killer. Another team of similar construction was assigned to information pertaining to probable suspects. Adamson then assigned three detectives to a newly constructed crime analysis section, whose duties involved the follow-up of leads and analysis of possible trends and methodologies utilized by the killer, as well as other pertinent information relevant to the case. Twenty-two police officers were also assigned to the task force's Protect Proactive Squad, which developed new strategies to monitor prostitute activities on the Strip and any unusual events or dealings in the area. Moreover, a new strategy was imposed by Keppel that changed the investigator's focus from a suspect's possible guilt to the suspect's possible innocence. The implication of this strategy allowed investigators to quickly eliminate people under suspicion who had alibis and instead concentrate on more probable suspects. The suspects that remained were prioritized according to their threat. Those that were most closely linked to victims fit the profile of the killer and his movements were put in Category A. Those who were less closely linked with the crimes were assigned to Categories B or C before being eventually eliminated. Just when it seemed as if the newly revised task force was better prepared to capture the Green River Killer, the inevitable occurred. On February 14, 1984, the skeletal remains of a woman, who was later identified as Denise Louise Plager, were discovered 40 miles from the city close to Interstate 90. She was the first victim to be found that year, but not the last. Over the next two months, approximately nine more bodies would be found. Some of those found included those of Cheryl Wims, 18, Lisa Yates, 26, Debbie Abernathy, Terry Milligan, 16, Sandra Gabbert, 17, and Alma Smith, 22. The other victims remained unidentified. Most of the girls had one primary thing in common, a history of prostitution. 
Although it appeared as if the Green River Task Force was making few advances in the investigation, distinct patterns began to emerge that allowed the team to create a more accurate profile of the killer and his movements. The killer seemed to have several dumping grounds where he would dispose of the bodies of his victims. With the exception of Meehan, the bodies that were discovered were found partially buried or covered with garbage or foliage. Most of the bodies had been found off isolated roads in or near illegal waste dumping areas. The FBI's profiler, John Douglas, concluded that the bodies were dumped in the areas because the killer thought of the women as human garbage. During 1983, dumping grounds moved away from the river and concentrated mostly around the SeaTac Airport and Star Lake. In 1984, the victims' remains were concentrated in the areas of Mountain View Cemetery and North Bend, off of or near to Interstate 90. The victims were also disappearing from two primary areas, the Strip and the downtown area of Seattle. The task force worked under the assumption that the killer worked or lived close to the area where he was disposing the bodies. The task force determined that the areas where the bodies were found, when plotted on a map, roughly formed a triangular shape. It was believed that the killer might live somewhere within that triangle. An important discovery was also made in April when the skeletal remains of some of the victims were found. Shoe impressions, possibly that of the killer, were revealed when investigators removed the brush that partially concealed the bodies. Upon examination of the prints, investigators learned that they were made by a size 10 or 11 man's walking shoe. It was a vital piece of evidence that could connect the killer with his victims. In mid-April, a volunteer task force worker and psychic, Barbara Cubic Pattern, had a vision that another woman's body would be found close to Interstate 90. Cubic Pattern immediately contacted the police and told them about her vision, but became increasingly frustrated when they failed to act on the new information. Taking matters into her own hands, she and her daughter set out to find the woman. Following the leads revealed by her vision, Cubic Pattern and her daughter eventually came across another body. Immediately after the discovery, the two women drove to a nearby search area that was paroled by the police. When she informed one of the officers of her discovery, she was rebuffed and even threatened with arrest for obstruction of the guarded perimeter. Angered, Cubic Pattern informed reporters that were stationed nearby of her discovery. Finally, members of the task force approached her as she talked with the reporters and asked her to show them the body. Shortly thereafter, the police were confronted with a gruesome discovery. The decomposing remains were that of Amina Agashev, 36. She was last seen on July 7, 1982 at a restaurant in downtown Seattle. Agashev did not fit the description of many of the other victims. She was older than the other victims and a waitress, not a prostitute. Agashev was also in a stable relationship at the time of her disappearance and was a mother of two. Although there were obvious differences between Agashev's lifestyle and those of the other victims and the location of where her body was disposed, investigators believed that she was the victim of the Green River Killer. Moreover, she was listed as one of the killer's first victims, even though several murders prior to her disappearance matched the M.O. of the killer. On May 26, two children playing on Javita Road in Pierce County were shocked when they discovered a skeleton. The police and task force were immediately alerted to the new finding. Following a medical examination, it was discovered that the remains were that of 15-year-old runaway Colleen Brockman. Investigators still had no leads to the identity of the killer, apart from the location of the bodies and the shoe print. After almost three years, the murderous killing spree continued. Following the discovery of Brockman, the rash of murders seemed to be diminishing. However, the desire to catch the killer remained a top priority for the task force. In August 1984, investigators believed their big break in the case arrived when two criminals in a San Francisco jail confessed to the Green River murders. After extensive interviews with the two prisoners, the confessions were determined to be a hoax. Several months later, the infamous serial killer Ted Bundy offered from his prison cell on death row to assist Keppel on the task force in finding their man. Bundy offered his old antagonist a rare glimpse into the mind of a serial killer, an offer that Keppel could not refuse. The two men conversed mostly via letters, where Keppel asked detailed questions that he hoped Bundy could answer. Much of the information that Keppel received greatly interested Keppel and the task force investigators. Bundy suggested that the killer knew his victims, probably even befriending them before he lured them to their deaths. According to Keppel's book, The River Man, Bundy suggested that the killer likely disposed of even more bodies where they found the most recent ones. Moreover, he believed the disposal pattern of the bodies led closer to the killer's home. Bundy was able to give unusual insight from a killer's perspective, much of which was helpful to the case. 
The information received from Bundy assisted the detectives in their general understanding of serial killer behavior. In fact, Bundy became one of the primary consultants, next to Douglas and Keppel, that contributed to the buildup of the killer's profile. Despite this unusual advice, the task force remained stymied as to the identity of the Green River Killer. Although the murders seemed to have slowly diminished, they did not cease altogether. Between October and December 1984, two more bodies, identified as Mary Sue Bello, 25, and Martina Otherly, 18, were discovered. Both bodies were found off of Highway 410. The total body count had climbed to 31, although only 28 of the victims actually made it on the ever-growing official Green River murder list. Fourteen women were still believed to be missing. On March 10, 1985, another partially buried body was found near Star Lake Road. The victim was eventually identified as Carrie Ross, 15. She disappeared during the summer of 1983. In mid-June, a man bulldozing a patch of land in Tigard, Oregon, discovered the skeletal remains of two more women. The remains were later identified as Denise Bush, 23, and Shirley Sherrill, 19. Both girls were known prostitutes in Seattle. The discovery of the two women confirmed the fact that the Green River Killer's parameters had extended out of state. It seemed as if a new dumping ground had been revealed. Meanwhile, FBI profiler John Douglas reevaluated the previous profile of the killer and came to a new conclusion that there were two separate killers. Douglas suggested that, although the profiles of both killers were similar in many ways, the way in which they disposed of the bodies slightly differed. To Douglas, it seemed as if one of the killers went to greater effort to conceal the bodies than the other. Whereas some of the bodies were partially covered or buried in isolated areas, other bodies lay openly exposed to detection, such as those found in the Green River. Although the theory seemed to be plausible, there were no suspects available that could support his theory. The case had run cold, and no likely suspects could be connected with any of the murders. Pressure mounted on the task force for its inability to capture the killer, or killers, after more than three years. It was not until the winter that the skeletal remains of yet three more victims were found. The first remains were identified as those belonging to Mary West, which were found in a wooded area in Seward Park in Seattle. The other two remains were that of Kimikai Pitsur and another unidentified white female between 14 and 19 years old. The unusual aspect of this more recent discovery was that Pitsur's remains had been located in two different locations. In December 1983, her skull was discovered in Mountain View Cemetery, and two years later, the remainder of her body was found a short distance away in a ravine. It could have been possible that an animal dragged the skull from the body sometime after death. However, there was no evidence that this occurred. The police believed it was the work of the killer. Investigators were uncertain as to the killer's motive for dividing the body between the two different locations. They speculated that it was done to taunt the police or confuse the investigation. In February 1986, the Green River Task Force seemed to get the break it had been hoping for. A man described by investigators as a person of interest was brought into the police station and searched. The event received a great deal of media attention. An FBI agent and Detective Jim Doyton of the task force extensively questioned the new suspect. However, before long, they realized he was not the man they were looking for. Shortly thereafter, the man was released. During this time, the public became increasingly aware of the task force's lack of results. Thus far, there had been several suspects taken into custody, and each one proved to have no connection with the murders. Public anger and fear reached a boiling point. The media referred to the Green River Task Force as a joke. To make matters worse, that summer, the skeletal remains of three more women were discovered off of I-90, east of Seattle. The remains were those of Maureen Feeney, 19, Kim Nelson, 26, and another unidentifiable young woman. Feeney was the only one of the three that investigators were able to link to a career in prostitution. The number of victims was quickly climbing towards a staggering 40. By the end of 1986, the staff had been reduced by 40% and Adamson was reassigned to another project. Captain James Pompey became the new leader of the Green River Task Force. Pompey immediately began to reorganize the team and the data related to the investigation. Just as Pompey was beginning to get started, two more bodies were discovered in December. This time, the bodies were found much further away than expected, in an area north of Vancouver, British Columbia. Yet again, the killers seemed to be taunting investigators. Even more intriguing was that the partial remains of several other women had been scattered alongside the bodies of the two women. 
Even though the bodies were located a great distance from the others, there was no doubt in the investigators' minds that the work was that of the Green River Killer. In the beginning months of 1987, investigators had a new suspect in relation to the Green River murders. Previously known to police, the newest suspect had been picked up for attempting to solicit an undercover police officer posing as a prostitute in May 1984. However, the man was released after he successfully passed a lie detector test. When investigators looked deeper into the man's past, they discovered that he had been accused of choking a prostitute in 1980 near the SeaTac International Airport. Yet, the man pleaded self-defense after claiming the woman bit him and he was soon after released from police custody. One of the task force detectives, Matt Haney, was highly suspicious of this suspect and decided to dive even further into the man's history. He discovered that the police had at one time stopped and questioned the man back in 1982 when he was in his truck with a prostitute. The investigator learned that the prostitute he was with was one of the women on the Green River murder list, Kelly McGinnis. Moreover, the police approached the man again in 1983 in connection with the kidnapping of murder victim Marie Malvar. A witness, Malvar's boyfriend, followed the truck to the suspect's house after recognizing it as the one he had last saw his girlfriend in. Haney believed he might be on to the Green River Killer. Haney learned from the man's ex-wife that he often frequented the dump sites where many of the bodies had been discovered. Also, several prostitutes claimed to have seen a man matching the suspect's description regularly cruising the strip between 1982 and 1983. It turned out that the man passed the strip almost daily on his way to work. Some of the most damning evidence discovered was that the man, who worked as a truck painter, was found to have been absent or off-duty on every occasion a victim disappeared. Finally, on April 8, 1987, the police obtained a warrant and searched the man's house. According to the Seattle Times, the police also took bodily samples of the suspect so that they could compare them with the evidence they had from the Green River victims. However, there was insufficient evidence to arrest him and the man was released from police custody. The suspect was identified as Gary Ridgway. Several weeks following Ridgway's release, Captain Pompey died from a massive heart attack related to a scuba diving accident. The unfortunate event was picked up by the media and sensationalized. It was suggested that the Green River Killer was actually a police officer that murdered Pompey, regardless of the fact that there was absolutely no substantiating evidence to support the theory. One newspaper even called for an official investigation into the death of Pompey. It seemed as if the public's nerves had become so raw after so much death in the city. The task force, which was now led by Captain Greg Boyle, was called once again in June. Three boys stumbled across the partially buried skeletal remains of a young woman while searching for aluminum cans. The girl, who was identified as Cindy Ann Smith, 17, was found in a ravine behind the Green River Community College. She had been missing for approximately three years before her discovery. More bodies of missing young women were discovered in the year that followed, some of which included that of missing runaway Debbie Gonzalez, 14, and Deborah Estes, 15, who disappeared six years earlier. Their deaths were attributed to the Green River Killer. Although there were still bodies being discovered, there were no recent killings attributed to the Green River Killer in the Seattle region. In 1988, the discovery of more than 20 bodies of prostitutes in San Diego led to the belief that the Green River Killer moved and continued his murderous rampage in California. Detective Reichert and the new task force commander, Bob Evans, temporarily joined forces with the San Diego Police Department in an effort to find the killer. In December 1988, investigators had a new suspect. A man named William J. Stevens caught the attention of the police after several callers phoned him in as a potential suspect during the airing of the popular true crime detective show, Crime Stoppers. Stevens was a prison escapee who was on the run for eight years after a two-year stint behind bars for burglary. At the time he was rediscovered by police, he was enrolled at the University of Washington as a pharmacology student. As task force investigators delved into Stevens' past, they learned that he was already a suspect in the Green River killings. It was also learned that Stevens had a blatant contempt for prostitutes and was known to have, on several occasions, talked about murdering them. When police searched his home, they found masses of firearms, several driver's licenses, credit cards and assumed names, and sexually explicit nude photos of prostitutes. Stevens was highly involved in robbery and credit card fraud, which he used to survive. Task force investigators exhaustively interviewed Stevens about the Green River murders and searched the premises of his home throughout the summer and fall of 1989. 
investigators even searched Stevens' father's home for clues tying him to any of the murders. However, nothing was found linking him to the murders. Moreover, credit card records and photographs produced by Stevens' brother provided a tight alibi against his involvement with the crimes. According to the numerous records and receipts, Stevens was traveling across the country during the summer months of 1982 when many of the murders occurred. Eventually, Stevens was cleared of all involvement in the Green River murders. In October 1989, two more skeletal remains of young women were found. One of the victims, identified as Andrea Childers, was found in a vacant lot near Star Lake and 55th Avenue South. Like many of the young women found before her, the cause of death remained unclear due to the state of decomposition. In early 1990, the skull of Denise Bush was found in a wooded area in Southgate Park in Tukwila, Washington. The remainder of Bush's body was located in Oregon five years earlier. Once again, it seemed as if the killer was purposefully moving the bones around in an effort to confuse investigators. Task force investigators were beginning to believe that the killer had defeated them. Morale among the officers was at an all-time low. According to the Seattle Times, in July 1991, the task force was reduced to just one investigator named Tom Jensen. After nine years, roughly 49 victims, and $15 million, the task force still had not caught the Green River Killer. The investigation became known as the country's largest unsolved murder case. The case remained dormant for 10 years. In April 2001, almost 20 years after the first known Green River murder, Detective Reichart, who had become the sheriff of King County, began renewed investigations into the murders. It was a case he refused to let go of, and he remained determined to find the killer. This time, the task force had technology on their side. Reichert formed a new task force team, initially consisting of six members, including DNA and forensic experts, and a couple of detectives. It wasn't long before the force grew to more than 30 people. All the evidence from the murder examination was re-examined, and some of the forensic samples were sent to the labs. The first samples to be sent to the lab were found with three victims that were murdered between 1982 and 1983, Opal Mills, Marcia Chapman, and Carol Christensen. The samples consisted of semen supposedly taken from the killer. The semen samples underwent a newly developed DNA testing method and were compared with samples taken from Ridgeway in April 1987. On September 10, 2001, Reichart received news from the labs that reduced the hardened detective to tears. There was a match found between the semen samples taken from the victims and Ridgeway. On November 30th, Ridgeway was intercepted by investigators on his way home from work and arrested on four counts of aggravated murder. The charges included that of the three girls and also Cynthia Hines, in which circumstantial evidence was also found connecting him with her death. The man that investigators had sought for 20 years was finally in police custody. This time, they wouldn't let him go. Ridgeway, originally born in Salt Lake City, Utah, on February 18, 1949, worked for a computer company at the time of his arrest. During the time of the murders, he was employed as a truck painter for 30 years at the Kentworth Truck Factory in Renton, Washington. Ridgeway owned many trucks during that time, one of which was of special interest to investigators. According to Seattle's King 5 television station, a 1977 black Ford F-150 owned by the suspect allegedly was connected with some of the victims. According to Time Magazine's Terry McCarthy, Ridgeway had an unusual sexual appetite. His three ex-wives and several old girlfriends told the reporter that he was sexually insatiable, demanding sex several times a day. Oftentimes, he would want to have sex in a public area or in the woods, even in the areas where some of the bodies had been discovered. Ridgeway was also known to have been obsessed with prostitutes, a fixation that bordered on a love-hate relationship. Neighbors knew him to constantly complain about prostitutes conducting business in his neighborhood, but at the same time, he frequently took advantage of their favors. It was possible that he was torn by his uncontrollable lusts and his staunch religious beliefs. McCarthy states that according to one of his wives, he became a religious fanatic, oftentimes crying following sermons and reading the Bible. Evidence continued to be gathered from Ridgeway in connection with the Green River murder case. Although he pleaded not guilty on all counts in the preliminary hearings, it was suspected that evidence would prove otherwise. Ridgeway's attorney, Tom Savage, expected a trial sometime in 2004. Prosecutors intended to seek the death penalty. 
Ridgeway remained interned in jail, awaiting his fate. Millions around the world waited for one question to be answered. Is Ridgeway the only Green River killer? On November 5, 2003, Gary Ridgeway, 54, avoided the death penalty in King County, Washington, by confessing to the murders of 48 women, most of whom were murdered in the 1982-84 timeframe. The deal Ridgeway made was to cooperate with authorities on closing these cases in exchange for 48 life sentences without the possibility of parole. His formal sentencing occurred in January of 2004. However, because some of the victims were buried and possibly killed in Oregon and other areas outside King County, Ridgeway could face the death penalty in other jurisdictions. Families of the victims are angry. They had been led to believe that the prosecutors would seek the death penalty, but instead, capital punishment was plea bargained away. Also, legal scholars are wondering about whether this case signals the end of the death penalty in Washington state. If a man who premeditatedly murdered 48 women doesn't get the death penalty, then who is eligible for it? A typical psychopath, Ridgeway forgot his victims, had a hard time keeping them straight, never learned their names, and wrote them off as a vicarious thrill, never personalizing them at all. They were throwaways to Ridgeway, disposable women. I killed some of them outside. I remember leaving each woman's body in the place where she was found, he said. I killed most of them in my house near Military Road, and I killed a lot of them in my truck not far from where I picked them up. He claims that they were all killed in King County, hoping that prosecutors outside King County will buy it and not prosecute him. Ridgeway's contempt for women in general, and prostitutes in particular, was clear in his plea bargain statement. I pick prostitutes as my victims because I hate most prostitutes, and I did not want to pay them for sex. I also picked prostitutes as victims because they were easy to pick up without being noticed. I knew they would not be reported missing right away and might never be reported missing. I picked prostitutes because I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. Ridgway exhibited typical serial killer behavior when he expressed his interest in reliving the murder experience, which gave him the sense of empowerment that he lacked in his everyday life. He buried his victims in clusters so that he could drive by and remember the cluster and the pleasure he experienced in the murders of those victims. King County officials wanted to create the impression that this plea bargain brings closure to the case. But it did not. There was something a bit fishy here. We are led to believe that Ridgway went into a killing frenzy in the 1982-84 period and then stopped completely until he murdered once more in 1990 and then once again in 1998. Unfortunately, that is not usually what happens in the world of a serial killer. They can slow down, especially when there is a great deal of police activity, but not really stop. Are we to believe that he really went so long without killing after 1984 when he killed some 46 women in just a few years? Our expectation is that there were many more victims buried within and outside of King County. It took many years to find the bodies that were part of this plea bargain. It may take many more years to find the rest of them. It's not really over yet. Even in modern Western societies, gay men and people of color still feel the stinging pain of discrimination. Unfortunately, in less progressive societies in Asia and in the Middle East, openly gay men face severe discrimination, ostracization, and even threats of violence against their life for their sexual orientation. For this reason, many men like this purposely repress their true feelings when residing in these countries. Often they feel that the only way to truly be themselves is to escape to a Western country like the United States, Canada, or Western Europe. For many of the South Asian and Middle Eastern men in Toronto's gay community, this was the path they chose in order to live the life they truly wanted to lead. But unknown to them, there was a monster that was living in their midst hell-bent on exploiting the balancing act many of the men did to keep up their straight personas while secretly pursuing other men. Between 2010 and 2017, eight men who identified as homosexual, including six men who hailed from South Asian and Middle Eastern countries, disappeared without a trace. Their disappearances were incredibly troubling and shocking to their families. Prior to their sudden disappearances, None of the men had expressed any interest in leaving or going away to somewhere new. In fact, most of the men had been living prosperous and productive lives while leading secret homosexual lifestyles. 
As their families and police investigated, the string of missing gay men in Toronto started climbing. For years, police and the men's families had no idea what could have happened to their loved ones. That is, except for a man named Bruce MacArthur. How MacArthur could get away with his crimes for so long is a testament both to the shoddy police work of the Toronto Police Department and the carefully crafted nature of each one of his homicides. Unfortunately for him, despite all the planning he put into his murders, police would eventually catch on to the clues they should have years ago, and finally, police attention would be on the right man. That's because, unknown to MacArthur, his murder spree was unwittingly aided both by a hunt for a supposed cannibal maniac and his own expunged criminal record. At the time of his arrest in 2018, Bruce MacArthur set the record for the oldest active serial killer in Canada at age 66. He was also known to be the longest active known serial killer in Canada, with his confirmed murders spanning from 2010 to 2017. But who was this likable, laughable man who was a regular in Toronto's gay scene? Bruce MacArthur was born in 1951 to strictly religious parents. He spent his childhood living on a farm in rural Argyle. His upbringing was pretty normal and mundane. That is, except for one thing. Even from an early age, MacArthur knew he was gay. However, because of how strict his parents were, he could never come out to them. In fact, he could not come out to anybody. For someone in rural Ontario to come out as homosexual during that time would have caused his family to be ostracized. Instead, MacArthur made a conscious decision to keep his love of men to himself for most of his early adult life. MacArthur even went as far as to marry and have children with a woman he met while in college, not necessarily because he was bisexual, but because he wanted to keep up appearances of what was considered normal behavior. After graduating college and getting married, MacArthur worked in various department stores in downtown Toronto. He eventually got a job as a traveling salesman selling socks to different department stores around Canada. All the while, for the next 20 years, MacArthur led an equally boring and mundane life. He was noted to be a staunchly devout member of his church and spent time with his children as any doting father would. However, starting in the early 90s, MacArthur finally gave in to his repressed sexual orientation. During this time, his wife suspected he started seeing other men. After about a year of clandestine encounters, MacArthur finally opened up to his wife about his sexual orientation. From this point onward, MacArthur's once mundane and normal life started to spiral out of control. With his marriage to his wife simply for show, he was dealt another blow when he was let go from his job in 1993. During this time, MacArthur also faced extreme financial hardship when he was trying to spend exorbitant amounts of money on defense attorneys for his son. His teenage son was making harassing and threatening phone calls to various women and was in legal trouble for doing so. This financial stress, combined with the loss of his job, pushed the couple to their breaking point. In 1997, the pair mortgaged their home and legally separated. They divorced and filed bankruptcy in 1999. After this point in his life, it appears that MacArthur wanted to leave everything behind and embrace the identity he had always repressed. Because the sleepy suburb of Oshawa did not have an active gay community, MacArthur chose to move to Toronto where he could live openly as a gay man. In Toronto, back then as it is today, the LGBTQ plus part of the city is known as Church and Wellesley. This enclave has been around since 1969 when the Canadian government finally decriminalized same-sex relationships in Canada. It was here that MacArthur, now free from his old heterosexual life, could be the man he always wanted to be. As living in Toronto is expensive, MacArthur first had to find a job. Though we miss the clothing industry, age discrimination is a real thing in the fashion world, so he was forced to pick a different career. He decided to become his own boss and start a landscaping company. While his initial company may have been nothing more than just a van with some old tools, he eventually built up quite a following of loyal customers among Toronto's elderly residents. It was through this company that he would not only find some of his victims, but also dispose of them. But that would come later. For now, MacArthur was busy living his best life and was a frequent customer at all the various gay establishments in Toronto. He was known to be friendly and likable, but also had a temper. He was known to have various boyfriends of Middle Eastern or South Asian descent. 
everything seemed normal until Halloween night of 2001. On that evening, he met a local gay actor at one of his usual haunts. Under the auspices of showing MacArthur some of his different Halloween costumes, the man let MacArthur into his apartment. However, MacArthur had a different plan in mind. As soon as he was inside, MacArthur pulled out a metal pipe he had concealed in his pants. He hit the man several times in his head and his hands as he put them up to defend himself. During the assault, the man lost consciousness, and he awoke to find himself bloodied and alone by his front doorway. Unknown to him, soon after the assault, MacArthur went to turn himself in to a nearby police station. Fortunately for his victim, despite needing some stitches on his head and fingers, he was physically all right. However, mentally, the man was left traumatized that he was attacked by someone he knew, who he thought was otherwise harmless. Both sides agreed on a lenient sentence when the government brought MacArthur into court. Because he'd turned himself in and had agreed to plead guilty to the charges, the government opted to give him a two-year suspended sentence, followed by three years of probation. As part of the pre-sentencing report, the court had him examined by several psychologists and medical doctors. MacArthur was not found to have been suffering from any sort of mental illness or other medical issues that could have provoked the attack. Establishing this fact was important to the prosecution, since MacArthur repeatedly claimed he did not know why he attacked the victim, only that he blacked out and did not remember much about it. The court deduced that the attack was likely the result of an unintended consequence of taking what are called poppers. Poppers is a chemical drug known as alkyl nitrites. Initially prescribed as an early heart medication, homosexual men began using the drug recreationally in the 1960s. Once inhaled, the drug increases heart rate, feelings of euphoria, and blood flow to help enhance sex. MacArthur admitted to using poppers that night, and the court suspected this had an unintended reaction with some of the legally prescribed medication he was taking at the time. As a result of these findings, the judge upheld the plea agreement, but added several conditions. Among these conditions was that MacArthur was to be banned from the church in Wellesley area for a period of three years. While the terms of the probation were largely unenforceable, it negatively affected MacArthur's reputation in the gay community. Because of his conviction and legal banishment, he was seen as an outsider, and many white Canadian gay men would have nothing to do with him. Because so many of the Canadian LGBTQ plus community did not want anything to do with them is probably a large part of why he chose the victims that he did. Of his eight total victims, six were immigrants and people of color. One was a homeless sex worker. One was a white Canadian. MacArthur's life seemed to return to normal for the next several years. He finished his probation with no problems, even though he regularly violated it. Though legally banned from the church in Wellesley area, he still frequented the bars and clubs there. The few times when people recognized him and called him out for being there, he'd get furious, including an incident in a coffee shop where he broke a bunch of coffee mugs on a counter. Why no one ever reported him to the police is probably a mixture of indifference and fear. Even though he frequented many bars in the area, MacArthur appeared to have difficulty in picking up local Canadians. Instead, he chose to associate himself with the vibrant immigrant community. Why he did so was more than likely one of both necessity and choice. Because his reputation had been tainted from the assault several years prior, many gay Canadians would have nothing to do with him. However, the large immigrant community knew nothing of his past. These men, often trying to hide their own sexual orientation from their families, would ask few questions about a cheery and happy-go-lucky man approaching them. Oftentimes, MacArthur would even go as far as to employ many of the men he slept with. These men included his first known victim, Skandaraj Navaratnam. Skandaraj was a refugee from Sri Lanka. Wanting to escape the violence that engulfed his country during its nearly 30-year civil war, he immigrated to Canada to seek a better life for himself. A dedicated family man, Skandaraj sent back most of the money he earned to care for his relatives still in Sri Lanka. Unlike most of MacArthur's victims, Skandaraj had actually opened up to his brother about his sexuality and he promised him that he was still loved. Once he arrived in Canada, he quickly embraced the culture. He had a large circle of friends and was known to be quite charismatic, intelligent, and kind. Among the few possessions he gathered in his time in Canada, nothing was more precious to him than the dog he adopted, and it was truly his best friend. For Skandaraj, everything seemed to be going great. 
He was living as an openly gay man in a country that accepted him for who he was, all the while being able to care for his family back in Sri Lanka. All was well, until he crossed paths with Bruce MacArthur. It's unknown exactly how and where MacArthur met most of his victims in person. What would later become known to police after friends turned over Skandaraj's laptop was how he initially made contact with his victims. Skandaraj used a variety of online dating services to meet other men in the area. Unknown to him at the time, the man going by the screen handle SilverFox51 was actually the devil in the flesh. But to Skandaraj, he was just another potential boyfriend. While many of the details surrounding Skandaraj's disappearance and those of the other men still remain unknown, what is known is that he was last seen leaving a local bar called Zippers on the evening of September 6, 2010. After that evening came and went, his roommate didn't hear anything from him and became worried. After not seeing him come home for several days, he reported him missing to the police. When the police first arrived, they asked his roommate where he might have gone. His roommate gave police the names and addresses of several other people he routinely stayed with. Police spoke to all these people at their homes, and no one could provide any information on the whereabouts of Skandaraj. The only new information they had was that he frequently stayed at a cabin on the outskirts of Toronto. Police checked out this lead too, but it was a dead end, and the case soon went cold. While not seeming significant now, this information would become crucial to the investigation leading it down a rabbit hole for almost two years. While police were trying to ascertain the whereabouts of Skandaraj, MacArthur struck again. His next victim was Abdul Bazir Faizi. Abdul was the quintessential story of rags to riches for immigrants. A native of Afghanistan, he fled the country's endemic violence to start a new life in Canada with his wife and two children. Abdul loved his family dearly. In fact, he spent every waking moment of his time working in a printing company when not spending time with his family. Abdul routinely worked late to save up money to start his own business. He was eventually able to do so through his hard work and determination. He also managed to save up enough money to afford his own home and two other homes as investment properties. Abdul was finally living the life that he and his family deserved. But there was just one problem. Abdul was gay, but could not tell his friends or family. He lived his secret double life without his family suspecting a thing. Often, like Skandaraj, he'd message men on dating websites and then go to meet them out in town. Because he worked such long hours, it was not uncommon for him to come home late, and he could have easily explained it away as just working some extra shifts that he normally did. On the evening of December 29, 2010, Abdul called his wife to tell her he'd be coming home late in order to work an extra shift to help cover the cost of their children's Christmas presents. However, after leaving work, he made a detour to the Steamworks Bath Club and was never seen again. Abdul called his wife just before 8 o'clock that evening. She called him at midnight and he did not answer his phone. The next morning, his cousin reported him missing. Soon after getting her missing persons report, police started searching for Abdul. After putting up missing persons flyers around the city, police stumbled on his car near Toronto's gay neighborhood. When questioned, Abdul's wife said that they did not know anyone in that area, nor knew why he'd be there. Police took Abdul's car back for forensic processing. Unfortunately, there was no physical evidence recovered. However, shortly after his disappearance, his niece came forward with some interesting evidence. She said that she was able to get into his email accounts and computer and she turned all this evidence over to the police. His online presence showed that, like Skandaraj, he was communicating with other homosexual men for meetups throughout the Toronto area. But beyond this evidence, the trail soon went cold too. Police met with community leaders in Toronto's LGBTQ plus scene to discuss possible leads, but these talks in his phone records led police nowhere closer to solving Abdul's disappearance. Unfortunately for the men of Toronto gays community, these first few disappearances would not be the last. It's unknown why MacArthur took an almost two-year hiatus from his second to his third killing. What is known is that for his third victim, Majid Kayan, he met his end at the hands of MacArthur on or about October 14, 2012. Majid, like Abdul, was also from a strictly religious family in Afghanistan. He fled the country's endemic violence to bring his wife and two children into a better life in Canada. However, though he and his family were safe, 
Majid still faced some major hurdles. The biggest of those hurdles was his coming out to his wife and family as homosexual. Because his strictly religious family looked down on this life choice of his, his marriage fell apart and he divorced his wife. From that point on, he maintained contact with his children only. After his divorce, he moved to the Church Street neighborhood to fully embrace his lifestyle for the first time in the open. According to all accounts, not only was Majid a friend to all, but was an amazing and involved father. He spent quite a lot of time with his adult children and talked to them on the phone almost every day. That's why, after his son last saw him at a wedding on October 14th, he reported him missing on October 18th since he did not get his daily phone calls. Police took the report but did not take it seriously. The case officer assigned did not investigate it for almost two weeks, considering the fact that he'd been assigned to the case while on vacation. After returning from his holiday, the investigator spoke with Majid's neighbors. His neighbors expressed great concern for his well-being. Majid had coffee with him each morning before work and was frequently seen in the neighborhood. When officers gained access to the apartment, they found something that greatly alarmed them. Second only to his children, Majid's pride and joy were his pet birds. After officers entered the apartment, they found that his pets had starved to death. This greatly concerned officers since his neighbors noted that whenever he went away, Majid always ensured that someone was there to look after his birds. Despite this incredibly alarming development, the police did not treat Majid's case with great urgency. There were no leads to follow and no signs of foul play. With no leads to go on, Majid's case soon went cold. However, with police at their wit's end, they soon got a tip from halfway across the world that would change the course of the investigation into the MacArthur disappearances and give fuel to the media fire years later when MacArthur was apprehended. On November 9, 2012, just three weeks after Majid's disappearance, the Toronto Police Department got a tip from Interpol. According to Swiss police, a man had confessed to them that there was an international cannibal club whose members would meet in online forums like ZambianMeat.com to discuss their macabre fantasies. While most of the time, these discussions seemed like pure make-believe, one user noted that a particular member named John Jacobs made some very shocking claims. According to the Swiss informant, the mysterious John Jacobs lived on a farm outside of Toronto. He said that he would eat gay men and that he had murdered at least one man. The informant told Swiss police that the purported victim's name was Skanda. Why Toronto police would ever think such an outlandish claim had any hope of being legitimate is more realistic than one might think at first. During Skandaraj's investigation, one of the ties he had was to a local who owned a cabin outside of Toronto. While this friend had let him stay there from time to time, the friend's alibi was rock solid and police did not look into him further. Additionally, Skandaraj went by the nickname Skanda. These two facts, combined now with the third missing homosexual man in several years, made some at the Toronto Police Department want to elevate Skandaraj's case to a suspected homicide and rope in any other cases they could find. Toronto Police leadership bought off on the plan and created a project to address officers' concerns. A project is what U.S. police organizations might call a task force. This special team of officers, analysts, and investigators come together to focus on a particular crime. The project's name was colloquially named Project Houston, after the Apollo 13 reference to Houston, we have a problem, since officers suspected that the cannibal murderer theory might actually be responsible for numerous homicides in the Toronto area. The first step was to identify the mysterious John Jacobs and put a real name on this anonymous user. Using online records turned over from the Swiss police, Toronto investigators secured a court order for the IP address, email accounts, and other personally identifiable information associated with the Zambian meat profile. The search soon discovered that the account did, in fact, belong to a Toronto local named James Brunton. Brunton lived in a rural part of Ontario and had never previously had any contact with the police. However, because of the seriousness of the charges and the initial hunch that officers had, a Toronto judge authorized the police a wide range of measures to investigate Brunton. Part of these measures was the seizure of all of his emails and online search records. The search of his emails found that Brunton had been communicating with people all over the world, including the US, Germany, and Australia. Initial findings showed that though some of this conversation was about cannibalism, 
Most of it was in regard to pornography. Photos seized from his email accounts showed at least two victims in the U.S. who Brenton had coerced into sending nude photos of themselves. But while this evidence proved that Brenton was a pedophile, it did not prove that he was a cannibal murderer. As officers investigated his online presence further, they found that several years ago, he had actually met a willing cannibal victim online. But before they could consummate the arrangement, Brunton had backed out of it. He then created a fake profile masquerading as his wife, explaining his absence. Officers did not stop with investigating his online persona. They also used old-fashioned police work to track his movements. Officers trailed Brunton wherever he went, and they placed trackers on his cars. Undercover officers even befriended him in person and attended hockey games with him where they believed he had produced some of the pornography in the locker rooms. Despite all this intense police work, the investigation yielded nothing. Beyond the pornography charges, there was absolutely no evidence linking Brunton to any of the missing men. Some officers expressed these concerns, but the main focus was still on Brunton. In desperation, Toronto officers wanted to see if they could catch Brunton in the act. By May 2013, most of the team thought that Brunton was full of crap. He was just a cannibal wannabe, but they thought that if he acted on his impulses, it could be grounds to investigate him further. To this end, an undercover agent spent two months communicating with Brunton online, pretending to be a willing cannibal victim. The officer told Brunton he was to meet him at the Pearson Airport, where he could have his way with him, kill him, and then eat him. Brunton agreed. On the day that the murder was to take place, Brunton left his home and drove to the airport. However, he stopped short and instead pulled into a shopping center to buy some merchandise. He texted the undercover officer stating that he'd suffered a heart attack and was in the hospital. Anticipating this, police executed an arrest and search warrant on Brunton. After analyzing all the contents of his car, home, and person, no further evidence was linked to any of the missing men. Despite the star suspect not being involved, Project Houston continued its work. Spurred on by the recent Magnata murder case, where Magnata had filmed the murder and mailed the victim's body parts, the police were filled with renewed vigor that the cannibal murderer theory was legitimate. Because of their belief in this theory still, the police were simply trying to identify all the people tied to Abdul's and Skandaraj's computer. Bruce MacArthur eventually came into police radar after linking his Silver Fox dating account to Abdul. When police interviewed MacArthur, he claimed that he did not know Abdul. However, that was a lie since they had email and dating platform communications between the two. When asked about Skandaraj, MacArthur said they did have a platonic relationship. When asked about Majid, he said they had a sexual relationship but would not elaborate. Why police did not capitalize on the fact that they now for the first time in their investigation had a person tied to all three men through evidence and his own admissions is mind-boggling. In the official report on the MacArthur investigation, the only explanation given is that because a junior officer had conducted the interview, he had not seen MacArthur's 2003 conviction nor realized the crucial link. After MacArthur's interview in November 2013, the investigation carried on until May 2014, when it was officially closed with no new findings. From Majid's murder to his next homicide was almost three years. Why MacArthur waited so long was probably because he'd gotten spooked during the Project Houston investigation. His next victim's name was Sorush Mahmoudi. Sorush immigrated from Iran during the 1980s. He met and married a Muslim woman in Canada. He took in her son as his own and was a great dad. His wife expressed how much of a doting husband he was with her. Sorush loved to cook and cooked dinner for his family each night. He also loved watching movies, playing soccer, and shooting pool. When Sarush went missing around August 15, 2015, his stepson called him in missing a week later. Because his son owned the account his father's phone was registered under, he turned over all the call logs to police. A search of the call logs did not turn up anything. MacArthur's number was not on his phone. Adding to the mystery was the fact that Sarush's to-go bag was gone. Whenever he planned to be away for a few days, he carried a black backpack with his belongings. Combined with the fact that he never picked up his last paycheck, nor met with his creditors at a court-ordered meeting to discuss his debts, showed that Sarush had simply vanished with no explanation. After Sarush's disappearance, 
MacArthur went on to murder two more men sometime in 2016 and 2017. His next victim was a man named Karushna Kanagaratnam. Karushna fled his native Sri Lanka to escape his village, devastated by the country's civil war. Along with several hundred other refugees, they made it onto the shores of British Columbia where they sought asylum. However, his application was denied and he was ordered to be deported. Karushna decided to go into hiding instead. Committed to bettering his family's well-being, Karushna took every odd job he could. From being a general handyman to moving furniture, he spent all of his time trying to make money to send home to his family. He still kept in constant contact with them several times a week. When those calls stopped in January 2016, his family assumed that he'd gone into hiding due to his immigration status. He had, in fact, been killed at the hands of Bruce MacArthur. MacArthur's next victim was an equally vulnerable person. Dean Lizowick was a local born in 1973. He was a foster child, and those adoptive parents gave him a great childhood. When he moved into Toronto's gay village, he soon became addicted to drugs. Identifying as bisexual, he fathered a daughter to whom he lost his parental rights owing to his drug addiction. For most of his life, he worked at various bars and as a sex worker in the village. At the time of his murder, sometime between April 2016 and July 2017, he was experiencing homelessness. Like Karushna, he was never reported missing. Despite not knowing when Dean's murder occurred, police do know when MacArthur's next run-in with the police happened. On June 20, 2016, a man reported to police that Bruce MacArthur had just tried to kill him. In the man's version of events, he and Bruce were casual sexual partners. MacArthur had come to his apartment unannounced on the day of the attack and proposed they go to dinner followed by a sexual encounter. The man agreed to this. However, it would not be like their normal rendezvous. This time, MacArthur insisted they have sex in his van. When the man got in, MacArthur did not say a word but instead started strangling the man. When the man asked what MacArthur was doing, the victim stated he remained silent and just kept strangling him. Thankfully, the man had the strength to roll over and break free. He then grabbed MacArthur by the neck to keep him at bay while he escaped from his van. Sensing the man would call the police, MacArthur turned himself into the closest precinct. He agreed to an interview. In his statement, MacArthur claimed that he thought his partner consented to the choking. He claimed that the man had asked him to pinch his penis very hard. MacArthur, in his own words, assumed the man liked it rough and proceeded to strangle him. Police actually bought his story, despite the emphatic testimony from the victim and another crucial detail, the contents of his van. The back of his van was covered in plastic and a fur coat was in the back. Both of these items would feature predominantly in his killings. But at the time, the police did not know that. Instead, they decided to believe MacArthur's version of events and recommended no criminal charges. This blunder would cost another two men their lives. Around April 16, 2017, is when police believe MacArthur murdered his seventh victim, Selim Isen. Selim was a Turkish national who had moved away from his country to marry his partner, whom he met while working in Istanbul. Unfortunately, the marriage did not last. Not letting that get him down, Selim was still wanting to pursue an education in social work. He was in school for that and was well on his way to graduating. Like the others, Salim seemed to disappear off the face of the earth. His immigration lawyer had not heard from him in months. His family in both Turkey and the UK did not hear from him either. His bank records showed no activity. Salim also missed numerous doctor appointments and meetings with his own social worker. For all intents and purposes, he was just gone with no leads to follow. All that would change with MacArthur's final victim, Andrew Kinsman. Andrew was a well-known figure in the gay village. Known for his work at the Toronto People with AIDS Foundation, he was like a sort of mini-celebrity. He was also a very neat and organized person. Because of this, when he failed to show up for work without communication or ask someone to look after his cats, his neighbor filed a missing persons report on June 28, 2017. A month after Andrew's disappearance, MacArthur attacked his second victim who escaped. Sean Cribben was a retired preschool teacher and advocate for the Toronto gay community. On July 26, 2017, 
Cribben had met with MacArthur for a sexual encounter. Once at his apartment, MacArthur laced his drink with a date rape drug. During their sexual encounter, MacArthur started choking Sean until he passed out. What saved his life was MacArthur's roommate coming home earlier than expected. Sean left the apartment and never reported the attack until the police came to him in 2018. They had found photos MacArthur had taken of him along with chat logs between the two and connected him to the case. While this assault was not known to police at the time, they knew something was wrong. To investigate the disappearances of Salim and Andrew, police convened a second project called Project Prism. This team aimed to link the disappearances and potentially the disappearances from the Project Houston men Unlike the other men, police finally had a piece of easily identifiable evidence. Surveillance cameras outside Andrew's apartment showed him getting into an older red Dodge caravan. When officers searched his apartment, they saw he had marked on the day he was missing that he was meeting a man called Bruce at 3 p.m. The camera footage was at 3.07 p.m. Convinced that they had their suspect on camera, police spent several weeks canvassing vehicle registration records. They came up with Bruce MacArthur's name and decided to follow up on him because of the 2016 choking incident. Police soon had a mountain of evidence. Police finally made the connection between Skandaraj's computer and MacArthur's online accounts. They also obtained damning cell phone and email records like they did with Brunton back in Project Houston. But the piece of evidence that sealed MacArthur's fate was his 2004 Dodge Caravan. After Kinsman's disappearance, MacArthur sold the van and bought a new 2017 one. Police were able to track the van down to a wrecking yard where it had not been destroyed yet. After forensically analyzing the van, they discovered Andrew's blood inside it. MacArthur was now officially a murder suspect. Police continued to keep MacArthur under surveillance for several months. During this time, they noted that he would routinely take photos of men from the back of his van, then go home and find them online. While undoubtedly creepy, it was not enough to justify arresting him just yet. That would change when police recovered photos of Salim's body from MacArthur's computer in early January 2018. With this evidence in hand, arrest warrants were prepared for the murders of Salim and Andrew. Officers planned to arrest MacArthur when he was at work and away from other people. With the warrants issued on January 17th, they planned to arrest him on January 20th. However, police agreed that if they saw him take any other men to his apartment, they would take him into custody. On January 18th, they did just that. On that day, officers saw MacArthur take a man into his apartment. Deciding they needed to act quickly, they immediately sought permission to arrest MacArthur at home. It was granted. In the 15 minutes it took police to get into the apartment, MacArthur had already tied and blindfolded his unwitting victim to his bed. He had literally been caught red-handed. After his arrest for murder, police executed search warrants at multiple properties MacArthur did landscaping work for. One property at 53 Mallory Crescent proved to be his dumping ground. Cadaver dogs hid on the 12 garden planters at the upscale property. Inside the planters, police found the remains of seven of his eight victims. Another was found nearby, buried in a ditch. It would take several months and assistance from the public to finally identify all the men. While MacArthur would go on to make a 16-minute statement after his arrest, so far, Canadian courts have not allowed it to be released to the public. MacArthur did initially plead not guilty, but eventually changed his plea to guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole for at least 25 years. By that hot July night in 1958, Harvey Glattman had raped and killed two females. He'd come to enjoy it. But now, since it had been seven months since his last crime, and the police so far had not shown up at his door, he resolved he was overdue for a little more fun. He was ready. Boiling. Tonight, he was going to take the life of another woman. Having parked his clunker, the Dodge, halfway down her street, Pico Street, Harvey strolled the rest of the way to her door, recalling his old, familiar line, the Joe photographer bit he'd used on the others, the freelance photographer ruse that had worked so well. Knocking the elements of his masquerade together in his head, he practiced under his breath just what he was going to say when this Angela Rojas opened the door to let him in. 
Of course, half the battle was won already. He had done it by phone. He called up the agency she worked for, said he wanted a model to pose for some fashion layouts, and made arrangements to do the layout at her house. Of course, the agency and he both knew exactly what that meant to take nudie pictures. But as long as he had the cash to pay, and as long as there were whores like this Rojas willing to strip for some horny shutterbug until their real break came along here in Hollywood, no one asked questions. Credentials weren't needed. All that mattered was that everybody won. The chicks got paid, the agency got its percentage, and the guy who forked over the dough walked away with pornographic freeze frames. As before, he used a phony name, this time Frank Wilson. Hell, he had to. After all, the models he chose would never come back alive, and he couldn't invite the LAPD to his door, now could he? Inside the apartment, 24-year-old Ruth Mercado, who used the pseudonym Angela Rojas whenever she took a modeling assignment, peered out the window and saw Frank Wilson rounding her walkway. Yuck, she thought, what a loser, and knew exactly what kind of layout this dude would conjure up. Take off your clothes and look sexy. Smile now. Show me what you got. Mercado had come from New York months previously to hit the big time here in West Hollywood, hoping she would get discovered, but her dream of being the next Marilyn Monroe or Sandra D never materialized. With no aspirations for waiting tables or cashiering, Los Angeles of 1958 didn't offer much more for a girl who found such occupations too menial. Reduced to a photographer's model, she at least was able to avoid the humdrum and still be able to pay the rent and eat thanks to the photographers who, like Wilson, couldn't get a real woman of their own. As long as they never touched her, she was no prostitute. On that, she was firm. But, as the agency told her when she first started accepting these assignments, just pose and take the sucker's cash. A knock at the door. She opened it, forced a smile at Frank Wilson, and asked him to step inside. Cripes, up close he was uglier than she thought. Large ears that stuck out like Dumbo's, ungroomed hair, and a pair of squinty eyes behind thick horn-rimmed glasses. No camera? she asked. Er, uh, it's in the car, he stammered. It does no good out there, she cracked, and purring in her most seductive voice the way these nerds loved it, she added, Want to get it while I slip into something more comfortable? She was clipped. Her words gurgled off when he produced a pistol, shoving its barrel under her chin. Obviously, he was no photographer. Glancing down, she could see the stenciling on the weapon's chamber, Browning 32 automatic. Where's your bedroom? He barked. We're going there. Please, no, she whimpered. But he severed her voice again with another jab at the gun. Answer me, bitch. Mutely, she motioned towards the direction of an unlit, slight hallway leading from her living room. He turned her, a puppet, and pushed her in that direction. Go, he ordered, and followed her, the gun barrel resting against her spine. As they entered the room together, he shoved her onto the bed. Strip, came one more command. She obeyed. As she slipped out of her clothing, one article at a time, she watched his homely face begin to perspire in anticipation. His elephant ears flushed red. His puffy lips trembled in awe. She'd always feared such a thing happening, allowing jugheads into her place the way she had, but so far she'd been lucky. They'd snapped their cheesecakes and pranced away delighted. Not this time. Don't hurt me, mister, please, I... She began again, but of course, he overrode her. The bra. She thought he was going to hyperventilate when she unstrapped it. No doubt this hayseed had not been with many women. Maybe, she thought, he'd let her live if she played the role he wanted her to play. After all, he seemed to be not much more than a grown-up child peering at that new girly magazine, Playboy. With a smile, pretending to enjoy what she was doing, she dropped the last of her undergarments to the floor. Naked now, she let his clammy hands caress her privates and tried not to shudder, much the less puke, as his nauseating touch experienced her. She tightened, though, when she saw him reach beneath his jacket and withdraw a length of thin rope, and when he told her to turn around and she felt him binding her wrists together, 
The shudder she had tried to resist surfaced. Don't be frightened, his voice crackled behind her. I just want to make love to you. She resisted the temptation to tell him that, yes, it's the only way any woman would dare let him touch her, tied up. Instead, she locked her lips and inhaled deeply, silent except when he pushed her across the bed again and sprawled across her, unzipped. Despite protestations, he had his way with her. After a few moments of pleading in vain, she surrendered and for the next hour, she turned herself over to this grunting, heaving disaster. For a while, he laid beside her, having finished with her. She didn't dare look at him, was afraid to, but she heard his breathing that still came in sporadic bursts. Somehow, he sounded undone. I have an idea, he suddenly said, propping himself on his arm beside her. She jumped at the abrupt breaking of silence and looked at him for the first time since before her rape. He was chuckling like the naughty little boy she thought he was. Let's go on a picnic. I don't understand. She shook her head but dreaded to think what he really meant. It's after midnight. So, who says two people who just made love can't go on a nice romantic picnic at night? He giggled and pulled her by her bound wrists to her feet. It hurt, but he disregarded her groans. I'll untie you if you promise not to cry out or run. I promise, she played it cool. Good, he said as he unwound the rope. Then get dressed. He handed her her panties, but only after reveling in their silken touch a while. Mercado dressed in a flash, not exactly sure what was in store for her. She didn't ask, only hoped that whatever it was, that she'd be able to walk away from this alive. In the meantime, her brain rushed to keep her panic down. From time to time, she even batted a wink in his direction. Watching her cover that body he had just enjoyed, Glatman, gun in hand, flopped back in the chair, thinking. Those fake smiles, he thought, trying to butter me up. He knew better, and he knew her ploy wouldn't work. Yet he felt sorry for her. He didn't want to kill her, but, well, forget that for now. First, there were the pictures to take. His camera was in his car, and he was going to do to her what he had done to all the others. Take her to his favorite spot beyond the city and shoot some, what he liked to call souvenirs, in memory of the night. He'd gone too far with this Mercado just to leave without the real reward. They, the pictures, were better than the sex. They would last long after she was buzzard bait. As she was clothed now, he again tied her wrists. Directing her toward the front door, he threw her coat over her shoulders to hide the sight of the binds holding her wrists. Simultaneously, he wrapped his own coat over the crook of his arm that held the pistol. She marched in front of him and followed his directions to his car, a battered black Dodge Cornet, several years old and as unglamorous as her kidnapper. Sliding inside the vehicle, she noticed an expensive roller-cord camera lying in the back seat, along with some accompanying gear. Are we taking photos? She asked him while he fumbled for the right key on an overloaded key ring. Looking at her, he grinned, nodded, churned the ignition, and then pressed the accelerator to produce a not-too-impressive wheelie. The jalopy left Pico Street with a squeal, turned south, then straight for where she expected, the Santa Ana Freeway. Do you have a studio? Mercado seemed to be recovering her voice. Again, he merely nodded. All the while, he kept his pistol on his lap. Through Orange County, the Dodge rolled until it picked up the intercoastal highway just beyond San Juan Capistrano. At Oceanside, Harvey wheeled his car east past Escanada, then into the desert. By then, the sun had tipped the horizon and had already brought unbearable heat to the sandy surface. But that didn't bother Harvey Gladman. He found a spot to park, a place he considered remote, where he could do what he wanted to this latest bitch without interference from the California Highway Patrol. Keeping her hands immobile, he raped her again in the desert under the rising sun. Undressing her, he then shot photos of her in numerous positions, demanding that she pose more graphically with each click of the shutter. Snap, click, whirr. Snap, click, whirr. If she whined, he'd reach for the pistol in his jeans pocket, a move that discouraged further griping. 
As the day waned, he realized the inevitable had come. He'd later tell the police he didn't want a killer, hadn't wanted to kill any of them, really, especially this Rojas, whom he liked the best as she tried to smile, but there was little else he could do. Raped, abducted, forced to pose pornographically, really now, he couldn't let her go. Ruth Mercado must have known her hopes were gone and her death had come when he told her to pose as if she were dead. Close your eyes, lie there, don't breathe, be a corpse. She closed her eyes. Snap, click, whir. Snap, click, whir. Snap, click. Then she felt him hovering. She opened her eyes and watched him strap her ankles together. Before she could ask, he tossed another loop of hemp around her neck and rolled her over on her stomach. As if roping a steer, he kneeled on her back dead weight while stringing all ends of the ropes together. She couldn't breathe. While she certainly struggled, he yanked on the rope to keep her in place. One final yank, and she fell still. Stripping her down to her panties, he took a couple more photos, shaping the mannequin into a dozen more poses. Satisfied that he had captured the essence of his trophy, Harvey rolled the body to where a growth of mesquite sprouted profusely and where she would soon be nourishment for the coyotes. Packing his camera, his tripod, his ropes and the blanket he'd used for them to lie on while making love, he felt pleased with himself. Well, true, he felt somewhat sorry for the bitch. But what did Dorste sing in that song? Que sera sera, whatever will be, will be. He turned toward the woman one more time and couldn't believe that that dead thing with blank expression and twisted mouth had turned him on. That didn't matter. He was heading home now to his dark room, where she was very much alive, frozen eternally alive on film. Of Harvey Gladman, serial killer expert and best-selling author Michael Newton writes, he was a pioneer of sorts. Nine years before author John Brophy coined the term serial murder, nearly two decades before FBI agent Robert Ressler dusted it off and made the tag a household word, Gladman was already plying his trade. Gladman never had a catchy nickname, but he has since then, but became the stuff of urban myth, a quintessential bogeyman. Rapist and killer, he was a complex nightmare of emotions on two feet, a helter-skelter of sexual frustration. The women he molested and destroyed, he feared and hated, because they represented what he could not understand about himself and the world in which he moved. Void of self-comprehension, and therefore self-expression, he saw everything as an abstract predominant with black shadow. There was no identity, and he had no identity except that everything translated in his brain as a Freudian piece of work. Everything was sexual. Overcome with sex and frightened as hell of his libido, he had no idea what he was doing in life or where he fit into its scheme. Females who tickled his male desires perplexed him because they threatened to remind him of his own confusion and his non-existence. They were his enemies. Unable to see the humanity in female form, women became mere fantasy toys he wished to understand and wished to conquer. Other men could, but not him. They might laugh at his ignorance. Therefore, violence was the only way to approach them. That way, they'd not laugh at him, and therefore, they'd have to give in to him. And he could walk away afterwards, at least having proven to himself that he could claim some trophies in life, if only through force. First, there was the rape, the initial release of manhood encouraged by his victim's inability to fight back. Thanks to the rope. There were powers in the rope. His ropes became merely an extension of his arms, holding the world in place while he grabbed his piece of it, as a man should. Then there was the camera, which brought even greater pleasure because it recorded his conquests and reminded him of how far he could go with a woman, a length of rope, and some wild tossed in for good measure. Says Newton, the photos that resulted from a shoot allowed Glattman to relive the incident, elaborate the fantasy while masturbating. The camera also was a shield, something for Glattman to hide behind. It gave him distance, shrank the models to a manageable size, and let him steal, if not their souls, 
at least their sexuality. Agreeing with Newton that Glattman's strange fabric equals those of other, more famous murderers to come, such as the Boston Strangler, the Hillside Stranglers, and Ted Bundy, British author and crime historian Colin Wilson attests, to understand Harvey Glattman is to understand the basic psychology of the serial killer. It wasn't long after Ophelia gave birth to her son, Harvey Murray Glattman, in 1927, that she began to notice that his popcorn bag might contain a few too many unpopped kernels. Her husband, Albert, a milliner who spent most of his time running a shop in the heart of the Bronx's garment district, was a little slower to catch on. But he too began to notice something strange as the infant became a toddler, and the toddler lengthened into a skinny, sulking, indefinable boy. Mother Ophelia was sensitive to the child's mood swings and odd ways. But Albert, a believer in discipline as a fundamental to anything, took to spankings and assorted mild punishments as a means to calm his son's queer deportment. At first, Ophelia couldn't put her finger on what bothered her about baby Harvey. He just acted strangely. There was nothing definite except that he giggled when there was nothing to giggle about, and he cried over nothing. He showed little interest in anything, his attention span was zero, and he often wandered away in reverie. As he grew, he avoided company, including would-be friends. The parents' first indication that their kid definitely wasn't right came when he was four years old. Ophelia chanced upon Harvey in his room, committing a crude form of sadomasochism. According to Ophelia, at his court trial in 1958, Harvey had tied a string around his penis, placed the loose end in a drawer, and then leaned back against the string. The parents decided to overlook the act as a quirk of an inquisitive, exploring child. If they reacted at all, it was with mild disapproval and moralizing, like the time his father caught him masturbating and warned him that masturbation causes acne. They had no idea that the string represented a neurosis of both punishment and self-chastisement that would grow to dangerous proportions. A rope would replace the string, and the rope would be his fixation. Says biographer Newton, the rope fetish would dog Glattman throughout his life and ultimately land him on death row. Little Harvey's problems were kept indoors for years. To the outside world, neighbors thought him merely shy and studious. To school teachers, he began his schooling in 1933. He was a well-behaved, quiet, very good student. In fact, he excelled in many subjects. Of friends, there were a few, and these consisted of a small group of lunchtime playground buddies who knew him by name and shared a few moments of toss the ball. He was frightened of girls, and when in their company, grew wobbly-kneed and embarrassed. It didn't help that a few of them, and some boys too, ridiculed his overdeveloped ears and his buck teeth. Behind his back, and often to his face, they called him chipmunk or weasel. He never joined the others for after-school games. He ran home and played on his own. And it was sexual. And it involved a rope. Harvey's favorite pastime was tying a rope around his neck, looping the free end over a pipe or rafter, and yanking the rope with one hand while masturbating with the other. The strange feeling gave him a rush unlike anything else. As Michael Newton explains in his book, Rope, Harvey's sex game variously known as autoerotic asphyxia, asphyxiophilia, or hypoxyphilippa, is not the same thing as masochism and involves self-induced strangulation or suffocation during masturbation. Gasping appears to be an ancient practice. Asphyxiation itself creates excitement and eventual euphoria, even without genital stimulation, due to the adrenaline produced when the human body perceives a life-threatening situation. How long Harvey had played the game isn't known. His parents discovered the bad habit around 1938 when their son was 11. The family had recently left New York and moved to Denver, Colorado to escape the teeming, dirty urbania of the Bronx. They'd been happy with Harvey's school grades there, and the fact that he seemed to adjust well to his new school, Sherman Elementary, and neighborhood. But then they came home one night after an evening shopping to find the boy's neck swollen and rope burned. Harvey confessed what he'd been doing. Naked girly pictures hidden under his bed and masturbation were one thing, but this alarmed them. When they sought consultation with the doctor, however, 
even the professional wrote off the erratic playtime as growing pains. Still, life teetered back to normal in the Gladman household, which really meant Harvey took more caution from that point on not to get caught by Ophelia and Albert. He continued to attend school regularly, and in school he was an achiever and entered junior high in 1939. As a teen, his adolescent fear of the female sex hadn't dissipated. A bad case of acne didn't help his confidence. He stammered in the presence of anything with pigtails in a higher voice, turned red, and felt inadequate. Yet they were magnetic, girls were. He longed to touch them. And the rope, his beloved tool, helped him achieve this fantasy. While being promoted at school, he also raised the level of his peculiar thrills after hours. Leaving the now tiresome solitude of a locked bathroom and bedroom at home, he sought a new excitement of breaking and entering private residences. From most of these, he'd steal something, anything, just for kicks. One of his prized plunders was a 26 caliber handgun uncovered from someone's dining room bureau. Not all his break-ins were random. Sometimes he was more particular. He'd spot a pretty woman on Denver streets and follow her home. Once assured of her address, he'd climb through a window or up a set of back stairs into her abode. Once inside, he forced her to her bedroom where he secured her hands with a length of cord that he carried in his jacket everywhere he went. He also muzzled her mouth with a gag cloth. The gun brought the advantage. The cloth silenced her yelps. But the rope, he discovered, was the key to a new sensation. It pinned back the woman's flailing arms, allowing him the liberty to reach his fingers across a soft, curving body without interruption, to explore new mysteries and reach new peaks. The lady was at his mercy, as he would have been at the mercy of all those girls who had called him laughable names on the playground. Tying victims to a bed or a chair, he unbuttoned their blouses, loosened their skirts, and fondled their flesh, and simultaneously, his own. Sometimes he made them lie down beside him and pretended that they enjoyed it as much as he did. He would not fully undress them, nor rape them, for the libido was fully satisfied just to crack the moral bell jar. But, best of all for the inadequate Harvey Gladman, the more he touched them, the more comfortable he became in their presence. After each molestation, he felt himself more like the man he wanted to be, and not like the loser in those newspaper ads promoting vitamins, the guy who gets sand kicked in his face by some muscle man. He practiced this ritual in spurts throughout high school. Noticing that he drifted home from school late on occasion, his parents believed him when he explained he had taken up some scholastic extracurricular activities. On May 18, 1945, he grew careless. Police caught him in the act of breaking into the Vrain Street apartment window of Elma Hamoum. In his pockets, they found a length of rope and a 25 caliber pistol. Under interrogation that evening, he confessed to a number of burglaries, but conveniently left out those that had involved forced sex. He hadn't learned his lesson. Less than a month later, while awaiting trial for the burglary offense, he abducted well-built Noreen Laurel from her neighborhood and, after binding her, drove her out of town to Sunshine Canyon. There, he repeated his routine performance of show and touch, but no rape, before returning her to Denver well before dawn. She went straight to the police station where, from a book of mugshots, she identified him. He was rearrested, and this time, no bail pending. Held behind bars until his trial in November, he was at that time sentenced to a year in Colorado State Prison. He was 17 years old. Harvey Glattman served eight months of his 12-month sentence before being paroled from Colorado State Prison. He walked out the gates on July 27, 1946. One of the first things his mother did was bring him to a psychiatrist as a means to ward off further rash acts such as the ones that sent her boy to the calaboose. The doctor recommended that Harvey's problem was based on his abnormal fear of the opposite sex. Solution? Harvey would have to begin activities such as dancing, that set him right in the midst of women to squelch that fear. Harvey listened well. He returned to his native New York state and partook of many activities that involved women. However, not the kind that the good professional had in mind. 
It had been Mother Ophelia's wish that Harvey leave Denver because of the black mark on him there. She earnestly believed that he could get a fresh start in a new climate among new faces, meet friendly people, get a job, and make something of himself. Leaving Albert at home for a few weeks, Ophelia escorted her son to and set him up in a tidy little flat in Yonkers. She even stood by as he got a job in a television repair store. He'd learned the trade in prison workshop and could now put that knowledge to good use, she told him. Convinced that Harvey was on his way to a normal life, Ophelia returned to Denver. As for Harvey, once Mama was gone, he set out to the streets in search of excitement. Not taking the chance to try to procure a gun, since possession of one would send him back to prison for a long, long time, he instead bought a cap gun from a five and dime that he thought looked authentic enough to pass for real. The pocket knife he carried, though, was not a toy. And the rope, of course, too, that was the best made hemp, guaranteed not to slip. There was no imitating the embracing powers of real hemp. Around midnight of August 27, 1946, lovers Thomas Darrow and Doris Thorne were approached by a man they later described as being a bit shorter than six feet, 140 pounds with messy hair, horn-rimmed glasses, large ears, and pockmarked face. The stranger, brandishing a pistol, ordered the couple off the sidewalk and into the darkness under a grove of trees. Removing Starrow's wallet from his trousers, he tied his legs together and made him lie on the lawn. Turning to Thorne, he began touching her breasts, keeping her in place and quiet with the threat of the gun barrel at her abdomen. Immersed in the wonders of womanhood, Harvey failed to see that the boyfriend had worked himself free from the sloppily tied knot and was tiptoeing from behind. Starro grabbed Harvey, but the latter wiggled free from his grasp, simultaneously producing his pocket knife. With a slash, he caught Starro's shoulder, a cut that, even though not lethal, sent the other recoiling in terror. Harvey escaped into the umbrage. He didn't stop running until he was safe on the first train to Albany. Denver, Yonkers, Albany, it was all the same to Harvey Gladman. The place didn't matter, as long as it had women to caress. Renting a flat in his new town, he spent the next couple of days scouring the neighborhood around his flat on Commercial Street in preparation for more adventure. By August 22nd, he was ready. His first target in Albany was off-duty nurse Florence Hayden. Coming up behind her from the darkness of Main Avenue, he grabbed her purse straps and shoved her into an adjacent yard. Jostling her, he dug his gun barrel into her side and demanded that she remain quiet while he bound her wrists together. But as she told police later, I realized he was using both his hands to tie the rope and no longer held the gun. So I wheeled around, pushed him hard, and screamed, but loud. The mugger absconded, Hayden said, more frightened than she. Not discouraged by his latest run of bad luck, Harvey determined to succeed when he took a stroll along Hollywood Avenue the following evening. For a while, the cupboard looked bare, as every woman he saw was with a male companion, and he had had enough with scrapping with muscular males after that Yonkers incident. His libido itching, he impulsively went after the only unescorted females he saw passing him on a deserted street corner, two women walking together, Evelyn Burge and Beverly Goldstein. But once he'd cornered them with his toy gun, he lost nerve. Two women were too much. Mumbling, fumbling, he ordered them to turn over their pocketbooks, and after they obliged, he again mumbled, again fumbled before shrinking into the shadows. His crimes so far being small potatoes, the Albany Police Department nevertheless considered this phantom a danger. His modus operandi was striking at women, and that scared the bejesus out of Police Commissioner James Kerwin. Descriptions given to the authorities by Hayden, Burge, and Goldstein matched, so they knew it had been the same assailant in all cases. He had already attempted to sexually molest the nurse. Kerwin assembled his forces and commanded, Get this clown! Patrolmen moved quickly. Within two days, they had Harvey Glattman in custody. Two officers had spotted the suspect, matching the description to a T, following a woman down Western Avenue. Stopping him, they frisked him. In his pockets, they found a toy gun, a pocket knife, and a roll of rope. Scared, he confessed. Yonkers wanted him returned to face charges of assault on Thorn and Starrow, 
but the city of Albany was rejoicing in its professional squelching of this goon and flat out refused. Four days after his arrest, Gladman was indicted at Albany's municipal court for the attack on Flo Hayden. Even though the other women did not file charges, the city DA knew that this Gladman, who had already done time in Colorado, was no spontaneous small timer. Harvey suddenly faced a prison term in the big league category. Ophelia and Albert Gladman were stunned when they heard the bad news. All this time, they thought their son had reformed and was living clean, still in Yonkers. Ophelia rushed east to plead for leniency, but her tears won no results. In October, her and Harvey's fears materialized. Judge Earl Gallup, with prodding from the DA's office, hammered the gavel down on the two-time loser. Five to ten, he proclaimed. Harvey was going back up the river, this time to the rock pile. Because Harvey was not yet 21 years of age, Judge Gallup recommended that the convicted begin his term in Elmira, New York Reformatory, but in due course be committed to serve the remainder of his time at maximum security Sing Sing. Prisoner number 48337 spent nearly two years in Elmira. During that time, he was medically researched and evaluated. At the end of that time, Dr. Ralph Ryan Kale diagnosed Harvey as a psychopathic personality schizophrenic type, having sexually perverted impulses as the basis of his criminality. He strongly recommended that further studies on Harvey Glattman be resumed after his removal to Sing Sing. Unfortunately, no records of the psychiatric examinations at Sing Sing have survived, apart from a case study performed just after his ingress. That perfunctory report appraises the new inmate as not definitely mental defective or psychotic, but suggests that he should be psychoeducated and, if still antisocial, should be segregated even if schizophrenia does not seem developed. Parole reports which have survived the years show that Harvey was a model prisoner, had a high IQ, demonstrated ability and eagerness in his prison duties, and responded positively to sporadic medical exams. Crime author Michael Newton, who for years has studied Harvey Glattman and the serial killer mind in general, is unimpressed. He states, sociopathic sex offenders learn to play the system early on, sometimes as children. After they've been arrested several times and spent time in jail, as Harvey had, they know exactly what to say and how to act in any given situation, whether dealing with police, attorneys, or psychologists. Despite solemn assurances to the contrary, many sociopaths are fully capable of beating polygraphs, manipulating the results of psychological evaluation tests, and making therapists believe they've been cured. Harvey evidently played this game very well. Benefits accrued for good behavior severed a percentage of time off his minimum five-year sentence. After only two years, eight months behind bars, Harvey Glattman was paroled. Stipulations, however, decreed that he must return to the care of his mother, acquire a full-time job, and remain under court observation for another four and a half years. Going home to parental custody in Denver, Harvey worked a number of odd jobs and generally stayed out of mischief. Parole follow-ups referred to a spotty employment record, citing difficulties adjusting to a full-time work life. Harvey lived with his parents until after his father Albert passed away, at which time mother and son began to bicker. Allowed space to go on his own, he rented his own flat, continued to find on-again, off-again employment, and visited his parole officer regularly and on time. In September 1956, Harvey Glattman received full liberty. With no more monthly updates to complete, no more authority-contrived checkups, Harvey did what he'd been dying to do for years. Put Denver and Ophelia and courts and police records behind him. With dust rising at his heels, he left the mile-high city and went west. Perhaps the horizon was blurry, but as he drove and drove down dirty highways, somewhere along the way he decided that Los Angeles was the place to go. The Call of the Wild Harvey Glattman reached Los Angeles in January 1957. Alone and unsupervised for the first time in years, his psyche went crazy. Without much hesitancy, his fantasies of naked women in bondage screamed aloud and brazenly. By the time he'd be restrained by police a year and a half later, he'd killed three women and nearly a fourth. The first thing he did when arriving in California was to renew an old hobby of his, photography. 
He had excelled in the art during high school. It fascinated him. He never could quite explain his captivation, maybe because he was able to capture the world in whatever tones and in whatever fashion he wished, to box it into a size 8x10, dull finish or glossy. Whatever the charm, he devised a new outlet for it now, one that made his libido quiver. Up and down the main thoroughfares of downtown L.A., small modeling studios promoted their own array of girls willing to pose for a price, clothed, semi-clad, or in the buff. Seedy, yes, but it was a dream come true for Harvey Glattman with a lot of time and fantasies. Pornography provided a release in the only way he knew. Murder would cover it up. Dr. Robert Keppel, author of Signature Killers, is not surprised that by this time, Harvey's volcano was about to erupt. As chief criminal investigator for Washington State's Attorney General's office, Keppel had worked on and consulted a large number of oddball murder cases. He writes, As a person dreams and thinks of his fantasies over time, he develops a need to express those violent fantasies. Most serial killers have been living with their fantasies for years before they bubble to the surface and are translated into deeds. When the killer finally acts out, some aspect of the murder will demonstrate his unique personal expression that's been replayed in his fantasies over and over again. True crime authors Stephen G. Michaud and Roy Hazelwood's recent book, The Evil That Men Do, use Glattman's and others' histories to study the sordid but existing mind of the serial killer. In his work, Michaud turns to the experiences and knowledge of forensic consultant and former FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood whom he quotes freely within the pages. Hazelwood spent decades with the Federal Bureau of Investigation examining the twisted crimes of sex offenders and joins the ranks of Dr. Keppel in being considered one of the nation's top experts on the subject. Glattman's was one of the first cases Hazelwood encountered in his studies. Harvey was, he says, a novelty in an era when the existence of sexual sadists was not fully considered. In the 1950s, the world was beginning to realize just how vastly sex sold. But the public in general had not yet awakened to the possibility that sex could be highly dangerous when misinterpreted by certain wayward minds. Such deviant criminality, plus much less sinister behavior, was both curbed and concealed in America at the mid-century by a moral climate hostile to sexual extremes or erotic experimentation, writes Michaud. In quoting Hazelwood, he adds, in those days, people appearing in hardcore pornography still wore masks. Playboy was new. Mickey Spillane's books were considered explicit. In the last three or four pages of I, the Jury, for example, Spillane describes a man holding a gun on a woman as she slowly unbuttons her blouse. Beads of perspiration run between her breasts. That was the book that high school guys gathered around to read during lunchtime, and those were the particular pages most frequently read. Passages like these stroke the healthy male libido, Michaud says, but not that of a sexual sadist like Glattman, simply because it lacked the specific connection between sex and violence needed for his arousal. Aberrant offenders use pornography to validate their deviance as well. The more they see of it and masturbate to it, the more their behavior is reinforced. Eventually, Harvey's inner behavior, as Dr. Keppel would say, would bubble to the surface. Working as a TV repairman by day, Harvey was able to afford rent for a small flat studio apartment on quiet Melrose Avenue and a used car, a used 1951 Black Dodge Cornet. He also found the cash to buy an expensive Rollercord camera, complete with a Schneider Zenar zoom lens and a tripod. With the proper equipment, all he needed now was a pseudonym, something snappy that sounded like a real professional photographer like those who took those saucy pictures in his favorite crime magazines. Weighing the decision like it was the most important one in the world, he finally conceived the alias, Johnny Glenn. Sounded pert. Sounded suave. Sounded persuasive. For months, he hung out at the model studios, snapping away to his libido's content. Amazed and titillated at how easily these broads strip bare for 20 bucks an hour. But... It wasn't enough. He had to touch, to have, to control, to 
His first victim was Judith Ann Dull, a 19-year-old wide-eyed baby doll divorcee taking on whatever assignment she could get to pay for a lawyer in a child custody battle with her ex. Having obtained her phone number through her agency, it was customary in the 50s for agencies to release personal numbers. Harvey called Dull the morning of August 1, 1957 to explain that he had seen her model before and was interested in having her pose for a layout for a popular true crime magazine. It was a great opportunity, he stressed. Her line of business urged caution, but she thought he sounded nice enough over the telephone, and the fact that he agreed to do the shoot at her own apartment sounded convivial. She agreed to pose for him at 2 o'clock that afternoon. Wear a tight skirt and sweater, he directed, before hanging up. When he arrived at her Switzer Avenue flat early, he asked her if she would mind posing at his studio instead. The lighting was better. Surveying the floppy-eared, bespeckled wimp, she tossed off all caution and followed him to his car. He drove her to his studio, actually his own apartment. Once inside, he explained that since the shots would accompany a story about bondage, he would have to illustrate by tying her up. If she had any doubts, the thought of $20 an hour overrode. She consented, throwing out her wrists as he bound them, sitting back in his armchair as he wrapped her ankles, and slinking back seductively this way and that way. When she was fully strapped and muzzled, he drew a 32 Browning automatic from his pocket. In 1957, California had no waiting period for firearm purchases, says author Michael Newton in Rope. No background checks, no pesky licenses. You didn't even have to show ID. It was a cash-and-carry business. Harvey had had the cash, and he carried. Waving the steel blue weapon under her chin, he untied her hands and ordered her to strip slowly as he snapped her in various poses, some bound, some free, all depicting her in the control of someone off-screen. Like a movie director, he barked out, You're frightened. You're curious. Be scared, but be tempting. Lift a leg. Drop a strap. Snap, click, whir. Snap, click, whir. The poses varied and grew more erotic, more emphatic to Harvey's personal soul as the shoot progressed. In a chapter devoted to Glattman in his book Signature Killers, Robert D. Keppel, Ph.D., explains how Harvey's photographs were his personal signature of murder. Keppel finds Harvey's use of photography telling. His photos were more than souvenirs because, in Glattman's mind, they actually carried the power of his need for bondage and control. They showed the women in various poses, sitting up or lying down, hands always bound behind their backs, innocent looks on their faces, but with eyes wide with terror because they had guessed what was to come. When the pictures were taken, he had his way with Judy Dull. Oblige, he commanded, or die. Whimpering at her foolishness, the girl obeyed. As the outside world dimmed through Harvey's window shades, John Glenn raped her several times, binding her limbs at the conclusion of each session. Relaxing, satisfied for the meantime, he made her sit beside him and nuzzle him on the sofa as he watched his favorite TV comedies. A few more shows, he promised, and he'd take her home. But Harvey had no intention of taking her anywhere, except to a perfect little spot in the desert he discovered one day while cruising near the vicinity of Indio. Way out amongst the coyotes, and far, far away from the cops who could send him back behind bars forevermore. Really, he kept telling himself over and over again, he didn't want to kill anyone. But what else was there to do? He had to have her, had to possess her, had to glutton on her. Damn, it wasn't his fault. And damn it, nobody was going to send him to prison for something he couldn't help. How else was he supposed to get a woman? At 10.30 p.m., Harvey announced that he would let her go, but he'd have to dump her off out of town for her to find her own way home. She probably reasoned that he wanted time to escape, and she didn't argue. Tying her wrists once again, he led her to his car, his gun in one hand as he steered the vehicle down the freeway, south to San Bernardino, east to Mission Road, into the open flatland of Riverside County lit only by stars. He kept on driving, miles more to go, and didn't pause until he'd passed Banning and Palm Springs, finally slowing down once he passed Thousand Palms. A hundred miles from Los Angeles, here in the middle of nowhere, he stopped the car. 
Around them was night and nature. Pulling Dull from the car, he acted as if he was about to untie her. She sighed. Then, in a single move, he lassoed her neck, shoved her to her knees, twirled her on her belly, and wrung the other loop of the cord around her ankles. Pulling up, her body snapped below him. A single groan, and she was dead. But Harvey needed a few more photos, by flash, something to remember his conquest. He molded dull like a clay figure, an arm here, an arm there, a leg spread, a knee turned this way, dead no matter how she was shaped. He wanted it to appear that way. Of the victim's death photos, Dr. Keppel adds, they were even more horrifying to police than the in-life ones because they revealed Glattman's true nature. They showed the ways the killer had positioned his victims, and the psychological depravity they evidenced was deeply revolting. That a human being could so reveal the depths of his own weakness and feelings of insignificance through photographs was something investigators had not seen before. Seven months later, Harvey met victim number two. Shirley Ann Bridgeford, 24 years old, recently divorced and with two sons, joined the popular Patty Sullivan Lonely Hearts Club in L.A., hoping to meet the right man. All she knew was that she didn't want someone like her first husband. She wasn't picky, having given up on Prince Charming, so when fellow member George Williams asked her out for a date on March 7, 1958, she accepted. Williams did not set her heart fluttering. His ears were so large and there was something, well, mousy about him, but she figured a date is a date and it beats sitting at home Saturday night. He promised to take her square dancing. At least it would be a night on the town and a free dinner. Harvey, as George Williams, showed up at the appointed time, 7.45 p.m., at her home on Tuxford Street, Sun Valley. Taken aback by a house full of company to greet him, he kept his cool and played the hopeful boyfriend to the hilt, complimenting the way Shirley looked and extending a nice-to-meet-you-all on his way out the door. Once in the car, he asked Bridgeford if she would mind not going dancing. He had a headache and preferred to take a drive in the country instead. Perhaps they could grab some dinner along the way. Sure, she replied. That sounded very nice. Driving south from Sun Valley, they stopped for dinner in Oceanside. Afterwards, they returned to the car where Harvey resumed a southward direction. If we believe his later statements, he'd not yet decided to rape and murder Shirley Bridgeford, Michael Newton reports in Rope. He kept on thinking of her two children, Harvey said, telling himself that Shirley was a different type than Judy Dull. She didn't strip and show her body off to strangers. Shirley was a nice girl. Still, her very presence in the car and the scent of her perfume incited Gladman. Harry knew what he was missing if he did not follow through. At last, the car edged into the foothills of looming Vallecito Mountains near Anza State Park. Harvey idled the car, letting it roll off the dirt road and several feet onto the dusty sand floor. Bridgeford looked at him quizzically. What omen she may have had crystallized sharply when she found the barrel of his twenty-two tucked between her breasts. Undress, Harvey dictated. She begged not to, but he insisted, and when she was naked, he ravaged her. The rapes, the humiliation. Then he forced her onto the desert where he told her it was photo time. More pleas, more refusals from her abductor. He took photos of her dressed, and he took photos of her nude. He took photos in many positions, his ritual orderly and timed. Snap, click, whir. In the blackness, the flashbulbs popped, one after another, crazy little explosions catching crazy little scenes. Snap, click, whir. To be sure, he had usable products for all his trouble. He made her wait till the sun rose so he could take some photos in daylight. When he thought he had enough to last him for a while, he garroted his model and killed her. Before he left the carcass in the dust, however, he did what he had done with Judy Dull, took some death shots in a number of wrenching positions. Snap, click, whirr. Then as the maroon sun rose over the mountains behind him, Harvey went home to his dark room for some real fun. Four months later, he discovered Ruth Mercado, a.k.a. Angela Rojas, and repeated the process, by then refined, dumping her body not far from what was left of Shirley Bridgeford's. 
In the meantime, the three girls' families, friends, and landlords were asking questions of the police. Where did they go and why can't you find them? Dell's disappearance had been one thing. Women ran off all the time to evade boyfriends and husbands, and even families. But then came the evaporation of Bridgeford and Mercado, two models and one nice girl, each one gone after leaving their place with a single male. Was there a connection? Harvey had so far been able to control women with a gun and a rope, especially a rope, his symbol of sexual power. He now believed he could go on doing it forever. That is where he goofed. In the summer of 1958, Glattman had discovered the Diane Studio, one of the higher-priced but better-reputed modeling agencies on Sunset Boulevard. Its models were often chosen by legitimate cameramen for magazine ads and TV commercials. Diane, the owner, often posed herself. Of course, the studio attracted the shutterbugs, too, like Harvey Glattman, willing to pay as high as $30 for an hour's striptease. It was to Diane's that Harvey came late on the afternoon of October 27th, wanting to rent a model's time. Actually, he wanted Diane herself, but the proprietor, who was familiar with the man she knew as Frank Johnson, was totally turned off by his unkempt hair and repugnant body odor. Pretending to be too busy to accommodate him, she nevertheless offered studio space and the use of one of her particular models if the girl would accept. Frank was game, so Diane phoned a woman who had, in fact, just signed on the previous week. Lorraine Vigil, eager for her first modeling gig, accepted. Diane made the arrangements. Harvey would pick her up at eight. However, after the unfavorable client left, Diane ruminated. She called Lorraine back to warn her, be careful with this loser. He's not a professional and is mm, rather creepy. You know what I mean? Vigil promised she would take care and thank the agent for the advice. With Diane's alert signal still ringing in her ears, it was with great reticence that Vigil got into Harvey's old dodge that night. She watched his every move as he bent to release the clutch and silently head towards the Santa Ana freeway. The studio's not this way, she instructed. Oh, didn't I tell you? I've been preempted by another client. We're going to my private studio instead. No, no, thought Lorraine to herself. The signal started to vibrate inside her head. Are you sure? Cross my heart, he giggled, and did so. It was the first time that Lorraine really took a good look at his face. Even his grin was unsavory. She kept quiet, not wanting to make a fuss. This was her first job for the Diane studio and didn't want to earn bad marks right off the bat as an unwilling client. As the Dodge rattled on, down the freeway past one exit ramp after another, seemingly speeding up with the mileage, she mustered up enough nerve to ask Harvey, who had not uttered one word since he giggled and crossed his heart, where his studio was. A little further, he said, Anaheim. But the Anaheim exits had come and gone, she noted. Didn't you pass it? Forget it, he growled. Otherwise, he remained close-mouthed, only staring straight ahead through the glimmering windshield. The lights from the freeway, gutted with shadows, curled his expression into an eerie grimace. From beside him, Vigil dropped her eyes to his foot, which was bearing down on the gas pedal. Diane's alarm clanged in her skull. Be careful with this loser. Creepy. 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 Listen, I have a right to know, Vigil quaked, but he sawed her off with a groan. Shut up! Hey you, she protested now. You'd better tell me where we're going, or... Viciously, he swung the car into a dangerous turn, grabbing the forthcoming exit, impulsively crossing two lanes to take it. Vigil slammed against the door panel. As she tried to sit up again, her eyes caught the overhead road marker, Tustin Ranch Road. The car, slowing up after the spontaneous turnabout, came to a stop on the side of the road just below the off-ramp. Are you trying to kill us? The woman screamed. Hold out your arms, he said. What? I said, hold out your arms. You're getting on my nerves. I'm going to tie you up and shut you up. To emphasize the seriousness of his order, he whipped out a gun and watched the bitch recoil at its sight. But when her fingers wrapped around the door handle in an attempt to flee, he grabbed her. Yanking her into him, he wrapped her body, twisting her around in the motion. Trying desperately to coil the length of rope that seemed to appear out of nowhere around her arms, 
but she fought. He hadn't expected this. The others hadn't grappled. Why was she a tiger? Stay still, he grumbled, and tried like hell to keep her away from the car door. Once outside, she'd be able to flag down any number of automobiles that drove by. And then, God forbid. She continued to wrestle until both their hands wrapped the gun barrel. In one awkward reflex, the pistol exploded, and a bullet seared through a section of Vigil's skirt, skimming her thigh. The noise jolted the attacker, who, in that instant, released his hold on her. Thinking fast, she kicked at the door handle, and as the door bounced open, she pushed herself out with it. Landing on the gravel, she felt him behind her, then his hands on her sweater, trying to haul her back inside. Just as she felt herself being reeled in, the night lit up with a great glare of white that, as both scrappers paused, turned into two distinct headlights of a police sedan. Vigil ran to it and realized, for the first time, she still held on to her attacker's pistol. She dropped it before the two policemen emerging from the auto and fell at their feet sobbing. As for Harvey Glattman, he cowered beside his car, whimpering, mumbling something about it not being his fault. Highway patrolman Tom Mulligan later testified he had a lunatic stare. I'll never forget that wild look he had in his eyes. Tell us, you SOB. Tell us what you know about those other girls. Harvey, exhausted after hours of grilling, attempted once again to lay his head on the briefing table. But one of the detectives yanked him back by the collar. No shut-eye till you speak up, Harvey. Around him were four plainclothesmen, scowling, determined, hovering, smothering him, all representing various sectors of the local law enforcement bodies that had had enough of women disappearing from their midst. They'd gathered here in the Orange County Jail in Santa Ana to corner a rat. Sergeants Pierce Brooks and Elmer Jackson were there from the LAPD, gunning for information on Ruth Mercado and Shirley Bridgeford, Captain Jim Bradford and Detective John Lawton from the Sheriff's Office, insisting that he knew what happened to Judith Ann Dull. You fit the description of the punk who took away Bridgeford, Brooks reminded him. What the hell did you do to her? Where is she? And tell us where Judy Dull is, Harvey, Bradford urged. You killed her. You know you killed her. Tell us about the rope we found in your car and the switchblade in your pocket and the pop gun you held on Miss Vigil tonight. Lawton slammed his fist onto the table. Did you strangle the others with that rope? Did you stab them or did you shoot them? You have a record in Colorado and in New York too, Harvey, Bradford pummeled. All about harassing women. You like to harass women, don't you, Harvey? Speak up, you SOB, because we know you did it, Jackson shouted. We know you're the one. Glasses, rumpled hair, rumpled clothes, and even a camera in your car. Yeah, a camera. Camera, Brooks echoed. The guy who killed Mercado was supposed to have been a photographer. And you're a photographer, Harvey. Are you a photographer, Harvey? Is that how you lured all these girls to their death? You shot him with your camera and then with your thirty-two? No, no, no. Harvey shook his head and thought to himself, that's not what I did, but damn, you're getting close. White lights, bright lights, incessant, unending bright lights in his face. First that squad car, now the snake lamps in his face, giving him a headache. Temples throbbed, mouth parched, and the hammering, hammering, hammering of fists beating wartime in front of him. The hammering and the nudging and the shoving and the yelling. Tell us, Harvey. Where are the girls? Where did you kill the girls, Harvey? How did you kill the girls, Harvey? When did you kill the girls, Harvey? All right, I killed them. I killed them all. He collapsed across the table, sobbing. You know I killed them. There's no way you could have known unless you found the toolbox. The toolbox? asked Brooks. The one in my house with the pictures. The dead girls. That's where I hid them. The pictures. In my toolbox. You know what I mean. You're just playing with me now. Brooks and the others shared agreeing glances and understood. They now pretended to know about the toolbox, where obviously the incriminating evidence lay, so that Harvey would go on to officially confess to the murders. In the meantime, police were dispatched to the Glattman apartment with an order to find the damning object and bring it back. Later that evening, 
the prisoner admitted what he'd done. As if his testimony wasn't shocking enough, the terrible essence of exactly what he'd done was caught in black and white to send a shiver down the spines of those who saw them. They were images of Gladman's detailed methodology of murder, which showed a sequence of terror by recreating the entire psychological arc of the crime, Dr. Robert Keppel explains in Signature Killers. He first photographed each victim with a look of innocence on her face, as if she were truly enjoying a modeling session. The next series represents a sadist's view of a sexually terrorized victim with the impending horror of a slow and painful death etched across her face. The final frame depicted the victim's position that Gladman himself had arranged after he strangled her. These were the central phrases of Gladman's signature of serial murder. His only motive from the outset was to torture and murder, to punish them before and after death. As Harvey pioneered the field of serial killing, Sergeant Pierce Brooks of the LAPD pioneered the field in a scholastic way, laying the foundation of what would become the study of serial killers. Renowned subject scholar Dr. Robert D. Keppel, who in his book Signature Killers, refers to the sergeant as his mentor, praises the groundwork done by the LAPD cop who, intrigued with what he saw in Gladman, was one of the first people to talk about catching repetitive killers by examining their behavior at crime scenes. Better says, Brooks was the first law enforcement officer to recognize how some killers left a reiterating signature or calling card at the scenes of their crimes. His documentation led to what in time became the FBI's VICAP program, which tracks subtle nuances left behind by such murderers. On that hot October night, though, Harvey Glattman was the only killer on Brooks's and his fellow officers' minds, for he provided enough of the macabre to keep the cops busy for quite some time. The night of his arrest, and after he confessed to murdering Dull, Bridgeford, and Mercado, Harvey was cuffed and hurried under armed patrol to the San Diego County Courthouse. But he was not immediately jailed. There was something the detectives wanted him to do first, lead them to where the bodies were abandoned. The DA saw the Glattman case as open and shut, but not a sure thing until the killer produced cadavers. Without his victim's remains, any reliable defense counsel could paint Harvey as just another wacko trying to make headlines. Finding what was left of the three women was a necessity, as gruesome as hard as it sounded, and there was no time like now for finding them. In the dark of the night, Harvey was packed away between a couple of detectives in one car, and followed by several police in another, and called upon to serve as navigator. He led the caravan down what had been the last leg of his familiar route from L.A., the San Diego freeway to Escondido, then east on 78 to the desert, and San Velocito's foothills. Even through the shroud of night, Harvey knew the way like an old tar on habitual waters. First he showed them where he'd raped and killed Shirley Bridgeford, a tan coat and scattered bones bathed by moonlight proved to the police he wasn't lying. Most of the skeleton had been chewed on or carried away by animals, but certainly there'd be enough there for the forensic team to identify Miss Bridgeford. Leaving a patrolman at the crime scene, the parade moved further down Valacita Road until Harvey directed them to stop. Scouring the area to which Harvey pointed, the searchers finally came upon a skeleton, almost intact, with tufts of hair still clinging to the skull. Angela Rojas, Harvey intoned the name as he'd known her by. But the detectives knew she was really Ruth Mercado. By now it was daylight. After securing this spot, the detectives returned Harvey to town. When, on the following day, the murderer brought them to the site where he slew Judith Ann Dull, there was not much to find, surprisingly. Some shreds of clothing, nothing much more. But then investigators learned that many months previously, a skeleton of an unknown woman had been found at that locale by hikers. Forensic odontologists were now able to re-examine those bones, still on file, as well as examine the skeletal remains of the other two victims to make positive identification. On Monday, November 3rd, Harvey Glattman was officially arraigned in San Diego County. Here, his trial would take place, even though three other counties had wanted him badly. Orange County for the assault on Miss Vigil that occurred within its jurisdiction, Riverside County where Miss Dull had been killed, and Los Angeles County, claiming, rightfully so, that all of the victims had been abducted there. But, says author Newton, it finally came down to numbers. 
at least as far as San Diego County DA James Don Keller was concerned. His county had two corpses, compared to Riverside's one. Once the arraignment was over, Keller assembled a task force prosecuting team to see that justice was served well on this mad dog. The mad dog was already yelping to be put out of his misery, and these men agreed that he should be obliged. They wanted a fair process of law, of course, but they wanted it to be done expediently. The team consisted of Keller and members of the San Diego County DA's office, as well as representatives from other counties and the city of Los Angeles. Included in this last were homicide detective LAPD Pierce Brooks. One of the things these men wanted and needed for legal prosecution was the history of each crime on tape as recorded by Harvey Glattman himself. How he killed the girls and why. Harvey had already confessed and, in effect, surrendered his right to a trial. But for purpose of the prosecuting team's full understanding of what occurred, and most certainly for the purpose of studying a kind of mind the world had yet to realize, the recording was mandatory. Brought to a room in the county sheriff's building, Lieutenant Tom Isbell and Sergeant Robert Majors conducted the session. Explaining to the prisoner what they were doing and the reasons for it, they flicked on the machine. As a legal technicality, Majors prefaced the dialogue. Bending over the mic, he spoke, Harvey, before you make any statement here that will be recorded on this tape, I would like you to know that everything you say is being recorded and that everything you say here can be held against you in your prosecution for murder. Do you understand that? Harvey nodded. Yes, sir. Over the next four hours, Harvey addressed each murder at a time, as well as his planned murder of Lorraine Vigil, relating a story the likes of which the two other men in that room had never heard and may have called preposterous if they had seen it played out in a movie. He stated dates, addresses, deeds, and details in gory technicolor. He told how the idea of the killing seeded in his mind, how they grew. He confessed that he craved sex with the women, and when the sex was through, how he needed to kill them, all based on a sexual urge to control. When Harvey spoke, it was without drama or malevolence, or even regret. His speech was a monotone, even while it gushed the gruesome incidents of murder. Perhaps his attitude was, thought the detectives watching him, one of relief. Since his arrest, the prisoner had been begging for his death. Maybe he figured that this was his final testimony before the grave, the only way to get what he wanted now. There was only one person who felt sorry for the man whom the newspapers were calling the Lonely Hearts Killer. That was his mother, Ophelia. At 69 years old, the aged lady ventured to California to visit her son. Allowed to see him on November 12th, she soon emerged from his cell, dabbing her cheeks, saddened but acceptant, for she had seen a tragedy coming for decades. When surrounded by the press, she inadvertently gave the papers probably the most accurate observation of Harvey Gladman to date. He's not a vicious man. He's sick. Journalists devoured that new adaptation and spat out the anecdote and full human interest drama, The Sacrificing Mother, stage front. That brought hope for attorney Willard Whittinghill, who'd been charged to represent Harvey. His strategy became the only viable one open to him to save his client from the gas chamber, to present Harvey as insane. This would mean that the defendant would have to undergo psychiatric examination by the county psychiatrist C.E. Lengiel. Harvey's attitude was careless. He wanted to die but Whittinghill convinced him to endure the test. A mistake. What doubts there had been about the soundness of the culprit's mind collapsed under Lengiel's diagnosis. In summary of the report that the doctor filed on February-December 12th, it read, This individual shows no evidence of a psychosis. He knows right from wrong, the nature and quality of his acts, and he can keep from doing wrong if he so desires. Amen. In the meantime, Don Keller had been preparing for the upcoming San Diego grand jury hearing by accruing a host of witnesses to testify against Harvey in his alleged murders of the two victims slain in San Diego County, Ruth Mercado and Shirley Bridgeford. Lending the most credibility were those relatives of Miss Bridgeford who had gathered at her house the evening Harvey came to pick up his date. They'd fingered him, and they testified how she had left that night with him a healthy young girl and loving mother of two, never to be seen alive again. The grand jury returned two counts of murder in the first degree. 
Harvey Glattman's final day in court began bright and early on Monday, December 15, 1958, in Department 4 of Superior Court, reports Rope author Michael Newton. The proceeding was not a trial per se. He had already filed a guilty plea. But California law requires a separate penalty phase in such cases before sentence is passed. The options, simply stated, were death or life imprisonment. Presiding was William T. Lowe, a stickler for the judicial word. Witnesses for the prosecution were some repeats of the earlier grand jury hearing, but also many new ones, officials and laypersons alike, including Lorraine Vigil, the only survivor of Harvey's designs. Lawmen spoke about their finding of the bones, remnants of the women left abandoned in the desert. They explained how they caught Harvey in the act of trying to drag Vigil into the car to make her victim number four and they described the nature of the photographs found in Harvey's toolbox. As a climax, the prosecution then played Harvey Glattman's taped confession, which, in the silence of the courtroom, sent chills through the assemblage. Several women crossed themselves and wept. Men stared into the void, but their mind's eyes trying to form some of the hell that Harvey painted. As the session ended, Judge Lowe asked defense counsel Whittinghill if he had anything to add. Whittinghill answered with a simple, nearly inaudible, No, Your Honor. Nodding, expecting that reply, the presider sat back in his chair. With the look of disbelief, he turned to the defendant. Said Lowe, I sat here and listened to those recordings, the manner in which these women were killed. I never heard anything like it, and I hope I never hear anything like it again. The torment, the suffering these women must have endured during the night and in the desert, it must have been horrible. He cleared his throat, fought back a lump that had formed there, and resumed. At this time, I, having found the defendant guilty of first-degree murder, will impose the death penalty on him. I think that's the only proper judgment that should be pronounced in this particular case. Mr. Glattman, may God have mercy on your soul. The condemned killer was transferred to death row at San Quentin Prison as prisoner number A50239. The space he was given, in a cell apart from the rest of the inmate population, would be shared in later years by Charles Manson and Richard the Night Stalker Ramirez. Life there must have been unbearable for Harvey Murray Gladman. No outlet for his fantasies. No twine. Not even his precious camera. But he wouldn't have to endure the suffocation of this new abode for very long. His execution was set early for September 18, 1959, at which time he was led into San Quentin's infamous Green Room to inhale cyanide. The procedure, which began at 10 a.m., took 12 minutes in all, much less than the length of time it took for him to march his victims through their separate agonies. The chamber door was locked at 10.01. He was strapped in place by 10.02. The sodium cyanide pellets dropped a minute later, and within seconds, they dissolved to emanate forth fumes across and up his nostrils. Doctors beyond the viewing glass rated his pulse at 200, but by 10.05, it had plunged to 60. He gasped at 10.06, drooled at 10.07, and his head dropped, bobbed, bobbed again, and twitched. By 10.12 a.m., September 18, 1959, the lady killer expired. It was a ghastly way to die. A true punishment for Harvey Glattman, who would have been much, much happier, maybe even ecstatic, had he been hung by rope. It was a glorious spring day, perfect for a day out in the forest. Ken Seeley stood in a clearing, looking slowly about him, breathing in clear, fresh country air. It was a far cry from the pollution and stress of Sydney, two hours to the north, where he lived and worked. This was the time of the week that he looked forward to the most when his orienteering club met for their weekly run. Normally, Ken bushwalked or ran the orienteering courses alone, but on Saturday the 19th of September 1992, the club had organized a training day along some of the many trails that crisscrossed the 40,000 acres of the beautiful Belangelo State Forest. Ken thought the forest had never looked so good. Everywhere around him was the lush, green vegetation of towering eucalyptus trees and native shrubs, bordered by commercial pine plantations. 
a stark contrast to the blackened desolation normally left after the many bushfires that had swept through the area in recent times. After a short navigational briefing, Ken and his running partner, Keith Caldwell, set off on the first leg of the run. The sport is not unlike rally driving, where the object is to run a predetermined course within a specified time, reaching and recording various checkpoints along the way. By early afternoon, they were deep in the forest close to one of the most spectacular landmarks of the area, Executioner's Drop, so called because of its sheer fall into a deep, wooded gorge. After recording their previous control points, staggered roughly half a mile apart, they took bearings on the next, control number four, designated by a large boulder. Approaching the boulder, Ken smelled something bad. As he got closer, the smell became more intense. He thought it was probably a rotting animal carcass. The forest provided a home to many wild animals. Kangaroos, wallabies, and even the elusive dingo roamed free, virtually unhindered by human intervention. Dismissing it from his mind, Ken concentrated on his navigational bearings and was about to move on when Keith called to him from the far side of the boulder. Can you smell that? he asked. The smell got stronger as they approached the western side of the boulder. Beneath a small overhang, they found a mound of debris, approximately seven feet long and two feet high. Stepping closer to the pile of branches and decaying leaves, the two men, braving the smell, saw what appeared to be a bone and a patch of hair. They weren't sure it was human until they saw part of a black t-shirt. They both walked slowly around the mound until they got to the northern end of it, where they stopped, staring down at the ground, trying to comprehend what they'd found. Protruding from the pile of brush was the heel of a shoe. By this time, it was 3.45 p.m. Soon, the forest floor would be in darkness as the sun dipped lower in the sky. They carefully marked the location on their map, 800 feet southwest of Long Acre Fire Trail, one of the many access trails in the area. A decision had to be made, backtrack the way they had come in, or complete the course, which would take them out of the forest and bring them closer to their cars they decided the latter choice would be quickest. Half an hour later, they rejoined their friends and quickly related the experience. They all agreed that the authorities should be informed as soon as possible. Contacting emergency services by mobile telephone, Seely, a gentle, soft-spoken man, was asked by the operator, is this an emergency? When he replied, not really, he was disconnected. Several phone calls later, he was finally connected with the duty officer at the local police station in Boral, a pretty little town nestled in the southern highlands of New South Wales. Seely identified himself and told the officer, I found a body in the Belangalo forest. He wasn't sure if they had taken him seriously. It wasn't long before he saw that they had. Uniformed police arrived just as the light was beginning to fade. They were shown the way to the sighting by torchlight marking the way with reflective tape. Local detectives arrived soon after and requested a crime scene unit from Goulburn, the next major town to the south. Lighting was organized for the scene, and not long after, regional detectives from the homicide squad arrived. A call was made to the Office of Detectives in Sydney's King's Cross, as well as the Missing Persons Bureau, as they were known to be investigating the disappearance of several backpackers who were last seen heading south. No one at the scene that day realized that the body that had been found would lead to the biggest murder investigation in Australia's history. Nor would they know the extent of pain and suffering that was shared by a small group of people from different parts of the world. Searching the area the following day, the two police constables, Roger Guff and Suzanne Roberts, found a second body. It was partially covered by a log just a hundred feet east of the first. A shoe and part of a lower leg were visible below a mound of leaves and branches that was roughly the same size as the first. Early media reports suggested that the bodies were the remains of two British backpackers, Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. They had been missing for five months after leaving King's Cross to travel south together looking for work. Police were yet to make a positive identification. In Australia and across the world, Several families hearing of the grisly discovery contacted the authorities for more accurate information. In Germany, Manfred and Anke Nugebauer listened anxiously to the news, wondering if the bodies found were those of their son Gabor and his girlfriend Anya, 
who had disappeared without a trace after leaving a King's Cross backpacker's hostel just after Christmas Day, 1991. Herbert Schmidl, in his home in Regensburg, near Munich, listened also, hoping that neither body was that of his only daughter, Simone, who had been missing since leaving Sydney in 1991. Several miles south of Belangelo, in Frankston, Victoria, Pat Everest wondered if it was her daughter Deborah and her friend James Gibson that were lying dead in the forest. They had been missing since 1989. Late in the afternoon of Sunday the 20th of September, police confirmed that the bodies were, in fact, those of Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. Joanne's parents, Ray and Jill Walters, had already been in Australia for a month prior to the discovery, searching in vain for some trace of their daughter. The police tracked them down in Sydney to give them the bad news. Police telephoned Ian and Jackie Clark in England and informed them that the second body was Carolyn's. The timing of the call was indeed fortunate. Shortly after the phone call, a local radio station carried the story of their daughter's death. As the investigation proceeded, it became apparent that the murders were committed with a high degree of violence and cruelty. Joanne Walters had been stabbed viciously in the heart and lungs with one wound so deep that it had cut deep into her spine. Carolyn Clark had also been stabbed and shot in the head multiple times. Homicide detectives Inspector Rob Godden and Sergeant Steve McClellan were appointed to take charge of the investigation. After his initial evaluation of the crime scene, McClellan speculated that because the bodies had been found in an isolated area, it was possible that the killer lived nearby. Crime scene detectives worked around the clock, analyzing and photographing every inch of the murder scene. Joanne Walters' body still had jewelry on both hands, and she was wearing blue jeans and black shoes. Curiously, the zip of the jeans was undone, but the top button was still fastened. Fourteen feet from where Carolyn Clark's body lay, six cigarette butts were found. They were all of the same brand. Someone had obviously spent quite a bit of time at the scene. Not far from them, a fired 22 caliber cartridge case was recovered, and next to it, a piece of green plastic the size of a large coin. Ballistic specialists scanned the area with metal detectors and found nine more cartridge cases 12 feet from Clark's body. From the ground directly below her head, three bullets were recovered. Detectives from the ballistics squad were confident that, given the conditions of the bullets and the spent cases, they'd be able to identify the gun that fired them. A further 120 feet from the murder scene, a fireplace had been built from house bricks. A strange thing to find deep in a forest. Over the next five days, 40 police searched a corridor 500 feet wide and one and a half miles long and did not find any more bodies, nor did they find the camping gear and personal items belonging to the two girls. Following the search, police told the media that they had virtually ruled out the possibility of finding other bodies in the forest. It was an announcement that would prove to be premature and cause a great deal of embarrassment to the New South Wales Police Department. Dr. Peter Bradhurst, the forensic pathologist assigned to the case, had the unpleasant task of performing the autopsies. The badly decomposed remains of the two girls had been carefully removed from the forest and transported to the morgue in Glebe, an inner suburb of Sydney. The first stage of the forensic investigation was to weigh and x-ray Joanne's body in search of bullets or other metallic objects. There were none. Carolyn's body was next, and the x-rays revealed that, even though her body was decomposed to a much greater extent than Joanne's, it clearly contained what the radiographer described as radio-opaque objects. To be more precise, four bullets. Next, Dr. Bradhurst began the external examination methodically checking the entire body for physical evidence. Joanne's shirt and hands showed traces of dark hairs. The rotted remains of a cloth used as a gag were removed from her mouth, as were other cloth samples at the throat, suggesting strangulation. An internal examination showed no signs of vaginal or anal penetration, but given the poor condition of the body tissue, it was very difficult to tell. Hair and nail samples were taken for matching with other samples found. A vaginal swab was also taken, as sperm samples can remain in a body for weeks or even months. Joanne's chest showed three stab wounds to the right side, one to the left side, and a further stab wound to the neck. When the body was rolled over, 
the full extent of what could only be described as a frenzied attack became clear. A further two wounds were found to the left side, five more to the right, and two to the spine at the base of the neck. Fourteen wounds in all were recorded and measured. The internal exam revealed that five of the stab wounds had cut the spine. Dr. Bradhurst speculated that any of the spinal wounds could have been delivered prior to the fatal blows, thereby rendering the victim totally helpless. Two ribs had been totally severed. The hands and arms showed no defensive wounds that normally occur when the victim attempts to ward off a knife attack. This, coupled with the remains of the gag and neck ligature, indicated that the killer was completely in control during the murder. The wounds measured one and a half inches by a quarter inch with the profile of a bowie knife or similar style blade. The arms of Carolyn Clark's body were stretched above her head, which had a red cloth wrapped around it. Bullet holes were clearly visible in the decaying cloth. The cloth was carefully removed and the extent of the injuries became evident. A total of ten bullet holes riddled the skull. Only four exit wounds were found. Four complete 22 caliber projectiles were recovered from inside the skull. The front of the face and the jaw were shattered, possibly damaged by exiting bullets. She had one single stab wound to the upper back, identical to the wounds of the first victim. The bullets from the body were cleaned and passed on to Sergeant Gerard Dutton, the ballistics expert who was present at the postmortems. He was confident that they, like the other bullets and fired cases collected from the scene, would lead to the identity of the weapon used. A reenactment at the scene later revealed that the gunshot wounds were consistent with having been fired from three different locations. However, all ten fired cases were found close together. Sergeant Dutton suggested that the killer may have stood in the one spot and fired the shots, stopping to move the victim's head between volleys. In short, he had used her for target practice. In an unusual step, Professor John Hilton, the head of forensic medicine, released details of the findings to the large group of reporters who had gathered outside the morgue. Not accustomed to giving media conferences, he spoke in a faltering, hesitant voice. Even though he was an experienced pathologist and forensic scientist, he was obviously disturbed by the extent of the injuries and the sheer brutality of the attack. Weeks after the discovery of the two bodies, Detectives Godden and McClellan had amassed an array of physical evidence, but were no closer to gathering any real clues as to the identity of the person responsible. There had been several alleged sightings of the girls prior to the discovery, and even a few after the time the girls had died. The trail was already cold when police became involved. Now it was becoming colder. In an attempt to try to shed new light on the investigation, Dr. Rod Milton, a forensic psychiatrist with over 20 years crime scene experience, was asked to consult on the case. Dr. Milton had previously aided police in the hunt and subsequent arrest of John Wayne Glover, the North Side serial killer who'd bashed and strangled six elderly women in 1989. The profile that Dr. Milton had provided to police was incredibly accurate, except for the age. Milton had suggested that the killer would be a teenager based on historical data which indicated the most serious offenses against aged victims were committed by persons under 20. His analysis, although slightly inaccurate, led to Glover's capture. Glover was 59 years of age at the time of his arrest. The detectives drove Dr. Milton to Belangelo at his request. As he explained to them, even though he had access to the detailed police reports and photographs, he needed to view the crime scenes for himself so that he could get a feel for the way that the killer had approached his victims. He stepped from the car and walked to the two grave sites in turn. After wandering slowly around the area for some time, he sat quietly in the middle of the scene and thought about why the killer had chosen that particular site. Why did he leave the victims the way he did? What was his motivation? His first thought was that the killer was familiar with the area. From experience, he knew that killers very rarely operate in unfamiliar surroundings. This wasn't a crime of opportunity, but rather a planned murder. Walking between the two graves, he quizzed the police on the details of the investigation. What was found and where? He pondered the variations between the two deaths. Caroline Clark was killed in a cold and calculated fashion. 
The way that the article of clothing had been wrapped around her head indicated that the killer had done so to depersonalize her. The angle of the shots suggested that the first bullet may have been fired while she was kneeling. Her clothing was intact, except for her front-fastening bra, which was unclipped. The clothing on her lower body was in place at the time of death. This indicated to Milton that her killing was not sexually motivated, but more in the style of an execution. The single stab wound to her body, he believed, was inflicted after death as a final example of the killer's control over his victim, or perhaps the work of an accomplice. In fact, prior to Dr. Milton's involvement, police thought the murders to be the work of more than one killer. The manner in which Miss Clark's body was laid out with the arms above the head also suggested control and planning on the part of the killer, with the victim acting out the role of supplicant after death. In comparison, Joanne Walter's body and burial site indicated rage and uncontrolled frenzy. The disarray of the clothing, Milton thought, indicated more of a sexual attack. The shirt and bra had been pushed up, but the clasp was still fastened. The zipper of the jeans was undone, but the top button was done up. No panties were found on the body or in the area. Milton theorized that because the shoes were still on and laced up, the jeans had not been taken completely off. It was more likely that they were dragged down to enable the killer, or killers, to commit a sexual act, before or after death. The underwear may have been cut off and taken as a trophy. When asked by the police for a possible motive, the basis of most homicide investigations, Milton uttered a single word, pleasure. He believed that if there were two killers involved, one would be older and dominant. The other, although equally sadistic, would tend to be more submissive. He suggested that they could be brothers, sharing a common interest in guns and hunting, and had probably been involved in other sexually related crimes, either together or separately. Later, at his Sydney office, Dr. Milton recorded his profile in point form. The main offender, he believed, would live on the outskirts of a city in a semi-rural area, be employed in a semi-skilled job, probably out of doors, be involved in an unstable or unsatisfactory relationship, have a history of homosexuality or bisexual activity, have a history of aggression against authority, be aged in his mid-thirties, at no time did Dr. Milton give any indication that the deaths were the work of a serial killer. As the end of the year drew closer, the investigation team dwindled in size as the resources were redirected to other crimes. They knew that they would need some startling piece of evidence or a stroke of luck if they were to solve the riddle of the Belangelo killings. Bruce Pryor had been into the Belangelo forest many times over the years collecting firewood. It had become a special place for him. He knew many of the trails, yet there were still many parts of it that he'd not seen. As a local, he'd been watching the reports of the killings with more than a passing interest, and as a parent, he felt deeply for the families of the girls. He couldn't clear it from his mind, and during many trips to the forest, he found himself searching areas that he hadn't been to before without knowing why. The official search had been called off many months before, and the investigation was almost non-existent. The last mention of the case had been a public meeting in the Boral Town Hall that had been organized by police as a means of jogging the memories of local residents, as they still believed that the killer lived close to the forest. The meeting mentioned other young backpackers who were still unaccounted for. For days after, the thought of more young bodies in the forest tormented him, interrupting his work in his sleep. He set out one morning with no real intention of going to Belangelo, but found himself drawn to the area. He turned down a track that he'd been to before, but instead of driving to the end of it as he usually did, he turned into a small side track called the Maurice Fire Trail. He drove down it and came to a T intersection. He knew the right arm led to a track called Searley's Exit Fire Trail, but he'd never been down the left hand track. The track soon opened up onto a bare rocky area. To one side of it was a small fireplace built from bush rocks. He got out of his vehicle and wandered slowly around the area, still not sure of why he was there. In a clearing about 150 feet from his car, he stopped and stared at the ground, his heart pounding in his chest. There at his feet was a large bone. It looked human. 
He shook his head, trying to think clearly. Maybe it was from a kangaroo. Tentatively, he lifted the bone and measured it against his own thigh. It was the same length. One end of the bone had teeth marks on it. Maybe it was an animal bone. He lay the bone back down where he'd found it and walked further ahead. He walked up an incline, scanning the ground, hoping to find the rest of a kangaroo skeleton. At the top of the ridge, he turned and walked back to his car, but changed direction slightly, walking through an area overgrown with weeds. A flash of white caught his eye. Parting the tangled undergrowth, he saw a sight that raised the hair on the back of his neck. The lifeless eye sockets of a human skull stared up at him. It was small, possibly an older child or a female. Part of the lower jaw was broken away, and as he looked closer, he saw a thin cut in the forehead. It looked like a knife wound. He was unsure of what to do next. Afraid that no one would believe him, he took the skull back to his car and wrapped it in a cloth and drove out of the forest. As he neared the entrance, he saw a vehicle near a small hut that was used by the orienteering club. Bruce approached the hut and spoke to John Springett, a local builder who was doing maintenance on the hut. Do you have a phone here? he asked. I have a mobile in the truck. Why? What's up? Bruce told him of his discovery. We better call the police. John got a phone book from the clubhouse and Bruce rang Bowral Detectives. He got no answer. He tried the police station instead. I found parts of a skeleton in Belangelo Forest, he told them. Half an hour later, two uniformed officers arrived at the hut. What have you got for me? One of them asked. It's in the car, Pryor answered. He led them to his vehicle and unwrapped his find. The young constable, obviously the one who had taken the call, seemed surprised that it really was a skull. He placed a radio call to the duty detectives, Peter Lovell and Stephen Murphy, who arrived shortly after. They asked Pryor to show them where he'd found the skull. After studying the area for a short time, Detective Murphy walked further on. 120 feet into the forest, he stopped and looked down. He walked back to where his partner stood talking to Bruce Pryor about the skeleton. There's a pair of sand shoes sticking out of a pile of brush back there, he declared casually. They both looked warily at Pryor, curious as to why he came to this particular location. Several radio calls later, the search was back on. News of the discovery of additional bodies in the forest spread quickly. TV network helicopters hovered overhead. Reporters and film crews were lined up at the access road trying to gain entry. They speculated as to the identities of the latest victims. Was it the German couple, or maybe the couple from Victoria? They asked detectives at the scene. The investigators said nothing. Their minds were occupied with their own questions. Had they called off the search too early? Were they searching the wrong areas? How many more bodies were there? One of the searchers found a floppy black felt hat near one of the grave sites. The Sydney Missing Persons Office was contacted, and a review of files indicated that it may have belonged to James Gibson, a young Victorian who was last seen hitchhiking south of the forest in the company with a female friend, Deborah Everest, also from Victoria. They had been missing since 1989. Police had earlier discounted Gibson as a possible victim, after his backpack and camera had been found lying beside the road 78 miles north of Belangelo in another small forest area called Gulston Gorge. Police were puzzled. If one of the victims was Gibson, how did his property get to the other side of Sydney? Further investigation of the report indicated that when the pack and camera had been found, they'd been leaning against a guardrail in plain view on the side of a busy road. Were they placed there by the killer in an attempt to divert attention from the southern forest? Crime scene police worked into the night to complete their preliminary investigation and left the scene under heavy police guard. The following day, scientific officers Gross and Goldie returned to the grave sites in company with Dr. Bradhurst and a forensic odontologist, Dr. Chris Griffiths. Both of the bodies were skeletons. However, both were incomplete. Several bones had been scattered across the site, possibly by animal activity. Beside the first body, Gross found a silver fob chain, a bracelet set with semi-precious stones, and a silver crucifix. Given the find and the smaller size of the skeleton, 
it was presumed to be female. The second skeleton was larger and still had a pair of white sneakers laced to the feet. Dr. Griffiths examined the skull and, after cleaning dirt from it, compared the teeth with a dental chart that had been supplied to police earlier. It was a positive match. The body was that of James Gibson. Positive identification of the second body would come later, but police were almost certain that it was Deborah Everest. The remains were carefully removed and taken to the Sydney morgue for reconstruction and post-mortem examination. As well as the skeletons, several bags of decayed matter from the immediate area were also taken. It was not known for sure if they contained vegetable matter, or decayed clothing, or both. One of the items from James Gibson's remains was easy to identify. It was the complete zipper from a pair of jeans. The zip was open, the top button still fastened. The following day, Dr. Bradhurst began the task of reconstructing the skeletons in anatomical order. The bones had been boiled in a special solution to clean the skeleton and make any injuries easier to identify. Dr. Bradhurst began with what was left of James Gibson. The decayed matter that accompanied his remains was sifted and found to contain several hand and foot bones, some jewelry, and buttons. As the remains began to take shape, the extent of the wounds became clearer. One stab wound had penetrated the mid-thoracic spine, slicing upwards through three vertebrae, splitting the canal holding the spinal column. As with the previous bodies, the wound would have paralyzed the victim first. To do so much damage to a young, healthy body would have taken great physical strength. Two stab wounds had punctured the breastbone, with cuts to the ribs indicating two more wounds to the left and right sides of the front of the chest and two more in the upper back. Seven major wounds marked the skeleton. Many more could have penetrated the body without touching bone. The stab wounds and the breastbone were measured. They were very close to the size of the wounds inflicted to Walters and Clark. The second smaller skeleton was in poorer condition. Part of the jaw was broken away. Several fractures were found at the base of the skull. Four slash marks to the forehead, two on each side, were not deep enough to have been fatal, but had etched into the skull at the hairline. A further stab wound had penetrated the lower back close to the spine. While Bradhurst was completing his examination, crime scene analysts were combing the grave sites for further clues. Thirty feet from the body, they found a black bra with a stab wound through one of the cuffs. Later, a pair of grey tights was found under leaf litter close to the female gravesite. They had been tied with a loop at either end, possibly used as a primitive restraint. Later that day, the female remains were confirmed by dental charts as being those of Deborah Everest. Superintendent Clive Small was deputized by Commissioner of Police Tony Lauer to take over control of the investigation. His first task was to combine the individual groups of detectives involved in the investigation into one cohesive unit. Small was an experienced detective with a reputation for being thorough and, more importantly, objective. He was well respected in the department and the courts for his dedication, his ability to separate the facts from the bulk of erroneous information, and to present those facts in a meticulously detailed fashion. The investigation was officially named Task Force Air. The name was intended to be Air, named after a salt lake in the centre of Australia, in keeping with the department's tradition of using geographical place names. The name had been subsequently misspelled in a press release as Air and quickly became the official title. Small appointed as his second in charge the equally talented and meticulous Detective Inspector Rod Lynch. Lynch's job was to set up and coordinate the Sydney headquarters of the investigation, while Small, based near the forest in Borrell, would oversee the on-site investigation. Lynch was faced with a challenge almost from the beginning. The building that was allocated as his headquarters was a converted factory that had once been the home of Sydney's criminal investigation branch. Having laid idle since the CIB had relocated to larger premises, it was in a bad state of repair. It had no phones, air conditioning, computers, furniture, and the plumbing was substandard. After solving these and other logistical problems, he began recruiting detectives for the task of following up on the many thousands of pieces of information that had already been received. The next task was to set up a public hotline in cooperation with the media 
which would appeal to the general public for any information regarding the events in the forest. From his broad experience in major investigations, Lynch knew that this would increase his team's workload dramatically, but would be the most valuable resource of real evidence as opposed to the circumstantial evidence that had already been collected. Small called off the examination of the forest for several days to enable him to view maps and surveys of the area and plan a more expansive search of the general area. Chief Inspector Bob May from the Tactical Support Unit was put in charge of the search team. He divided a map in the main forest area into grids, every inch representing 750 square feet. Forty officers walked each grid side by side, examining every inch of the forest floor. If anything of interest was found, they would shout, find, and scientific police would come forward, take photographs, mark the position on the map, and bag any evidence found. The search was further enhanced by teams of dogs that had been specially trained to detect the presence of phosphorus and nitrogen in the soil. A decaying body will emit traces of these chemicals long after death. The dogs had been used extensively in the United States to sniff out old Civil War graves. Meanwhile, another search was underway. The bullets and shell casings taken from the scene, having been positively identified as being from a Ruger repeating rifle, were the only positive leads that could link the killer to the scene. From their inquiries, police learned that over 50,000 such rifles had been imported into Australia between 1964 and 1982. The manufacturers provided a list of their distributors in Australia, who in turn provided a list of the gun shops who had purchased them. While gun shops were required by law to keep a record of each firearm sold, there was no such legal requirement for any subsequent private sales of the firearms. Police were faced with a needle-in-a-haystack scenario. A list of all such weapons owned by residents in the areas surrounding the forest was drawn up with the intention of impounding the rifles for test firings in an attempt to find a match. The plan was leaked to the press, which infuriated investigators, as they believed that the killer, upon hearing the news, would dump the murder weapon. Members of the local gun club were contacted and their weapons examined. One of the members told the detectives that a friend of his had witnessed something suspicious in the forest the previous year. Police later contacted the man who gave them an incredibly accurate description of two vehicles, one a Ford sedan and the other a four-wheel drive that he saw driving down one of the trails into the forest. He told them that as the first vehicle passed him, he looked in and saw a man driving and in the back seat were two other men. Between them was a female with a cloth tied around her head like a gag. In the second vehicle were two men, one driving and the other sitting in the back next to another female who was also bound. He gave police detailed descriptions of all the occupants, including clothing, coloring, and approximate ages. He stated that at the time, he'd written down the details of the number plate of the second vehicle on a scrap of cardboard, but had since lost it. Police typed out an official statement and asked him to read it, and, if he agreed with the details, sign it. He signed his name, Alex Millat. Twenty-six days had passed since Deborah Everest's body had been found in the forest. The searchers were tired. They covered most of the allotted search area and were now entering the final gridded section three miles east of the last grave. Confidence was running high to the point that the police public relations section were already compiling a press release expressing the opinion that no further bodies would be found in the Belangelo forest. The search team leader, Sergeant Jeff Trichter, led the searchers into a small clearing. A pair of pink women's jeans and a length of blue and yellow rope lay in plain view. Next to them was an empty 22 bullet packet. The find was not unusual as a lot of strange items had been found that were seemingly unrelated. Moving deeper into the clearing, they found more articles. Empty drink cans riddled with bullet holes, a length of wire bent into loops, cartridge cases, and empty bottles. At the edge of the clearing, Sergeant Trichter saw something that fired warning signals into his brain. A primitive fireplace. Knowing that the final part of the search was going to be intensive, Trichter decided to give his men a lunch break and spend the rest of the day in the area. No sooner had they resumed when one of the men called, Find. The line stopped and Trichter walked to the edge of the rocky outcrop where Senior Constable Rullis stood with his arm raised. 
It was a bone, and it looked human. Ten feet further on, at the base of a pile of timber, lay a skull. The site was marked, and the crime scene squad was summoned by radio. Beyond the timber lay the now-familiar pile of sticks and brush. Protruding from one end of it was a large bone inside a brown leather hiking boot. Searchers spread out and scoured the area around the grave, but no further remains were found. John Goldie, the senior crime scene investigator, identified the remains as female. She appeared to be alone. A distinctive purple headband was found on the skull. That and the clothing found near the body, after comparisons with missing persons reports, indicated that the skeleton was all that remained of missing German girl Simone Schmidl. The other items mentioned in the report, a large backpack and other camping equipment, were not found. Dr. Chris Griffiths, the forensic odontologist, was summoned to the scene and shortly after he arrived with his file of dental charts, the body was officially identified as Simone. The young adventurous girl, who her family and friends had called Simi, had been last seen on January 20th, 1991 in Liverpool, west of Sydney, hitchhiking south. The confident and seasoned traveler, who had seen much of the world, ended her days in a lonely forest thousands of miles away from the safety and security of her home. In Germany, Simone's parents heard the news in the worst possible way, on the radio. They contacted German police for confirmation, and even though Australian authorities had advised them of the discovery, the German police department did not confirm the identification until more than two weeks after Simone's remains had been flown home and buried. The original press release was aborted, and another sent out in its place. It basically said that the police now believe that there were more bodies in the forest. Speculation was rife that the next bodies found would be those of the two Germans who were still unaccounted for. Simone's body was found still partially dressed, with her shirt and underclothing pushed up around the neck. A pair of green shorts hung on the pelvis with the cord ties undone. Several items of jewelry and two coins were found next to the body. The pink jeans were not Simone's, but matched the description of a pair worn by another German girl, Anja Habstied. She and her boyfriend Gabor Negebauer had been missing since December 1991. Two days later, as the search continued, the remains were transported to Sydney for the post-mortem. Dr. Bradhurst examined the almost complete skeleton. He had no doubt that it was the work of the same killer. There was no injury to the skull. The chest and back showed numerous stab wounds to the left and right sides, front and back, including the telltale knife thrusts to the spinal area, which had severed the spinal column completely. No sooner was he completing his grisly task than he was summoned back to the forest. The message was simple. We found two more. Dr. Bradhurst and Dr. Griffiths were conveyed to the scene by police helicopter and taken to the site of the new graves, which lay 150 feet apart at the very edge of the prescribed search area, denoted on the map as Area A. Dr. Griffiths had in his possession the dental charts for the boy, Gabor. The charts for his companion, Anya, had not arrived from Germany. Gabor's remains were under a pile of brush partially covered by a large log. It took several burly police officers to lift it away from the grave. Dr. Griffiths confirmed Gabor's identity. His skeleton was complete with the remains of decayed clothing evident, including a pair of jeans with the zip opened and the top button fastened. The second body, although not officially confirmed as Anya's, was that of a young female. The upper clothing was bunched up around the shoulders, and no lower clothing was found on or near the body. The pink jeans had been found some distance away. The female skeleton had one striking feature. The head and the first two vertebrae were missing. No other wounds were evident. On closer examination, Dr. Bradhurst deduced that the head had been severed from the body cleanly by a sharp instrument possibly a machete or sword. The angle of the cut indicated that the victim had probably been in a kneeling position with her head down when the cut was made. It showed all the signs of some form of ritual decapitation. The task force commander, Clive Small, gave a short media interview near the gravesites. 
He told reporters that following the discovery of the new bodies, that they were now looking for a serial killer. It came as no surprise. The media had been reporting that opinion since the investigation began. Back at the morgue, Dr. Bradhurst examined Gabor's remains. The mouth contained two gags, one that had been tied across the mouth using a reef knot. The other had been placed in the mouth prior to the other being tied. Even though Bradhurst had performed all of the autopsies, he still retained the details of them all in his mind. One thing that didn't escape his attention was the fact that this gag was tied with a different knot. The last gag used, the one on Joanne Walter's body, had been tied in a simple overhand or granny knot. The size of the cloth in the mouth cavity made strangulation very likely. Supportive to this theory was the fractured hyoid bone in the throat, which is usually an indication of manual strangulation. The jaw was fractured in several places. The skull showed six bullet entry wounds, three from the left rear and the others from the lower rear. One exit wound was found on the right side. Gerald Dutton, the ballistics investigator on the case, was present when the examination of the skull took place. Four bullets were recovered from inside the skull. A fifth bullet was recovered from the bones of the upper body. Dutton had found no fired cases near the body, and the angle and alignment of the entry wounds versus the exit wounds indicated that seven bullets had been fired into the skull. When found, the skull had been lying on its side, but after searching the soil under the grave, no spent bullets were recovered. Gabor had not been killed at the gravesite. Later, several fired bullets and empty cartridge packets would be found near the new graves. Over 90 fired cases were found scattered around the area. After examination under a comparison microscope, the cases and bullets were positively identified as the same as those found at the Walters site. The ballistic evidence showed conclusively that the same weapon that murdered Joanne Walters had been used only 200 feet from Anya and Gabor's remains. Dr. Bradhurst completed the examination of Anya's skeleton and found no other evidence of additional wounds. Most horrifying was the fact that the seven had died in various ways. They had been either beaten, strangled, shot, stabbed, and decapitated, and almost certainly sexually molested in some way, male and female alike. Given the extent of the injuries and the various methods used to inflict them, the investigation team deduced that the killer, or killers, spent more time with each victim as the crimes progressed. This fact indicated that, apart from being cruel and sadistic, the perpetrator was a calculating and confident individual. Paul Onions had arrived in Australia, eager to see the country about which he'd heard so much. He stayed at a modest backpacker hotel in Sydney's King's Cross, spending his time seeing the sights and generally having a good time partying with friends. As his money dwindled, his thoughts turned to part-time work. His visa was good for six months, but his money looked like it was running out before that time expired. He asked around the city, but found casual work hard to come by. One of his friends suggested fruit picking. After making further inquiries, he learned that most of the work on offer was in the Riverina district, several hundred miles to the south. He decided to save the cost of the fare by taking the train to Liverpool, southwest of Sydney, and hitchhiking from there. On the 25th of January, 1990, he set out early for the station and was soon standing on the side of the Hume Highway in Liverpool, waiting for a ride. The heat was searing as he stood trying to flag down a suitable southbound vehicle. His only possessions were a small pack containing a Sony Walkman, a camera, and several items of clothing. He walked south, trying desperately to thumb a ride. Stopping at a small shopping center, he bought a drink and was seriously contemplating returning to the hostel when a fit, well-muscled man approached him and asked, in a distinctive Australian accent, You need a lift? Paul told him his destination and accepted his offer of a ride gladly. The two men climbed into the stranger's four-wheel drive vehicle and headed south. The first thing Paul noticed about the man, apart from his muscular build, was his long Zapata-styled mustache. They talked for a while and Paul introduced himself, and the man told him his name was Bill. Paul's newfound friend was full of questions. Where are you from? 
When you do back, who knows you're here? What's your occupation? So many questions, but Bill seemed friendly enough, so Paul answered them. Bill told Paul that he worked on the roads, was from a Yugoslavian family, lived near Liverpool, and was divorced. They drove for an hour, and Bill's demeanor began to change. His language became more aggressive and critical. He became agitated and launched into a racist tirade about gooks and pommies, and shortly after became morose and refused to talk. By mid-afternoon, after leaving the southern town of Mittagong, Paul noticed that Bill was acting strangely, varying his speed and looking in the rearview mirror every few seconds. Paul, feeling tired and drained from the trip, began to feel uneasy. Bill leaned forward, adjusting the radio, and said, I think I'll pull over and get some tapes from the back. As they pulled up on the side of the freeway, Paul looked down and noticed a tray full of tape cassettes in the front console between the seats. As Bill got out, Paul decided to get out as well. Get back in the car, Bill told him, his voice full of menace. Not wanting to alarm him any further, Paul complied. As soon as they got back in the car, Bill reached under the driver's seat, pulled out a large black revolver, and pointed it at Paul. This is a robbery, he said. Again, he reached under the seat and produced a coil of rope. Paul, highly alarmed, tried to reason with Bill. What's going on? What are you doing? he asked. He was told in a firm but controlled manner, shut up and put your seatbelt back on. Paul, scared out of his wits, started to obey, but instead grabbed for the door handle and leapt to the ground. Paul ran away from the car, hearing the words, stop or I'll shoot, from behind him. Panicking, he ran into the oncoming traffic, causing cars to swerve alarmingly, trying to avoid this madman on the road. Briefly, he looked back, expecting to see Bill chasing him. Instead, he saw him standing casually by his vehicle, grinning. Get back here, you, he called. Paul managed to flag down a van. As it slowed, he ran to the grass dividing strip in the middle of the highway. Bill lunged at him from behind, tackling him to the ground. Paul managed to break free and ran to the van and threw himself in front of it. The driver, Joanne Barry, a local resident, slammed on the brakes and before she could protest, Paul leapt inside the van, screaming, He's got a gun! Help me! Joanne, against her better judgment, drove away. In the car were her sister and four children. She feared for their safety and was about to ask him to get out. She looked into his face and, seeing his look of terror, decided to take him to the nearest police station, which was in the opposite direction. As she turned the van around, she noticed the other man running back to his car. He looked like he was carrying something. Anxious to put some distance between them, she accelerated rapidly. When they reached Mittagong Police Station, it was closed. They drove on to the next town, Borel. Paul related his story to Constable Janet Nicholson at the front desk, describing his attacker, the vehicle, and the pack he'd left behind. He detailed its contents, including his passport and return ticket to England. After filling out a detailed report, Constable Nicholson circulated the man's description and the details of his vehicle via radio and advised Paul to return to the hostel. He explained his financial predicament and was given $20. She explained to him that without a registration number, they had very little chance of locating the suspect vehicle. He went to the British High Commission when he returned to Sydney to replace his passport and to borrow additional funds. He got the passport, but no cash. A woman waiting behind him felt sorry for him and gave him $20. He was amazed at her generosity. Weeks later, after deciding to stay in Australia, he found a well-paying job. His girlfriend arrived from England shortly after, and they traveled around the north of Australia for a few weeks, then left for home. After arriving home, Paul attempted to settle back into a normal life, but over the next year, had trouble sleeping and developed a string of mysterious illnesses. Several years later, Paul learned of the discovery of the bodies near where he was attacked. The thought chilled him to the bone as he relived the incident in his mind. Back in Australia, the investigation was still dragging on. Over 200 police still searched the forest. At the task force headquarters, thousands of calls regarding the events in Belangelo poured in every week. 
Two such calls in particular were interesting. One was from a woman who claimed her boyfriend worked with a man who she thought should be checked out. He owned a property near the forest, drove a four-wheel drive, and owned a lot of guns. His name was Ivan Milat. The second call was from Joanne Berry, who described the time that she had picked up Paul Onions after his attack. These, like the other calls, had to be recorded and entered into an extensive computer database, which was becoming increasingly overloaded. In short, they were buried under the weight of the many crank calls and alleged sightings. Paul Onions called the Australian High Commission and was given the hotline number of the task force. On the 13th of November, 1993, he told the officer who answered the telephones the details of his attack in 1990 and was asked why he hadn't reported it then. When he replied that he had, he expected the officer to ask him where and when and the name of the officer he spoke to. Instead, he was thanked for the information and the call was terminated. When he didn't hear any word weeks later, he decided that his report was of no value and did his best to clear his mind of it. The official search of the forest was suspended on the 17th of November, 1993. No more bodies or additional evidence had been found. By December 1993, it was apparent that although an enormous amount of information had been compiled, the investigation wasn't progressing at an acceptable rate. 10,000 running sheets had been assembled, mostly by hand. Of the thousands of calls received over the hotline, police had produced a list of 2,000 persons of interest that callers had suggested may have committed the crimes or had some knowledge of them. The sheer volume of data overloaded the computer system. The program called TIMS, Task Force Information Management System, was made up of multiple databases that stored the information in various subject areas. However, it was unable to cross-reference more than a single inquiry because the system had not been designed to handle the volume and complexities involved in an investigation of such magnitude. The decision was taken to introduce a new program, which would be more powerful and flexible enough to handle the task. This meant long weeks of data entry and compilation, which meant all data received in the meantime would have to be processed by hand. Detective Senior Constable Gagan, the senior analyst for the task force, assembled his team and began the long, grueling process. Every file had to be read, assessed, and set aside to be entered into an appropriate section of the database at a later time. One such file came to the attention of the analysis team because of the unusual surname of the person involved. The name was Onions, Paul Onions. They read the report and added it to the lead file for further attention. Several weeks later, a similar report came to light. It was Joanne Berry's statement regarding the Onions incident. It, too, was filed for further attention. Early in the new year, 37 detectives were working full-time on the investigation. The main focus was tracking down the suspect firearm and ammunition used in the offenses. Two of the new detectives assigned to the case, Senior Constables Gordon and McCluskey, were given the job of following up on a file that contained three separate leads. Gordon looked at the name on the file folder. Millat. Lynn Butler and Paul Douglas were interviewed and confirmed their earlier statements. The third lead was from the woman whose boyfriend had worked with Ivan Millat, but as she hadn't given her name, Douglas decided to go to the company in question, ReadyMix, and ask about Millat. Richard and Ivan Millat had both worked there at one time. They learned that Ivan had been a hard worker and was highly respected. Richard, on the other hand, was remembered as being crazy and unpredictable. Timesheets were requested for both men, but when matched up later with the approximate times and dates of the offenses, Richard was found to have been working on every occasion. However, his brother Ivan had been away from work when each of the murders had taken place. Gordon felt that Milat was fast becoming the prime suspect but when he raised the subject with his superiors, he was told, get more evidence. Gordon searched criminal records and found that Ivan Milat had been found guilty of committing various offenses and had served several years in prison. None of the offenses indicated that he was a potential serial killer. After digging further through the archives, he found something that really aroused his suspicion. In 1971, 
Ivan had picked up two girls hitchhiking from Liverpool to Melbourne and had allegedly raped one of them. Both girls testified that he was armed with a large knife and carried a length of rope. He was later acquitted when the prosecution case was dismissed as unproven. Gordon and McCluskey again went to their superiors to request phone taps on Milat's house and to have listening devices installed in his car. Clive Small refused. Gordon was not impressed. Small had made the correct decision. The law was very firm on the subject of electronic surveillance. It was only to be used when all other methods of acquiring evidence had been exhausted. He also knew, from long experience, that although one suspect stood out, to build a strong case, they would have to investigate and eliminate any other suspects. Several days later, he assigned four detectives, including Gordon and McCluskey, to work full-time following up the Milat leads and also arranging for surveillance team, known as the Dog Squad, to follow Milat and watch his house. The Milat team began the extensive task of interviewing, checking, and cross-checking statements and amassing evidence. It was a task that would occupy them for several months. For Detective Gordon, it was a frustrating time, but he was still quietly confident that they were close to their man. To strengthen his investigation team, Superintendent Small began to assemble a team of experts to examine the motives and state of mind of the type of person that would have committed these hideous crimes. Knowing that the end result of the long and protracted saga that the case had become would be a trial of epic proportions, Small wanted the opinions of several experienced professionals to further enhance and support the weight of evidence. The police psychiatrist, Dr. Rod Milton, was essential to the proceedings. Since the beginning of the case, he'd studied and reviewed every shred of information as it came to hand. He watched carefully as his original profile began to take realistic shape. Small's second choice was Dr. Richard Basham, the Dean of Anthropology at Sydney University. Basham, an American, had assisted police previously with investigations of Asian crime in Australia. His forte was psychological anthropology, but he was well-versed in experimental and clinical psychology. Milton and Basham were wary of each other at first, but came to respect each other's abilities very quickly. Another member was Bob Young, a trained sociologist and computer analyst. His expertise was in research methods and was very experienced in the handling of large amounts of data. Small still believed that the killer lived somewhere in the Southern Highlands, the region that incorporated Belangelo. His plan was to organize a door-to-door -door survey of the entire area in search of the murder weapon. The panel disagreed. They reasoned that police resources were stretched to the limit as it was. Most of them felt, particularly Basham, that the person and or weapons that they sought was mentioned somewhere in the mountain of information that had already been received. As the group reviewed some of the files, one particular statement, Alex Millat's, was mentioned. Small told them of the depth of detail it contained and suggested that the person who gave it must possess a photographic memory. Basham suggested that to retain such detail could also mean that he might have been part of the events that he had recalled so well. It was an interesting theory. Basham was also of the opinion that more than one person was involved, probably a brother. When part of the ballistic evidence was presented, the panel discussed the scratches that were found on some of the spent projectiles, possibly caused by a crude silencer. Well, a silencer could mean that this man is living in a fantasy world, Basham said. He probably owns a motorcycle too. He considers himself an outlaw. Milton agreed. He went back to the brothers' theory. We could be looking for a group of brothers who spend their time in the forests shooting cans and wounding animals and generally showing off with each other. Small's ears pricked up. We have a family just like that on file, he said. Well, watch them closely, Basham replied. One or more of them could be who you're looking for. The discussion turned to the probable location of the killer. Milton suggested that the killer might not live in the immediate vicinity, but may visit the area regularly and could even own or rent a property nearby. After studying maps, they deduced that the killer would most probably live in an area to the north, close to the Hume Highway. 
the fact that all the victims had, at some stage, been seen at or near Liverpool and their bodies found in Belangelo Forest strengthened that theory. The members of the panel were unaware of the interest the police were taking in the Millat family. In fact, their name hadn't been mentioned during the briefing. Small knew that they still had a long way to go to build a case, but couldn't help thinking how closely the Millat family matched the theories. The painstaking search for supportive evidence continued through to March 1994. The Milat team obtained records of all premises and vehicles that the Milats had owned in the past. They found that three of the Milat brothers owned a small property on the Wambayan Caves Road, 25 miles from Belangelo. In addition, one vehicle found was a silver Nissan Patrol four-wheel drive that had been owned by Ivan Milat. The new owner was interviewed and showed police a bullet that he'd found under the driver's seat. It was a 22 caliber and was later analyzed and found to be consistent with the empty boxes found in Area A and cartridge cases found at the Clark and Walters gravesites. Milat had sold the vehicle two months after the bodies of the two English girls had been discovered. Detective Gordon and his team were uncovering numerous pieces of evidence, but still needed something to tie it all together. Additional evidence that would put Ivan Milat in his vehicle in the area at the time of the offenses. They tried using the new computer database in the hope of finding the match that they were looking for, but after entering keywords such as silver four-wheel drive, Liverpool, and hitchhiker, no matches were found. The system was better than the previous one, but was still not capable of providing the information that was required. They began the unenviable task of sorting through the boxes of reports by hand, some still not entered into the database. The job took weeks. Finally, on the 13th of April, Gordon found the note regarding Paul Onion's call to the hotline five months earlier. He read the report describing the events of January 1990, and as he read, he realized that if this man was a credible witness, his testimony could give them the link that they were looking for. Onion's statement described the vehicle, the area where the attack was committed, and the driver. Gordon took his newfound evidence directly to Superintendent Small. Small was furious. How had such an important piece of evidence been overlooked? He immediately called for the original report from Boro Police, but it was missing from their files. Fortunately, Constable Nicholson had taken a full report in her notebook which provided more details than the original statement. Knowing that Richard and Ivan Milat were similar in appearance, police checked the two men's work records and confirmed with their employers that Richard had been working on the day of the attack, but Ivan had not. In addition, while checking Ivan's work records, they found that he'd been working in the Galston Gorge area at the time when James Gibson's pack had been found. Several of Ivan's workmates were interviewed and told of his interest in guns. One friend of Ivan's, Tony Serra, told police that Milat had owned a motorcycle and a four-wheel drive Nissan. He told them the story of the time he and Ivan were on the way to a job and drove past the Belangelo forest. You wouldn't believe what's in there, Ivan had said. But when Sarah pressed him for details, Ivan just smiled and said nothing more. At the end of April, Paul Onions received an important telephone call from Australia. Detective Stuart Wilkins told him that he was an important witness in the backpacker case and could he fly to Sydney as soon as possible? He was totally confused. From the beginning, he'd felt that the Australian police had no real interest in him or his story. Now, all of a sudden, he was their star witness? What had taken them so long? A week later, he was being driven out of Sydney towards Liverpool by police who wanted him to get his bearings before they interviewed him further. As they drove through Liverpool, he pointed out the small shop where he had met Bill. The shop, a news agency, was called Lombardo's. After they had driven further south along the expressway, Onions told them, This is wrong. We went through a town. You must be mistaken, they answered. There's no towns on this road. Police later discovered that at the time of the attack on Onions, January 1990, the expressway had not been completed and the Hume Highway had originally gone through the center of Mittagong. As they approached the attack site, Onions began to feel uneasy. He detailed the conversation, his voice trembling as he spoke about the tapes, the gun, and the rope. 
he pointed out approximately where he'd escaped. It was less than a mile from the entrance to the forest. The next day, he was shown a video lineup of a group of suspects. For purposes of identification, each image was individually numbered 1 to 13. Onions was left alone to view the images as many times as he liked. He was told to take his time. He felt strange. Four years had passed since the attack, and here he was, looking for the man who did it. He looked through the tape again and again. Two images seemed to stand out, number four and seven. He kept looking. A short time later, he called the detectives and pointed to the single image on his screen. That's him, number four. Are you sure? He was spooked by their question. I better take another look. He ran through the tape several times more and finally declared, Yes, I'm sure. The man who attacked me is number four. Paul Onions had positively identified Ivan Milat. Small was immediately informed and, after consultation with Lynch, he made his decision. They now had sufficient evidence to arrest Ivan Milat for the assault on Paul Onions. As well as the arrest warrant, they applied for search warrants of Ivan Milat's home in Eaglevale, a suburb just off the Hume Highway and a few short miles from Liverpool. On the premise that Ivan hadn't acted alone, police also applied for search warrants to search the houses of Ivan's mother and his brothers, Richard, Walter, and Bill. The property near the forest was also to be searched, as was the home of Alex Milat, who had moved to a town called Wombai, which was located several hours' drive north, near Brisbane, Queensland. All warrants were granted. The logistics of organizing multiple raids across two states were daunting. Over 300 police would be involved. To maintain secrecy, most of them would not be informed of the location and timing of the raids until just before the event. The raid on Ivan's house was codenamed Air One. As Ivan Malat's hours of work were erratic, it was decided to raid his house at 6.30 a.m. on the 22nd of May, 1994, a Sunday. Fifty police, including members of the heavily armed State Protection Group, general duty officers and police negotiators, were assembled at 2 a.m. at Campbelltown Police Station. Campbelltown was halfway between Liverpool and Ivan's house. Present at the early morning briefing, besides Small and Lynch, was Dr. Rod Milton. He briefed the chief negotiator, Wayne Gordon, on how best to approach Ivan, who was to be contacted by telephone after the premises had been surrounded. Milton suggested that Gordon use a firm and authoritative tone, as he believed that Milat would try to take control of the situation. Surveillance police had reported that Ivan's girlfriend, Chalinder Hughes, was also in the house. The plan was to calmly ask them to come out of the house, affect the arrest, and search the premises. At precisely 6.36 a.m., the team was in place. Detective Gordon dialed Ivan's number. A male voice answered, when asked if he was Ivan Milat, he answered, no. Gordon confirmed the address. It was correct. Gordon then introduced himself and advised Ivan the police were stationed around the property, were in possession of a search warrant, intended to gain entry and search the premises in relation to an armed assault. He advised Milat to come out with his girlfriend and surrender to police. Ivan mumbled something and hung up. After several minutes, nothing had happened. Mindful of the guns that Milat was known to possess, police were reluctant to storm the house. The presence of his girlfriend was also a prohibitive factor. Gordon again dialed the house and spoke to Milat a second time. When Gordon asked him why he hadn't come out as requested, Ivan replied that he thought it was a joke. Gordon convinced him that it was no joke. Several minutes later, the front door of number 22 Cinnabar Street, Eagles Vale, opened and Ivan Milat and Chalinder Hughes stepped onto the front lawn and were taken into custody by two members of the State Protection Group. Several more of the group entered the house and swept the house for other occupants. After the premises were secured, the search began. Ivan was handcuffed and advised of his rights. He was also advised that he was to be questioned in relation to seven bodies that had been recovered from the Belangalof State Forest. In reply, Milat said, I don't know what you're talking about. The specialist search team was comprised of Gerald Dutton, the ballistics expert, Andy Gross, the senior crime scene investigator, and two other detectives. They began a methodical search of the four-bedroom house. At the other premises, the additional raids had gone smoothly. 
police were beginning to search each of the homes at virtually the same time. The first item found in Ivan's house was a postcard. He was asked who it was from. He replied that it was from a friend in New Zealand. It began with the words, Hi Bill. Ivan was asked if he was also known as Bill. He replied, No, it must have been a mistake. When a bullet was found in one of the bedrooms, police asked Ivan if he owned any firearms. He said that he didn't. When asked about the bullet, he said it was left from when he went shooting with his brother. The rooms were searched one at a time. In the second bedroom, two sleeping bags were found in a wardrobe. They were later identified as belonging to Simone Schmidl and Devra Everest. In one of the other bedrooms, a bag was found containing several personal items that indicated that it was Ivan's work bag. He confirmed that fact to police. Also in the bag was a Bowie-style knife, 12 inches long. In the same bedroom was a technical manual for the road-making machine that Ivan operated at work. Inside it was a small book that sparked Dutton's interest. It was an owner's instruction manual for a Ruger 22 caliber rifle. Ivan refused to comment on the find. A photo album contained a photograph of a Harley-Davidson motorcycle and a holster. In the holster was what looked to Dutton like a Colt 45 handgun. It was the type that Onions had described. A box of 45 ammunition was later found in Ivan's bedroom. One other framed photograph showed Chalinder Hughes wearing a striped Benetton top. It was identical to a top that Carolyn Clark owned. The garage, which was attached to the house, was next. On a rack of portable shelving against a wall, a nylon sleeping bag cover was found. It contained a rolled tent. Wrapped around the tent was a purple headband, identical to the one found around Simone Schmidl's skull. Also in the bag was a homemade silencer. When Milat was taken into the garage and asked about the bag, he stated that he had never seen it before. The ceiling of the garage had a manhole which opened into the roof cavity. One team member climbed a ladder to search it. Nothing was found until the insulation material was removed. Tucked inside one of the wall cavities was a plastic bag. It contained what looked like gun parts. Dutton was summoned and identified the parts as being a complete breech block assembly a trigger, and a magazine. All were from a Ruger 22 rifle. Another object was below it in the cavity, but was beyond reach. Finally, after unsuccessfully trying to retrieve it, police resorted to cutting a hole in the adjoining wall and found that it was the rotary magazine from the same weapon. Millat was taken from the house and conveyed to Campbellton Police Station, where he was questioned. The entire interview was recorded on both video and audio tape. During the interview, Milat was evasive and uncooperative. The interview finished an hour later, and Ivan was then charged with the robbery and attempted murder of Paul Onions. Back at his house, police had found electrical tape, cable ties, and a bag of yellow and blue ropes similar to those found at the crime scenes. After searching more thoroughly inside a bedroom wardrobe, another part of the Ruger rifle was found hidden inside a leather work boot. More camping and cooking equipment was found in the kitchen pantry that belonged to Simone Schmidl. The police had hoped that they would find some evidence linking Milat to the murders, but were completely unprepared for the amount of property that was found. As the search progressed, more items came to light. A camera, which proved to be Carolyn Clark's, and a water canteen which had a scratched area on it as though a mark had been erased. Later, subjected to light analysis, the name Simi could be clearly seen. A fully loaded Browning automatic pistol was found wedged under the washing machine. At the other locations, more evidence was found. Rifles, shotguns, knives, crossbows, and an incredible amount of ammunition. Nearly all the camping gear belonging to the victims was found in the raids. The most disturbing find of all was unearthed in a locked cupboard in the house of Margaret Millet, Ivan's mother a long, curved cavalry sword. Gerald Dutton, the ballistics expert, had been working on the case since the first fired cases and bullets had been recovered from the forest. He worked long hours examining all the ballistic evidence and was eventually rewarded for his diligence. The fired cases and several of the bullets matched the Ruger 22 rifle that was found in Ivan Milat's home. Ivan Robert Marco Milat was charged with the murders of the seven backpackers and was committed to stand trial. 
At a bail hearing, several weeks after the arrest, Ivan dismissed his lawyer after being advised by his counsel to plead guilty. Ironically, it was the same lawyer that had won him an acquittal during the 1971 alleged rape trial. The trial was set down for June 1995. But Ivan Milat did not stand trial in June. In fact, it was almost a year before the case came to court. It was delayed while Milat's lawyers argued with the state's legal aid office over their rate of pay. Eventually, they accepted the original offer and were ready to go to trial. Ivan Milat sat passively in the courtroom as the jury filed in for the first day of the biggest murder trial in Australia's criminal history. The presiding judge, Justice David Hunt, asked the Crown Prosecutor to begin. Mark Tedeschi, QC, Queen's Counsel, made a brief opening statement during which he told the jury that Ivan Milat would be proven guilty of seven cruel murders, whether he had accomplices or not. He wasted no time in calling his first witness, Paul Onions. Milat stared at him as he took the witness stand, the hint of a faint smile on his lips. Onions positively identified Milat as the person who attacked him. Tedeschi led him through his evidence and Onions waited for Milat's defense counsel, Terry Martin, to attack his testimony during cross-examination. The attack did not come. A few points of identification were challenged, but not the scrutiny that he was expecting. After Onions stepped down, the parents of each of the victims were called to the stand one at a time. The courtroom was hushed as they spoke about the last time they'd seen their children alive. Some suppressed sobs, and others struggled to control the seething anger that they felt when they looked into the eyes of the monster that stood accused of murdering their children. The list continued as the evidence was presented. 356 exhibits and hundreds of photographs all had to be explained in detail. The days crawled by in the hot and stuffy courtroom as each witness was called. The public galleries were full every day. Members of the media from all over the world jostled for position in the crowded press gallery, knowing that the case was big news. When the t-shirt that Joanne Walters last wore was displayed, bearing numerous cuts, front and back, the courtroom fell silent. So too when Dr. Bradhurst took the stand to describe the injuries inflicted on each of the victims. The most dramatic moment was when he was shown the sword found at Ivan's house. He suggested that it was very likely the type of weapon used to decapitate Anya Hapshid. The enormous weight of evidence and the long list of witnesses took weeks to present. Gradually, during cross-examination of the prosecution witnesses, the defense tactics unfolded. They were determined to convince the jury that Ivan was not responsible for the murders, but instead implied that his brothers, Richard and Walter, committed the crimes and implicated him by planting the evidence at his house. Twelve weeks and 145 witnesses later, the prosecution completed its presentation of a strong case. The first witness called by the defense was Ivan Milat. Martin led him through the accusations that had been made. His defense was simple. He denied everything. During cross-examination, Tedeschi proved merciless. He pursued Milat on every point. When asked how come he came to be in possession of the property belonging to the victims, he answered, Someone's trying to make me look bad. He faltered after Tedeschi reminded him that the gun parts that they said were put in his home by someone else were painted in camouflage colors in the same fashion as his other hunting equipment. Tedeschi pointed out that it was an amazing coincidence, considering that Milat had already admitted that the paints used were in fact his. In the trial's 15th week, after all the evidence had been presented and argued against, the final summations began. Tedeschi told the jury of Ivan Milat's arrogance in believing that he would get away with the attack on Onions and the abduction and murder of seven young people, an arrogance that prevented him from disposing of the property belonging to his victims. His address ran for three days as he spelled out the many pertinent facts that indicated that Ivan Milat was the killer, none of which had been suitably explained by his defense. Martin began his summing up by telling the jury that obviously someone in the Milat family was responsible for the murders, but not his client. He tried to explain away the damning evidence as a conspiracy against Ivan by his own brothers. He began to narrow down his attack, suggesting that Richard made the comments about the murders to his friends at work 
and may have been in a position to commit all eight crimes, even though he was at work at the times of the offenses. He ended his comments in the same vein. His client, Ivan Malat, had been set up. Justice Hunt took two days to summarize the evidence for the jury. At 2.42 p.m. on the 24th of July, he sent the jury out to consider their verdict. Three days passed, still no verdict. Meanwhile, the Milat family, confident of an acquittal, made plans for a celebratory dinner. A strange ritual, considering Ivan's defense was based on the implication of members of his own family. On Saturday, the 27th of July, 1995, the remaining jurors filed into the courtroom to deliver their verdict. Justice Hunt asked Ivan to stand as the jury foreman read the verdicts. As each of the eight charges were read, the verdict was the same. Guilty. Ivan Milat was asked if he had anything to say. He replied, I'm not guilty of it. That's all I have to say. The sentences were then handed down. For the attack on Paul Onions, six years imprisonment. For the remaining seven counts of willful murder, a life sentence for each. Ivan Milat was sentenced to prison for the term of his natural life. On the Sunday following his conviction, Ivan was transported to a maximum security prison in Maitland, southwest of Sydney. After the normal prison induction of showers and the issue of bedding, Milat was welcomed to the jail in a manner that he could not have expected. While waiting in line to be assigned to a cell, he was approached by a tall, well-built inmate and punched to the ground. Despite his bad start, Ivan settled into prison life in a cell in A-Wing. Several months later, on the 17th of July, he was involved in a foiled escape attempt that was masterminded by George Savas, a former city councilman who was serving time for drug trafficking. Ironically, Ivan was immediately transferred to the high-security wing of Goulburn Jail, only a few short miles from Belangelo Forest. The next day, Savas was found hanged in his cell. To this date, Ivan Milat has not been charged for his part in the escape attempt. As a follow-up to the Milat story, several reporters approached members of Ivan's family for interviews. Some of them refused. Others demanded money. Richard Milat, when asked by the press if he feared he would be arrested in relation to the murders, replied, Not really. If they wanted me, they'd have me by now. Margaret, Ivan's mother, was shocked by the sentence handed down on her son, but told reporters, if he did these crimes, then he deserves to be punished. Other reporters tracked Ivan's brother Boris down to a secret location, where he was supposedly hiding from his family. When asked if he thought that Ivan was innocent, he answered, All my brothers are capable of extreme violence, given the right time and place, individually. He continued, The things I can tell you are much worse than what Ivan's meant to have done. Everywhere he's worked, people have disappeared. I know where he's been. He then asked the reporters if they thought Ivan was guilty. They replied that they did. If Ivan's done these murders, he told them, I reckon he's done a hell of a lot more. How many, they asked. His reply was disturbing. About 28. Ivan Malat to this day continues to profess his innocence. He's formed a support group that lobbies the government for his release. Ivan Milat was moved to solitary confinement after prison officers found a hacksaw blade hidden in his cell. The searchers, using a metal detector, found the blade inside a packet of biscuits. At the time of the routine search, Milat was already segregated from other prisoners in the maximum security wing of Goldburn Jail. He's indicated that he'll attempt escape at every opportunity. While in prison, Ivan Milat turned to self-mutilation in an attempt to jumpstart his appeal to the High Court in Sydney. He hoped that by swallowing razor blades, staples, and a spring from a toilet mechanism, and periodically starving himself, he would get the judge's attention and maybe get the process moving a little faster. However, Ivan's desperate ploy failed to work. In July 2001, Judge William Gamow refused Milat's appeal stating that there's no reason to doubt the correctness of the decision of the New South Wales Criminal Court of Appeal, the AP Worldstream reported. Many, especially the victims' families, were relieved by the court's decision because it would ensure that Ivan would spend the rest of his natural life behind bars. There was little doubt that if he were ever released early, he would likely kill again and again. 
Of course, Ivan denies that he's capable of ever doing such a thing and continues to profess his innocence in the seven murders for which he was earlier convicted. Despite Ivan's declarations, investigators have tried to link him to a further six disappearances of young women between 1978 and 1980. All of the women are thought to be dead, even though none of their bodies have ever been found. At the time of the girls' disappearances, Ivan allegedly worked or lived in close proximity to where they were last seen. Ivan's murderous record has led to his being suspected in their probable murders, although there's no evidence directly linking him to any of the cases. Ivan was ordered to give evidence at an inquest in the summer of 2001 into three of the girls' disappearances. During the inquiry, he was questioned about Leanne Goodall, 20, Robin Hickey, 17, and Amanda Robinson, 14, all of whom went missing from New South Wales and Newcastle in 1978 and 1979. According to an article by Tony Larner in the Sunday Mercury, detectives reopened the files on the three missing women after the discovery of a female jawbone on a Newcastle beach in March 1998, which was, incidentally, not linked to either woman. Nonetheless, Ivan worked with a road crew just minutes from where two of the women were last seen. During the line of questioning, Ivan looked directly at the families of the girls and firmly stated that he had nothing to do with their disappearance. Denise McNamara said in an AAP General News article, Based on a lack of evidence, he has not been formally charged. During another inquiry in 2003, Ivan was questioned into the disappearances of two 20-year-old nurses, Jillian Jameson and Deborah Balkan, who were last seen leaving a hotel with a man in dirty work clothes, the AAP General News reported in December 2003. The article stated that, at the time, Ivan was working at the Department of Main Roads, now the RTA, less than two kilometers from the hotel. Ivan flatly denied having anything to do with the women, and the investigation against him was stalled due to a lack of evidence. In 2005, he was questioned about another girl who went missing while hitchhiking home in January 1980, named Annette Briffa, 18. She never made it home and was thought murdered. It's uncertain if Ivan was in the area at the time she went missing, but because her case matched those he was previously convicted of, he could never be totally eliminated as a suspect. Deputy State Coroner Carl Milovanovich was quoted saying in a January 2005 AAP article, The reality is, there is a chance that Ivan could have murdered more women than those for which he was convicted. However, unless he confesses, no one will ever know the true number of victims attributed to him. Thus, investigators are simply left to guess, hoping to one day strike it lucky and close one of the many unsolved cases that haunt the region. On the 26th of January, 2009, Milat cut off his little finger with a plastic knife with the intention of mailing it to the High Court of Australia to force an appeal. He was taken to Goldburn Base Hospital under high security. However, on the 27th of January, 2009, Milat was returned to prison after doctors decided surgery was not possible. Milat had previously harmed himself in 2001 when he swallowed razor blades, staples, and other metal objects. In May 2011, Milat went on a nine-day hunger strike, losing 15 kilograms in an unsuccessful attempt to be given a PlayStation. In May 2019, Milat was transferred to the Prince of Wales Hotel, Randwick, and was subsequently diagnosed with terminal esophageal cancer. Following his treatment, he was transferred to the Long Bay Correctional Center to continue his custodial sentences. On the 9th of August, 2019, a terminally ill Milat was moved to a secure treatment unit located at the Prince of Wales Hospital following the loss of 20 kilograms in previous weeks. Milat was also exhibiting a high temperature. His status, however, was reported as not life-threatening. On the 27th of October, 2019, Milat died from esophagus and stomach cancer at 4.07 a.m. in the hospital wing at Long Bay Correctional Center. He was 74 years old.